Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way <clears throat> on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? I call the clerk. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Uh, senator Steele John. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion related to the 20th anniversary of the illegal US-led invasion of Iraq as circulated. Is leave granted? And leave is not granted, Senator Steelejohn. Uh, notice standing in the name of the Leader of the Australian Greens in the Senate, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion uh, to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to the 20th anniversary of the Iraq War. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The Greens uh, move this motion today. Uh, Sorry, thank you, President. Uh, the Greens uh, moved this motion today and put this matter before the Senate uh, on this, the 20th anniversary of the illegal US-led invasion of Iraq. There is no more appropriate day than to consider this matter than today, given uh, that it is in fact a moment in time where there are parties in political decision-making positions who opposed uh, the Iraq war, and given that to this very day uh, family members across Australia worry for the safety of their children who are still deployed to Iraq to this day under operations accordion and okra. Now, the Australian Greens move this motion this morning as the first order of business uh, for the Senate uh, with sorrow in our hearts. Sorrow for the over 500,000 who died as a result of the Iraq war and of the destruction of the infrastructure created by that war. Sorrow for the 1.2 million people still to this day internally displaced because of the war in Iraq and sorrow because of the five million orphans created by that war. Five percent of the entire orphan population of the globe. We move this motion today in solidarity with the 92 per cent of Australians who gathered together hundreds of thousands across the country in cities marching to oppose the, the Iraq war because they knew that the community was being lied to. They knew that they were being pre presented with false intelligence. They knew they were being marched to war by men who wished to see other people's children placed in harm's way to suit their political ends. We do this in solidarity with the organisers of those protests, and I am honoured to work to this day alongside Damien Lawson, a key organiser of the anti-Iraq war protests here in Australia, which formed part of the largest global protest in human history. 
And we do so this morning uh, with a renewed sense of determination, a commitment from every single Green in the Senate, every single Green in the House of Representatives, every single Green in the state parliaments and the local governments of this country in opposition to ever again being led into an illegal, immoral and unjust war at the reckless hands of the United States of America. We do this in the full knowledge that the Australian people at the time and to this day knew full well that we should not go to Iraq, that it would be a humanitarian and foreign policy disaster. They knew it, they protested, and the Prime Minister ignored them, ignored them point blank because there is no requirement in this country to seek a vote of the Parliament before the deployment of ADF personnel. ADF personnel are asked to go into harm's way in this nation, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and yet not a single member of the government or opposition was required to vote before that occurred. Shame on this chamber for to this day opposing this reform that is supported by 86 per cent of the Australian people. Shame. And finally, in closing, uh, let me say this. Those mothers and fathers that to this day are kept up at night for the fear of the safety of their children, deployed to Iraq still under Operation, uh, Operation Accordion and Operation Okra, deserve to finally have that fear come to an end. Twenty years later, Australia must end its deployments to Iraq. We must finally bring our troops home and work for an independent and peaceful foreign policy that sees that never again are we called into a war based on a lie led by the United States of America. Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Firstly, I want to state clearly once again, for the record, that Labor opposed the Iraq war at the time, and our position has not changed. As Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd brought Australia's combat troops home. But on this anniversary of the commencement of the war, I want to say that our argument was never with our troops. It was always with the Howard government. Twenty years on from the Iraq war, we all reflect on the many tragedies of that conflict and its ongoing effects. Our thoughts are with the people of Iraq, as well as the Iraqi community here in Australia, some of whom fled that conflict. And our thoughts today, as always, are with our veterans. We acknowledge the brave contribution and sacrifices made by the ADF and civilian personnel who conducted or supported operations in Iraq. We remember the four Australian service personnel who died, and we, we all share our deepest sympathies to the families and friends that still feel their loss. And we express our support to those who still live with the physical and mental scars of that conflict and those who returned home and are tragically no longer with us. Labor did not support the Howard government's decision for Australia to go to Iraq in 2003, nor did we support the Howard government's decision to send a further 450 troops to Iraq, reneging on a 2004 election commitment. At the time he withdrew combat troops from Iraq, then Prime Minister Rudd said, this government does not believe that our alliance with the United States mandates automatic compliance with every element of United States foreign policy. The Greens' view that they have a monopoly on resistance to sending Australian troops to the Iraq war is odd, given Labor opposed it vigorously. They are wrong in thinking they have some moral superiority, although it is something we are very used to, uh, and they are just as wrong in their claims that through AUKUS we have lost strategic autonomy. autonomy. And I hear members of the Greens heckling uh, during this speech, and again it just reinforces the point that they seem to think that they have a monopoly on resistance to sending Australian troops to the Iraq war, which some of them may not remember uh, the political debates that happened at a time as a result of Labor taking a principled stand on this issue. It's not clear whether the Greens actually uh, misunderstand or pretend to misunderstand in order to exploit this issue for crass political purposes. But let there be no doubt. Australia makes its own choices. Acquiring AUKUS's military capability was a sovereign decision. Any decision to use this capability will also be ours alone. But let me also be clear 
that our intent in acquiring this capability is to make our contribution to the strategic balance of the region. We want to have a stable region where no country dominates and no country is dominated. If that is to be the case, we each have a responsibility to play our part in collective deterrence of aggression. If any country can make the calculation that they can successfully dominate another, the region becomes unstable and the risk of conflict increases. I make this point acknowledging that our region has been home to an unprecedented military build-up in recent years, meaning we must work hard and fast if we are to maintain equilibrium. Increasing our military capability sits alongside our diplomacy, which is about increasing the opportunities and benefits from peace and partnership, positive incentives for peace. As well as positive incentives for peace, we do need deterrence to conflict and aggression. By having strong defence capabilities of our own and by working with partners investing in their own capabilities, we change the calculus for any potential aggressor. There are those in this building who like to beat the drums of war, and there are those who like to believe that peace can come from passively hoping for the best. But this government knows part of maintaining peace is making sure all countries are invested in that peace through effective diplomacy, and part of making peace is making sure that any potential aggressor knows they cannot afford the costs of war. The government will not be supporting this motion to suspend standing orders, as there are plenty of alternative opportunities in the Senate that the Greens could use to debate this and related issues, rather than taking time out of government business needed to progress important legislation relating to issues such as the referendum for a voice to parliament, equality, national reconstruction, housing and climate safeguards. So I remind the Greens uh, that it was, a federal, it was the Federal Labor Party who opposed the Iraq war at the time. We consider that that was still the right decision. Please give up trying to lecture the rest of us. We're a bit tired of it. Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President. Deputy President, I would begin by acknowledging all Australian servicemen and service women who served in Iraq, who continue to serve in Iraq, for those who have paid a price for their service, and particularly the families of those who have paid that price. And we thank you for your service. We acknowledge your contribution, and we pay tribute to the work that you have done. And you should know that it is valued, notwithstanding some of the debates that ensue around that conflict and war. I want to also acknowledge all of those who served alongside and the Iraqi people, those who have suffered and those who have felt loss. Uh, that is significant and that is a loss uh, that we should recognise uh, and we should recognise the pain and suffering that that caused in so many cases. Loss, of course, is not something, though, that the Iraqi people were immune to prior to this war and this conflict. Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator and a leader who showed complete, I cannot believe the Australian Greens are seeking to argue with that point. Let me state it again. Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator and a world leader who showed complete disregard for lives, for human rights or for international laws and rules. He was a leader who used chemical and biological weapons, poison gas, against neighbouring countries, against his own citizens against the Kurdish people. Whatever the attempts to form a black and white view of right or wrong, of war or conflict, there are some facts and realities that should stand in relation to what Saddam Hussein, his dictatorship and his regime undertook. He didn't just use those biological and chemical weapons against his own people. He maintained when the international community sought to scrutinise that, a deliberate ambiguity around whether or not he continued to hold those weapons. He deliberately sought to lure other nations into believing that he continued to have them and would use them as he had sought to do so in the past. He also led a regime that sponsored suicide bombers. He led a regime that was recognised as a state sponsor of terrorism. He was responsible for the deaths of many hundreds of thousands of people. The world and Iraq are better off for being rid of Saddam Hussein and his dictatorship. That, Deputy President, is not to say that there are not lessons that can be learned. There are always lessons to learn, and those lessons obviously go to 
the intelligence and analysis that was available, how that is scrutinised in the future, and they have been widely debated and canvassed over the two decades since the war commenced. It's important that we do, however, recognise Iraq today as a democracy, not a perfect one, but one where the Iraqi people, as is acknowledged by many experts in the field, do have more say over their future than they did 20 years ago, where, though rights are far from universally respected, there is a better regard than there was 20 years ago, and calls to remove the remaining assistance from the ADF deployment or otherwise from Iraq would be to show disregard for the advances that have been made during that time. The Greens are misplaced to argue that we should bring the remaining personnel home. We should be showing the support to work with the democratically elected government of Iraq, to work with the people of Iraq to ensure that the sense of greater stability, that the improvement in standards, that the development in relation to their democracy is supported and underpinned at this uh, critical time as best as we possibly can. Deputy President, can I lastly turn to uh, the arguments advanced by the Greens? They are not contained in the motion they seek to have debated uh, about the decision-making processes and the powers of executive government. It remains the position of the coalition that the executive government of the day should have authority in relation to troop and personnel deployments. Our system is one where there is immense scrutiny of decisions made by government, but we should enable governments to exercise those powers under the appropriate scrutiny, transparency and accountability of our parliamentary democracy. Senator Roberts, did you indicate you wanted the call? Yes, please. Yeah, the call. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy President. I certainly commend the Greens for the, no the notion behind their, uh, the intent behind their speech. We need scrutiny when we deploy people overseas. I want to commend our, far our armed services for their work overseas and in this country. They have sacrificed a lot and they have covered themselves with honour. But I remind the Senate of Mr Alexander Downer on his last day before he retired. He, he said on 7.30 report that John Howard came back from America and strode into the cabinet and said, we're off to Iraq. That's not good enough. That is not good enough. But now is not the time to do this. I want to, quote, I want to refer to Sub-Imperial Power, a book, a new book recently released by Clinton Fernandez, a man in Canberra who works for the University of New South Wales and lectures at ADFA. He has the guts to tell it as it is. We are a sub-imperial power of the United States and we are making a mess of things by following the United States blindly into conflicts. Look at the Afghanistan withdrawal. Look at the mess that created. Look at the weapons of mass destruction lies that were told to justify our invasion of Iraq. And then quite openly and blatantly, oh, there weren't any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We lied to you. The United States did that. Australia did that. Britain did that. Tony Blair admitted it. Where is the accountability? And yet, on the other hand, I'm conflicted because I had a, I had a haircut on Friday and the barber was from Iraq and he said that Iraq is better off in certain areas. So I, I, I can't speak with knowledge. Now, there are two parts to the Greens' motion in section B, parts one and two. The Senate therefore urges the Australian Parliament and government to learn the lessons of the past and to never again be dragged into another country's unjust war of aggression. I support that. We need to learn from this. And the only way to get accountability is to ask questions about that. Then the second part of part B, calls for the withdrawal of ADF personnel still deployed to Iraq today under Operation Okra and Operation Accordion. I can't vote for that because I don't know the background. I don't know what the consequences will be. So I'm not going to open my mouth on that one way or the other. But I want to echo the words of Senator, Senator Watts. We need an inquiry into that deployment. I think the Greens are on the right track to open that, up, that issue up. 
but I cannot support the, su the suspension of standing orders to do that. I do support the intent to have an inquiry and to develop accountability for these decisions of wantonly invading other countries at the support, uh, to, to support the United States. So I commend the Greens but won't be supporting your motion for suspension of standing orders. Thank you for raising it. Senator Cash. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I too rise to speak against the motion uh, put forward by the Australian Greens. And as has been pointed out already in the debate, uh, there are many opportunities uh, throughout the course of today, throughout the course of the week, uh, in which the Australian Greens could take the opportunity to properly uh, put this on the notice paper and have it debated in the Senate. Uh, but, again, has been noted in the debate today, uh, it's Monday morning. They clearly decided to pull a stunt, and that is where we find ourselves this morning, uh, instead of moving on to the items listed on the Senate order of business for today. But in reality, and you can hear the heckles in the background, uh, what is the suspension motion actually all about? Uh, well, it's about one thing and one thing alone. The Australian Greens are putting forward this motion because of their eternal opposition to Australia's close military alliance with the United States and with the United Kingdom. And in fact, if ever proof of that was needed, we only saw their reaction last week uh, to what was, without a doubt, a significant moment in not just Australia's history, but in the history of the United States and the United Kingdom, with the formalisation of the AUKUS deal to purchase eight nuclear-powered submarines. In terms of those on this side of the chamber, uh, we support the government's commitment to Australia's military alliance with the United States. Uh, and I am certainly proud, as I know my colleagues are, of the work undertaken by the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison and the former Defence Minister Peter Dutton in creating the AUKUS deal. In contrast, and again, you can hear the heckles coming from the Australian Greens at this point in time, uh, they are without a doubt on a unity ticket, a unity ticket with former Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating, and uh, that is obviously something with which those of us on this side of the chamber disagree. It is uh, one thing that we are incredibly proud of on this side of the chamber. It is the alliance with the United States and with, in particular, the United Kingdom. This proud alliance has existed, Deputy President, for more than 100 years, 100 years of cooperation. When you look at the decision to send troops into Iraq, which is the basis of this motion, it was made by the government of the day, and as the Senator Birmingham has pointed out, the government of the day had the executive power to make this decision and it was based on the best available advice at the time. It is important to remember what that decision was about. The action was against Saddam Hussein. He was a brutal dictator who subjugated his own citizens, invaded neighbouring countries and used chemical weapons against his own people. Australian troops without a doubt, served their country with honour and fought with dignity in Iraq and deserve to be recognised for the important contribution they had in the removal of the brutal dictator. It is clear that mistakes were made in the course of the war. However, we should not be abandoning our strong alliance with the United States and the United Kingdom. Their soldiers have stood side by side with the Australian diggers for over a century. We on this side of the chamber do not shy away from our strong support for the United States and the United Kingdom. We are proud of the strong alliance with these nations and we are strongly committed to the alliance going forward. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Senator Wilson, did you? President. You're on your feet. Contribution. Okay, well, I, I, I'll you just give said you the, two, two in a row. I know, I know, but I didn't. You went on your feet. So, I've, as a matter of courtesy, I'll let Kinsey. There's plenty of time, and then you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy President. And I too rise to join with both the leader of the opposition uh, in the Senate and the coalition more broadly to uh, not support 
the Greens' desire to suspend the Senate to debate what they say was an illegal, immoral and unjust war. Um, we know that war is a brutal undertaking. It should be avoided where possible. And the heavy decision of prime ministers and governments throughout our nation's history to send Australian troops to foreign lands to fight for freedom and democracy uh, is often a decision that has been the most difficult for them to make. They do, have never done it lightly. But I think what we do know is that the Greens standing up today so trying to seek to suspend the work of the Senate is simply the continuation of their anti-US alliance stance and their failure to recognise that this alliance has been beneficial not just to Australia, not just to the Pacific during World War II, but to the globe and to the principles of freedom and democracy that we both stand with. And the federal government that signed uh, AUKUS and a great announcement by the Prime Minister uh, in America last week should be celebrated. We are proud of our legacy as a former government in getting AUKUS off the ground, and we're equally proud to support the current government in continuing an alliance that has brought stability uh, to the globe in over 100 years. You talk a lot about the impact of war. But you cannot wish away the fact that sometimes you have to stand up to bullies. You shouldn't accept uh, the behaviour of Saddam Hussein as normal and acceptable to the Iraqi people. That's something that they're just going to have to put up with. What up? Put up with? You know what? You could make the same actual case for our commitment to assisting the Ukrainian people against Putin. But you don't. You're happy, for, you're happy for us to support that particular um, commitment, but you're not actually happy on this one. And you know why? Because it's all about the US alliance. You are hypocrites when it comes to um, where you stand on foreign relations. We know um, that you've got to stand up to bullies. There absolutely needs to be a strong US-UK alliance for stability across the globe. We welcome the government's support and we stand with our allies. We're not ashamed of having allies. We're not ashamed of actually standing with them when we need to. Uh, and we call out the Greens for actually trying to hold future governments to actually not have to make the terrible and difficult decision to send Australian troops to war. Uh, we thank our troops for their fantastic efforts. Uh, and support them as veterans going forward. Mm -hmm. Senator Wilson, you have the call. You'll be the last speaker before I put the motion. Thank you, Deputy President. Today is a very sombre day and a very important day for reflection. And it seems that 20 years ago, following this illegal war of aggression, which our country participated in, we've learnt very little based on today's debate. And it's very sad and very frustrating to see the Liberal Party continue to wipe clean the blood they so very clearly have on their hands. They have never shown any remorse for the invasion of Iraq and Australia's participation in that. There was a very important point in Senator Stiljohn's motion today that hasn't been touched on by either the Labor Party or the Liberal Party. That's absolutely critical to the world we find ourselves in today. And that was the lie that this war was based on. Not just a lie, Deputy President, a manufactured deceit of the highest order, not scrutinised by the media, not scrutinised by the parliament. We had a whistleblower in the other house, in the other place, Andrew Wilkie MP, who blew the whistle when he was an intelligence officer. But we were led to a war by a small group of powerful people who were totally unaccountable to the millions who marched around the globe in the biggest protests in our history at the time to oppose this war. We were ignored, but we were right. Looking back on history, the Liberal Party can come up in here today and say whatever they want. You have made the world a less safe place. The instability across the Middle East, starting with the insurgency, that led to the Syrian civil war and tens of millions of refugees it washing across Europe in a wave of misery. 
the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, mostly innocents, which no one had been held to account for. And the rise of terrorism. The Liberal Party, along with the UK government, the United States and the Coalition of Willing, gave birth to ISIS, to more global terrorism. And you come in here today and talk about stability. We have to know we've learned something from this war, this illegal and immoral war. If we're going to have any confidence in the safety of our children in this country? Are we part of an alliance that's going to lead us into another war with no scrutiny from the media or from parliaments because of your cosy relationship you have with each other around national security? Are we going to be hoodwinked? Well, amongst all the frustrated people, obviously many of my colleagues marched against that war. I marched again this weekend. In a, in a rally in, in Melbourne to commemorate this conflict. When are we going to learn? It's really, really important that we have a process that at least gives Parliament the opportunity to vote on the deployment of our defence forces. It's not a silver bullet, but at least we can speak on behalf of the people that democratically elected us to this place. And we will continue to push, as we have done for decades, to get at least a vote from the Australian Parliament on the deployment of our defence forces. And I just wanted to finish with this point. There was one other person, one of many people, who was deeply angry and frustrated with this illegal war and the fact that they were ignored. And they decided that they would do something about it, and that's Julian Assange. He set up WikiLeaks because of the Iraq war. And he was the only truth teller of this war. Everything that was published by WikiLeaks and, by the way, republished by all media outlets around the world, he brought truth and transparency to this war. And he very famously said, if wars can be started by lies, they can be ended by the truth. And where is he now? He's behind bars in a maximum security prison. The only one who told truth and told, brought truth to power. And he's behind bars awaiting a virtual death sentence. And while there's this continued war on truth-telling and disclosure and transparency, which is what the war machine fears the most, this war is still ongoing. While he's on trial for telling the truth and doing his job as a journalist, press freedoms are on trial. The Iraq war is a long way from being over while Mr Assange sits behind bars. Make the decision. There's only one decision. No extradition. I intend to put the question. I put the question that there be a suspension of standing orders. Those of the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the Senate is that the motion moved by Senator Stilljohn that the standing orders be suspended be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator McKim, and teller for the noes, Senator Scar. Honourable Senators, there being 12 ayes and 23 noes, it's passed in the negative. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day Number 1, Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022, Second Reading Debate. Senator Hume. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Uh, in its current form, the opposition will be opposing this bill and will be seeking to amend it. This bill is profoundly important. It's profoundly important because it will determine the processes around the most significant decision that voters will confront in over two decades, changing their constitution, our nation's foundational document. Constitutional referenda are governed by section 128 of the Australian Constitution and the Referendum Machinery Provisions Act of 1984. Now, this bill, the Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill of 2022, will prepare and update the Referendum Machinery Provisions Act of 1984 ahead of a referendum on an Indigenous voice to parliament, which is expected during this term of parliament. But more importantly, more importantly, it will set a precedent for all future referenda on the Constitution. Now, this parliament should treat the changes to the machinery of referenda, as difficult as this may be, without consideration of what the referendum question might be, this time or the next. On principle, the principle must be that any referendum, in any referendum, everyone should be able to put their case and the parliament should facilitate a balanced and fair debate of that question, whatever the question is. In the debate that we've had on this bill and on the proposed referendum to The Voice, we've had many references uh, back to the last referendum on a republic. And people have referred to how this particular operation was conducted or the framing of the question was done in such and such a way. That referendum occurred more than two decades ago. But there is a strong reason why people remember this event, and they have very strong views on how it was conducted. They are fundamental to how we govern ourselves as people, and people are passionate about these issues. Now, certainly rules need to be updated. We have no question about that. But this isn't like an AFL game, which might see a rule change between seasons to address issues of flooding or, or tanking. This is, these are rules that keep a balance and fairness and a legitimacy and trust in how we change our founding document. Evidence presented to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters referred to the conduct of referenda from right back to the beginning of the last century. 
Since the introduction of the referendum pamphlet back in 1912, there have been only three occasions where a pamphlet has not been provided. A pamphlet has been distributed in every referendum since 1928. The three referenda without an official pamphlet, 1919, 1926 and 1928, had good reason. The 1919, um, pam um, in 1919, there was insufficient time to produce a pamphlet prior to the, con the conduct of the referendum post-World War I. In 1926, there was no agreement on how to argue or produce the yes argument. And in 1928, there was overwhelming agreement between the parties and governments of all levels. Now, in evidence to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, the AEC provided evidence that a pamphlet to all households would be expected to cost around $10 million, and that the AEC noted that around 40 per cent of Australians rely on the printed material that the Commission provides to households in the conduct of their vote at every election. Now, the government initially said that this was a bad idea, an outdated idea, that we should provide voters with information about the issue on which they were voting. Now, to their, credit, to their credit, the government did listen to the arguments put forward by the opposition, and we noted that they have now announced that they will move amendments to restore this pamphlet. And the reasons for this are simple. How we change our constitution is as important as the change itself. And how we change our constitution should be blind to what that change might be. In the other place, the shadow attorney-general told members that the government intends for voters to have an experience at this upcoming referendum that is consistent with their experience at the federal election. Well, this bill reflects that in the time between our last referendum and today, we've seen updates to donation regimes and to disclosure regimes and the introduction of a foreign donation ban and the introduction of foreign interference laws. And we all agree that these changes are now part of our electoral process and the expectations of voters at every election. But this bill doesn't address some of the core structural elements that are, present, that are present at elections, elements that have not been provided by government. Just as the retention of the pamphlet will strengthen this bill, we need to recognise that for any referendum to be successful, we need to provide the tools for the system to operate with integrity. We should certainly not divert from past practice where it would create uncertainty when it would create mistrust. And we should take all measures available to us to ensure that the process is as robust as it can be and that voters have as much information and trust in the system and about the choice that they are being asked to make. We do support the modernisation of the Act insofar as it updates regulations on donations and expenditure for referendum campaign and impose reporting obligations. We support the legislative modernisations campaign contained in the bill. We support the ban on foreign donations, the ban on foreign campaigners, measures we introduced into the electoral system when we were in government. However, making these changes to the Referendum Act without understanding what is needed to operate them successfully is at best hopefully, hopelessly optimistic and at worst ignorant of the consequences that it will cause. At any electoral event, there are structures in place to manage the regulation of our new donation and foreign interference regimes. We have registered political parties, we have significant third parties, and we have other participants who are required to register with the AEC. And all of this helps our regulators within our agencies manage the pressures that are placed upon our systems as we go through the often impassioned process of public debate. But because referenda occur so infrequently and occur on matters that aren't often consistent across party lines, uh, we don't have these reliable structures for these systems to work. And this is why the opposition will move to include provisions for the nomination of official yes and no organisations for a referendum. Again, we approach this not with reference to the question that may be put later this year, but with a reflection on the fact that all referenda may need this provision and this mechanism going forward. The regulatory auditing process to administer these regulatory schemes would be assisted greatly by having official campaigns to provide a starting point for enforcement and education by the AEC. 
For a process that's as important and for an outcome as significant as what the government is itself is calling for, well, surely this is a minimal provision, a minimal provision to assist in a strong process for change. We are supportive of the regulatory framework uh, for our elections to apply to our referenda, so let's not le then leave the regulators with a free-for-all process, impossible to supervise and monitor with the rigour that Australians expect of them at an election. Under the government's model, we would see that free-for-all of participants who will be captured by the donations and disclosures regime at the referendum. And as the Joint Standing Committee heard that uh, there is potential for organisations and individuals who are unaware of the previous activities relating to the voice, uh, un so unaware that their current or previous activities relating to the voice will be captured under that regulatory scheme. The AEC stated in evidence that donations and disclosure regimes remains one of the most complex areas of the Electoral Act. It's complex enough that even the regular participants, political parties that are active at every election, still get it wrong. What's worse, we'll see that the regulatory regime applied to a one-off electoral event and we'll only find out the extent of the success of that regime after the event, potentially months after the event and certainly the, after the outcome has been implemented. As the AEC has said, to educate the number of participants on their responsibilities and obligations will be a significant body of work. An official campaign structure that will, at the very least, provide a starting point for the AEC's efforts in coordinating education on the responsibilities of organisations and individuals participating in the referendum campaign, as well as providing a head start on the integrity measures that Australians should expect from a properly conducted electoral event. The requirement to guard against foreign interference is also paramount. Only recently, Canada's government announced that an inquiry into allegations that a state actor interfered in their 2021 election. Now, we should remember that we're not immune to this in Australia. It's been publicly reported that our own major political parties were hacked by state-sponsored actors. We shouldn't wait to wonder what could have been done after that happens at a referendum. We should act now and provide the structure that will ensure that our agencies can work with participants against foreign interference. It's clear that if we're to have strong processes for this referendum, we should be ensuring that there is a structure in place for those processes and the regulatory bodies to start their work. And in doing so, we should fund official yes and no campaign organisations to ensure that they have the administration in place to be able to adhere to the laws that we're about to pass. And that's why the opposition will move amendments to require that the nominated official yes and no organisations be provided equal funding to operate and administer themselves under the regime. Note operate and administer, not advertise and not campaign. As the current Attorney-General stated in his final report on the referendum machinery provisions in 2009, when he argued for equal funding of the yes and no cases, irrespective of parliamentary support, he said this is in line with the original intention of the yes and no pamphlet, as well as consistent with the democratic ideals of informed debate. That's from the current Attorney-General. Now, we would encourage the minister and the government to consider these very reasonable changes that the coalition has put forward to ensure a referendum that has informed voters and a system that has integrity and trust, a system that will return a referendum that Australians deserve, whatever the outcome may be. The parliament should consider that sorry, this bill represents a very significant update to the Referendum Machinery Provisions Act. And the Parliament should consider that these changes reflect how we go about changing our national document today, but also in the future. This was the lens through which the Coalition looked at the Referendum Machinery Bill. Not what the question being asked is going to be, but what questions may be asked in the future, and what Australians expect and deserve in a referendum process. To that, I move a second reading amendment circulated in my name on sheet, 100, uh, sorry, sheet 1817. Now, this amendment 
would, would delay the consideration of the bill until such time as it reflects a stronger and more balanced approach to conducting a referendum. <laughs> this is something that the Senate should consider carefully. The decisions on this bill will set the precedent for all referenda into the future. It's what Australians expect. It's what Australians deserve. It's a referendum machinery that is separate from the question that is being asked. It's a referendum machinery that puts legitimacy, that puts trust into the electoral process, that minimises the chances of foreign donations appearing in a referendum, that minimises the chances of electoral laws that we expect, that we require, that we demand being broken, and that minimises the chances of foreign interference in a process that is so important, but not just in elections, but particularly so when we are changing our foundation document, yeah, yeah. the Constitution. Yeah, yeah. Senator Waters very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Referendum Machinery Provisions uh, Bill, uh, which provides the framework for how referenda are conducted. And we welcome many of the reforms in this bill to update that framework. We will be supporting this bill, but we would like to see that framework strengthened and we'll be moving amendments to strengthen it in many uh, very important ways. I want to say at the outset that this bill presents an opportunity to improve franchisement, particularly for First Nations communities, and that is an opportunity that should not be missed. On the day enrolment, with provisional voting, expanding remote polling programs and phone voting for those unable to get to a polling booth will increase the number of people that are able to cast a vote. That's why the Greens are moving amendments to do all of those things. We want First Nations people to have the maximum opportunity to have a vote on whether they have a voice. And I'll talk more about this shortly, but all referendum decisions are historic, and engaging the highest number of people in decision-making is an outcome that we should be striving for when it comes to historic reforms. Let's get this right, starting now. This is not about stacking the deck for an outcome on the voice referendum. It's in fact a timely opportunity to redress the decades of First Nations disenfranchisement and ensure that people with a clear stake in the outcome of a referendum are able to exercise their right to vote. Now to the details of this bill. In the past 10 years, the parliament's conducted several inquiries into constitutional reforms um, and referenda, and those inquiries have recommended a comprehensive suite of reforms, including aligning referendum laws with broader electoral laws, removing the restriction on government's funding education and promotion campaigns, modernising the way that information about the yes and no case was distributed and establishing an independent expert panel to advise on the wording of referendum questions and information campaigns. Uh, this bill does only some of those things. Many submitters to the earlier inquiries emphasised the need for comprehensive, objective review of referendum machine machinery separate from the rush of an impending referendum. And the Greens strongly agree, but here we are. Referendums are about constitutional change and about fundamental democratic reforms. Beyond giving a voice to First Nations people, future referenda will determine whether Australia becomes a republic and whether we remove the restrictions on running for parliament that ignore the multicultural background of so many Australians. So the Greens believe we do need more comprehensive reforms to the Referendum Act to make it fit for the challenge of those future referendums. But for now, we would like to see improvements proposed in this bill and the amendments proposed to it enacted before the upcoming referendum. We welcome the introduction of donations disclosure provisions for referendum campaigns. This bill would align referendum disclosure obligations with the Commonwealth Electoral Act obligations. However, what the government has failed to acknowledge is that those existing Commonwealth Electoral Act obligations are woeful. They are incredibly inadequate. And we have long called for political donations over $1,000 to be disclosed in real time so that voters can see who is funding campaigns. Uh, last time I checked, that was in fact Labor's own policy. We'll be moving an amendment to lower the disclosure threshold to $1,000 and to increase the frequency of disclosure. We hope that the government supports us in improving transparency for all political donations. I said earlier that referendum machinery reforms should not only be considered on the eve of a referendum, 
But we also can't ignore the timing in the context of this bill. Alongside progress towards treaty and truth, the upcoming voice referendum is a generational opportunity, and it will be critical to maximise the participation of all Australians in the vote. The voice referendum is about giving First Nations people a say in the policies and programs that affect their lives. Without reforms, there is a real risk that many First Nations people may not get the chance to have their say on the voice referendum itself. We want to give the voice referendum the greatest chance of success. First Nations people will be the most directly affected by the outcome, and so it's imperative that we do everything possible to ensure that their voices are heard in the vote. This is not about giving anyone any new rights. It's simply about giving people the best chance to exercise their rights. And whilst enrolment among First Nations people has been increasing, it remains lower than the non-Indigenous population. Many First Nations people who are not currently on the electoral roll and who may not have participated in recent elections could try to vote in the referendum and be turned away. On the day enrolment and provisional voting options like those proposed in the Greens amendments, which will come to in committee stage of this bill, would allow voters, including but not just voters in First Nations communities, to attend a polling place, apply for immediate enrolment and cast their vote. The vote would be done by declaration and only added to the formal count once the usual checks are made and the AEC had verified that the enrolment is lawful. There is no downside to this proposal. There is only an upside of enabling people to have their say on a policy that will affect them. This system has worked well in the Northern Territory for years and it's had a positive impact on voter turnout. On the day enrolment, along with automatic enrolment and the current mailbag program to allow automatic enrolment for communities with centralised postal services, will maximise the number of people who are eligible to vote. And in a democracy, we must constantly work towards ensuring everyone can have their voice heard. But even with efforts to increase First Nations enrolment, many voters, particularly in remote areas, may be effectively disenfranchised by the unpredictable, limited availability of mobile polling services. During the last election, some remote communities were only visited by remote, mo remote mobile polling units for a few hours, and some missed out altogether. Communities received very little information about when polling places would be open, and many people missed out on voting as a result. We need to do better than that. The government is moving amendments to extend the mobile remote polling period from 12 days to 19 days, and we welcome that as a positive first step. The AEC has confirmed to the Joint Standing Committee on, Le on Electoral Matters, on which I sit, that this extension of time would significantly enhance their capacity to get to remote communities and give those communities enough notice of the opportunity to vote. The NT Electoral Commission uh, report on the daily by-election noted that where a polling place in the Wadai community was open for five days, there was nearly a 40 per cent increase in voter turnout uh, compared with the previous by-election where the polling place was only open for two days. Giving people in remote communities the best chance to have their say is an investment that we need to make. The phone voting service trialled during COVID pro uh, proved a very successful way of enfranchising voters who had no other way of casting their vote. The Greens support extending that option to provide a way for people at risk of missing out on voting to have their say including voters in remote areas who can't get to a polling place, people with an unreliable postal service, people in care facilities or who are unexpectedly in hospital on referendum day, people impacted by climate disasters and overseas voters who can't get to an embassy. Phone voting would be used in rare circumstances only, but particularly when it comes to foundational decisions about constitutional reform, Australians should be given the widest possible range of options to ensure their voices can be heard. That's why I'll move amendments to that effect as well. The Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters has made similar recommendations, and the AEC has supported those calls. The government needs to act. We're pleased that they'll extend mobile remote polling, and we urge them to support on-the-day enrolment, to support provisional voting and phone voting so that all Australians can have a say. If the AEC is supportive, it's not clear what is stopping the government from acting. There also needs to be a concerted effort to engage interpreters to assist voters at polling places to understand the voting process and to make sure that their vote can be counted. Interpreters play a critical role in translating material, 
but also in reducing distrust in the process. Despite the clear benefits, the last election saw many communities without interpreters. The AUC needs to be funded to ensure that that situation is not repeated for the referendum um, nor for any future elections. The Greens also believe that constitutional reforms are, are generational changes that will affect the lives of all Australians. Young people, particularly First Nations young people, will be impacted by the outcome of this upcoming referendum and deserve to have a say. We estimate that an additional 32,000 First Nations people would be able to vote if the voting age was lowered to 16. The Greens have a bill to allow 16 and 17-year-olds to vote, and we urge the government to get behind that. Lastly, I want to briefly talk about the pamphlet which the government has now agreed to prepare. The Greens support some form of independent, objective information outlining the yes and no cases being made available to the voting public. However, we acknowledge the many submitters who have questioned whether the pamphlet and the archaic way that it will be developed meets this objective. It's critical that all Australians are given access to resources to inform their decision. This is true of both elections and referendums. Any time we go to the voters and ask them to choose, the options must be clear. We've already seen the danger of misinformation and missing information in the current debate. Resources on any referendum must be accurate. Resources on this referendum must ensure that they don't misrepresent the implications of a voice, that they don't fear monger or spout racist or discriminatory talking points, and that they don't undermine the democratic process. We want a vote informed by robust discussion where people can trust the information they get about the alternatives and where we get a result with integrity. We will be supporting measures called for by our crossbench colleagues to ensure that the pamphlet is clear and factual and developed in consultation with experts. We'll also support measures to ensure materials are available in appropriate formats and languages to reach all voters and continue to support calls for truth in political advertising campaigns in all elections going forward. The Greens believe in democracy and we want to see referendums conducted fairly and openly with transparency and respect. This bill goes some way towards that and we will keep the pressure on the government to go further in electoral reforms in this term of parliament and we again urge the government to support Greens amendments that would actually allow First Nations voters to vote in this historic referenda about whether they have a voice to this parliament. Please don't miss that opportunity to actually increase the chances for people to have their voice heard, particularly on a matter that affects them, um, and to get this done in a timely way. Senator Dodson. Uh, Acting Deputy uh, President, uh, I rise to speak on the uh, Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022. This bill provides a foundation for a fair and transparent referendum on a voice to parliament by the end of this year. As already noted, the Referendum Machinery Act has not been used since 1999. It has not kept pace with the improvements we have made to the Commonwealth Electoral Act, improvements that ensure we have free fair and democratic federal elections. The primary purpose of this bill is to replicate the improvements that have been made to the Electoral Act for this referendum and for referenda into the future. It will mean that the experience people have when they come, uh, that they've come to expect when they vote in a federal election will be the same as when they cast their vote on referendum day. And this will be one of the most significant votes most people will make in their lifetimes. Referendum are infrequent, but they are at the heart of our democracy. They provide Australians the opportunity to use their vote, their right to vote, to consider changes to the Australian Constitution. The Constitution is an act of the Westminster Parliament for the people of Australia passed in 1901. Only the people of Australia voting in a referendum can change the constitution. In that sense, it's the Australian people's document. In the forthcoming referenda, the Australian people will be asked if they support the principle of recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the constitution and whether they should have a say to the parliament and the executive on matters that affect them. 
the details of what the voice is, how it functions and how it will influence change for the better, will be dealt with by the Parliament after further consultations with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So what does this bill actually do? It seeks to update the laws governing the machinery of referenda. The last referendum was held without modern online systems, without social media, without email campaigns. It was also held without many of the rules and protections that have been built into the Electoral Act since then. Those incremental changes may not be obvious to many members of the public or even to many of us in this chamber, but they have become essential to the smooth running of the voting process. So the important changes made by this bill uh, will include banning foreign donations from the referendum campaign, allowing people uh, to apply for a postal vote online rather than using paper form, vote saving measures so that the people's vote can be valid where their intentions are clear, enable early sorting of pre-poll votes to support a timely result on the day, extending protections to prevent multiple voting, updating authorisation rules so voters know who is behind political materials, extending contingency measures to enable the AEC to conduct referenda safely in times of emergency. The bill also introduces a funding and disclosure scheme to ensure that there is transparency and accountability. No matter what your views on The Voice, these changes should be a no-brainer. It's about ensuring people who turn up to vote at the referendum can vote in the same way they are used to voting at a federal election. It's about transparency and accountability. It's about bringing our referendum machinery into the 21st century. And importantly, it's about ensuring an efficient and fair vote so that, we, so that when we head to the ballot box later in the year, we can be confident that this referendum is conducted on a sound and safe foundation. It is important too for Australians to be able to focus on what the referendum is about and the significance of the principle they are being asked to vote for, a voice to the parliament for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Leaders of the Uluru Statement understood that it is the Australian people who make decisions on our constitution. That is why they invited us to all walk with them and support their recognition in the Constitution. For 122 years, our Constitution has failed to recognise the First Peoples of this country and their continuous connection to the land for more than 60,000 years. We were deemed by the Founding Fathers to be a dying race. And so Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are conspicuously absent and unrecognised in our founding document. The political power to lord it over us was held by the states. It was not until 1967 that we were finally counted in the census and the Commonwealth was given a clear power in the, Const in the Constitution to deal with us. And while the 1967 uh, referendum was an historic moment of national unity, the work of constitutional recognition is unfinished business. Fifty years later, and more than a century after Federation, there, is, there was another constitutional convention at Uluru, this one held by the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples. The Uluru Convention followed months of consultation and 12 regional dialogues that involved more than 12,000 First Nations peoples from across the country. It built on work previously done by the Constitutional Recognition Committee. At Uluru, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people spoke up about how they wanted to be recognised in the Constitution. They presented us with a proposal that is elegant in its simplicity and potent in its capacity to achieve practical change for their lives. 
a constitutionally enshrined voice that can advise the parliament and government so that better policies and laws are made. It's a fact. You, give, you get better outcomes when you consult people on the issues that affect their lives. This is what is proposed after almost 250 years. During, uh, during the last sittings, I spoke about meetings I held in regional Western Australia during the week of action on The Voice. I spoke about the traditional owners, elders and community leaders from these small and often forgotten communities. They explained why The Voice is important to them. We heard from the Carriera elders that The Voice, and I quote, the next step in a long history of advocacy by Aboriginal people of the Pilbara. We heard from the Nyingarda people and their elders who said, the voice will empower community voices. When we heard from staff who worked at local organisations, health services and organisations rehabilitating young people about the differences that the voice will make to their work. <coughs> They need to have a say over the policies and laws that, make, that we make in this place that affect their lives, laws that affect their health, their ability to get jobs and housing, the well-being and education of their children. These are people who have worked hard to improve the living conditions of their communities. They deserve to be heard at the national level and they will be heard if the referendum is successful. So when we consider this bill, about the mechanical provisions, keep in mind that what it is ultimately about. I want to briefly reflect on our experience of negotiating this bill with some of those opposite. From the start, we have extended the hand of bipartisanship on the referendum. The voice should be above fear-mongering and political gains. The government has agreed, in a show of good faith, to reinstate the official pamphlet, and yet the, the support of the opposition is still wavering. Or well, as I've heard today, they will not be supporting the bill. On this side, we are treating both yes and no campaigns even-handedly. Zero public funding for both. Because as I have said, this is the people's referendum. It's for the people to organise their own campaigns and their own funding. This, those on the other side believe in the free market. Well, to them I say that both supporters and naysayers, naysayers are free to fund their own campaigns within the legal constraints of the bill, of course. So now is the time for those on the other side to support this bill whether or not they intend to finally support the voice. Because this bill is about fair, transparent and accountability processes. It is about recognising that it's a modern world, much changed from the time nearly a quarter of a century ago when Australians last voted in a referendum. It's a modern world and it will be a better world if, if this legislation is passed, because it will lay the groundwork for a referendum that will create a legacy. If the referendum is supported, that all of us in this chamber can then be proud of it. In closing, let me say something about the AEC. The AEC has been working very closely with the engagement group that the government has set up and they've been very responsive to many of their suggestions and concerns. And in parts of our country and some of the jurisdictions, their work has actually increased the voter registration for Indigenous peoples. They have been responsive to the calls about remote polling and the need to stay longer. And they're even considering other matters. The work that they will do to help Australians attend be informed about the process and to be able to exercise their vote in this very important referendum is being undertaken. This bill is well worth supporting and I commend it. Senator O'Sullivan. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution on this debate and on this uh, important bit of legislation that we have before us. Uh, I want to state at the outset that uh, I will be, I won't be supporting this bill, and I'll lay out the reasons why throughout my contribution. Uh, it's uh, also want to make it very clear to those that might be following. Uh, this debate here today that this bill is about setting up the, the mechanism to be able to have a referendum. It's not actually a substantive debate on the referendum itself and it's certainly not uh, a decision on the final outcome that will be you know, up to every Australian to decide uh, what, they, what their position will be. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on I guess, those two latter points uh, throughout my contribution today. And indicate you'll be able to indicate from what I say where where I'm at with it. But uh, I just want to really focus in on the mechanism uh, bill that's before us and uh, and address address the concerns that that I've got uh, with, uh, with for this bill that's before us right now. This this bill seeks to change the way in which the referendum on Indigenous voice is carried out, uh, and uh, be of no doubt that the changes that are made here will impact future referendums, and uh, that's why it's critical that we get this bill right here today. We're, we're debating the way that Australians can have a say on how our constitution is changed and the most important framework uh, governing this country. So it is absolutely critical that we get it right. It's absolutely critical that we get it right. As the Institute of Public Affairs said in their submission to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, constitutional changes represent a fundamental alteration of the institutional and government arrangements of the country. The drafters of the Australian Constitution allowed elected politicians to propose constitutional amendments but reserved to the Australian people the right to approve those proposals by way of a referendum. So the opposition have raised uh, three points uh, with the government to address the concerns uh, that we have with the referendum process. The first is to restore the pamphlet to outline the yes and no case. And I, uh, uh, understand there will be an amendment from the government to address that, and that, that's good, that's welcomed. Uh, I look forward to, to seeing it and understanding exactly how it's going to work. Uh, the second one is to establish a yes and no campaign organisation, and uh, we understand that that's not what's happening here, and so that's a, a major concern, and I'll outlay, outlay my concerns uh, for that. Uh, and uh, and uh, that those organisations also be appropriately funded. So these are the three things that the that the opposition are, are looking for. Uh, as I said, I welcome the government's announcement. They'll restore uh, that pamphlet, and I uh, look forward to, to seeing that amendment and, and understanding it better. Uh, originally, the prime minister wanted to conduct this referendum uh, where the views of both cases were not distributed to the Australian people, and uh, that's a real shame. Uh, the, the, the requirement for a pamphlet was actually introduced in 1912, so it's been a very long tradition that's been there, and it's, uh, it's critical. In fact, there's only been three referendums that have been held uh, in 1919, 1926 and 1928 where the yes-no pamphlets were not distributed. Now, The AEC gave some evidence to the, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters that a pamphlet to all Australian households will cost approximately $10 million. Uh, further to this, the AEC has said that around 40 per cent of Australians rely on receiving a pamphlet that they provided by the AEC. So despite what my fellow West Australian uh, in the other place, uh, the member for Perth, said, uh, it's not sufficient, um, uh, or despite what he says, uh, uh, where it's, it's sufficient for people to only uh, receive this information by TV, email and social media as if you know, we've sort of move beyond the need to get this information. I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's absolutely critical that people are provided that. Uh, one of the reasons it's critical is because you can't always trust what you read online. Uh, if you receive something from the very credible source, being the Australian Electoral Commission, it gives Australians confidence that what they're reading is actually legitimate, that it's not influenced by any particular uh, uh, agenda or any particular actor that might seek to, to interfere. Uh, it, and so having that AEC uh, letterhead or, or the uh, inscription on the, on the envelope that you receive uh, adds, adds particular confidence to the reader, to the receiver of that 
notification to be able to know that what they're seeing is in fact uh, from an authorised source and, uh, and, and can be trusted. And it, the pamphlet and the information contained within it will uh, present both cases and it will present it in a clear way, in, a, in hopefully a concise way, it won't be too lengthy, uh, and it will present it in a way that people can understand it so that they can make a proper and informed choice. And so it is critical that that information is provided. You can't just rely on, on TV advertising. Um, you can't just rely on emails being sent out. You can't rely on social media to be able to deal with it. We, we, we all see things that are sent out via social media and sometimes they're not always accurate. Sometimes they're, they've been taken over by others. Uh, it's boofing as they call it. Uh, and so we obviously want to make sure that that's avoided. Uh, it should be noted that a previous House of Representatives Standing Committee into inquiry into constitutional reform and referendums in December 21 recommended that electoral commissioner should be allowed to distribute a pamphlet through the mail and any additional methods that the commissioner considered appropriate. That was recommendation six. And as the IPA correctly noted in its submission, abolishing the requirement to publish and distribute a booklet to electors on spurious grounds cited by the federal government overturns an important and indispensable Australian political tradition, critical to freedom and democracy, which has ensured arguments in respect to both sides of the debate can be heard. But then we saw last month that the Prime Minister have his uh, Saul on the road to Damascus moment where you know, he performed a spectacular backflip, uh, no doubt one of many that we'll see that this government will do over the next uh, two and a half years that are left of their term. Uh, but, and what we saw is that the Leader of the Opposition rightly pointed out the fact that it's quite, and I quote, it's frankly quite arrogant of the Prime Minister to believe that he did not need to provide these details to the Australian people. We welcome the Prime Minister's uh, change of heart and, and willingness to help inform Australians on what they'll be voting on, uh, but we can't rely on Labor government to do anything right. Uh, we know that Labor have had not had a lot of success when it comes to referendums. It's not since 1946 since they last held a successful referendum, and, it's, uh, and it was the only time that they succeeded in changing the Constitution. This was to give the Commonwealth power over a range of social services, such as age pensions and unemployment benefits and the like. Uh, now, this bill, sadly, also does not provide for official yes-no campaign organisations. Uh, this bill does not outline any official funding for those campaigns. And so far, what we're seeing is that this government's handling of this debate is woeful. It's woeful. Now, I've had a lot of experience in working across uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs and. Indigenous Affairs across the country. I've worked to, uh, alongside uh, Indigenous people to ensure that uh, to help them achieve uh, great outcomes, particularly in the area of employment. Uh, I'm very proud of the, the work that, uh, uh, through the partnering that I had with many different people and many different organisations, saw you know, tens of thousands of long-term unemployed people, people that were uh, Centrelink had classified as having intractable barriers to employment, to see those people take up work, uh, be provided with the training, get them into jobs, sustainable jobs and, uh, and importantly, retained in those jobs. And so I've got great networks uh, uh, across the country in, in connection with uh, many, many uh, Indigenous people and I can tell you they want real outcomes in their communities. Uh, they don't want Talk fest. They don't want. Um, they don't want you know people speaking on their behalfs, and they, they want to have a very real outcome in their community. I'll give you a real good example of this. Just this week, I got on the phone. I haven't had the chance to get up there mainly because the roads have been blocked and there's been uh, other issues. Uh, you don't want to be a tourist as such. But I uh, spoke to people uh, on the ground in Fitzroy Crossing this week. Now. Those that followed it know that there was enormous floods, record level floods that went through there over, um, over January and uh, wiped out the bridge, wiped out significant infrastructure across that community. And, uh, and I called and asked how things were going and I planned to go up there in April when I get the first chance to get up there. And uh, I, sp I spoke to someone on the ground that said, oh, you know, some bureaucrat somewhere in West Perth 
or here in, in Canberra, uh, made the decision that we're going to put a barge across the river as a temporary measure to deal with the, the fact that the bridge was washed out. And they said if they just spoke to the local people, they understand that the water levels go up really high when there's floods and it drops really quickly. And the idea of a barge was never going to work because uh, you know, once the water levels drop, you obviously can't take the barge across the river, yet it still might be impassable to trucks. And they said so they, they spent all this time, all this money, building the the, the entrances and on both sides of the river and getting it right for this barge to go across. And the barge worked for three days. And right now the barge doesn't work. They're going to have to put a dredge, they're going to have to dredge it underneath so that the barge can cross the river. Where if they spent the time, if they listen to us, we know our river, we know our community. If they spent the time actually understanding it, they would have done the preparatory work on the crossing that's always there when the water level drops, even if it just meant that there was a couple extra weeks where we had to rely on other sources to get goods across, across the river, uh, we'd have a more permanent solution and once the water level dropped quick enough, we'd be in a position to be able to, to move ahead. Now, you know, it's just an example of where you've got to be listening to the voices of those on the ground and not just some elite high level, high level uh, thing. And so, uh, so the hopes of Indigenous people across the country are held high in relation to the outcome of this whole thing. And so it's incredibly important that the government gets it right. And it starts with this bill. And sadly what we're seeing is that they're not getting it right. Their handling of this debate is, is, uh, is really, really terrible. Um, I, I don't want to see a situation where you know, we've raised the hopes of people across this country and those hopes been, been dashed because of the poor handling of this government of this particular debate. Now, what we know is that uh, this government has a, or Labor, has a poor history when it comes to referendums, as I said, since, uh, since the early 40s, mid 40s of last century, since they last had a successful referendum. And so it's, uh, it's, it's critical that, it's, that we get it right. Um, now, this bill uh, makes no mention of the plan to regulate donations. Um, We've, we've seen that foreign interference uh, can really play an active role in, in elections, and it's important that uh, elections are, and, and referendums are, are held uh, without any, any taint of, of, of interference, because that would uh, completely undermine the whole process and it would be an absolute, uh, an absolute shame. Uh, as we know, even political parties uh, have been targeted. Uh, so it wouldn't make sense that the practical measures to help mitigate the risks. Uh, uh, it would make sense that the, that the that practical measures to help mitigate the risks are, are in fact included. Uh, so on those grounds alone, I, I think uh, it's a good reason to have some formal structure around the referendum. Uh, at least a nominated official yes and no campaign. Uh, I, I've got. Uh, big concerns about this referendum. We've got big concerns about the proposal that's put forward. Nothing so far that the government have put forward has assuaged my concerns. I'm, I'm a constitutional conservative. Uh, changing the constitution has to be, if it's ever changed, it has to be done after very careful consideration. Nothing that the government have said so far, nothing in their handling of it has assuaged my concerns. And 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 I think appropriately setting up to ensure that there's a proper process, to ensure that there's scrutiny and ensure that there's integrity around this referendum, they should establish both a yes or allow the establishment of both a yes and a no organisation, two organisations that are seen by the Australian people as being trusted sources on the situation, on the issues that are, that are, being, that are before us. And you don't have to agree with both, of course. I mean, you won't. You're going to choose. You're going to pick a side. But it's important that, those, that, that there be those organisations. Unfortunately, this bill doesn't enable the, the establishment of that. Certainly, doesn't allow for the, the funding of that. And I think that's a, I think that's a real shame. And it's not going to do anything. The problem that I'm seeing in this debate is it seems that the Labor Party thinks that everyone thinks like them. So they're just thinking that people will just go along with it on the vibe of what's going on. And sadly, that's not the case. I mean. 
even the election results showed only 30 odd percent of people actually voted for the Labor Party. So they can't think that everyone thinks like them because they only had a third of people actually support them at the election. So get it right, Labor. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I want to start by saying that this country is one of only a few that does not have a treaty with its First Nations people in this country. And instead, uh, we're going down the, the road in reverse uh, and wanting to put First Nations people into the colonising uh, constitution that was born in 1901 uh, over top of the oldest constitution on the planet. I'll park that for now, but I do wish to speak in general support of the intentions of the Referendum Machinery Provisions Bill. It is providing much needed updates to how referendums are conducted in this country to keep up with our times. It is also uh, a way to prevent foreign interference with our matters in this country and they are truly ours to dissolve. But I also think that the bill fails to address some key matters, in particular when it comes to the provision of independent and factual information on the referendum cases and the accessibility to voting. Accessibility for those who cannot easily attend a voting booth due to various reasons but also accessibility in regard to cultural and linguistic background. Not everyone's white anymore in this country, right? And last but not least, accessibility for First Nations people to vote, in particular in the upcoming referendum, given you wiped out 97 per cent of our people and we're only 3 per cent left, so basically it's up to the majority of white people in this country to decide what's best for us. Uh, First Nations voices to parliament where it is absolutely essential that First Nations people are getting as much say as possible, which we know we're not, given that it is pretty much a white majority in this country who would decide what is best for us. The debate around the referendum has already lasted many months and will last many more, and we've seen politics playing out strongly in the course of this, including the um, separation in communities and being told which camp are you in. Are you in the yes camp or the no camp? And not even taking into account that we have a progressive no who want a treaty and the end to the war that was declared on First Nations people in this country. But, you know, we'll park that because that doesn't feel good out there. The fact that genocide still continues in this country against First Nations children. But, you know, let's get back to the warm and fuzzy of a voice. I appreciate that the government has put forward an amendment to their bill to enable the pamphlets to be produced for the referendum after all. However, we have heard coming out of this joint standing committee into electoral matters report on this bill is that people are concerned about politicians developing these materials. <laughs> you imagine politicians developing these materials. Look at this place particularly for the upcoming voice referendum, and that there should be an independent entity responsible for developing the pamphlets. I mean, who trusts a politician in this country anyway? This is why I'm moving today an amendment which would put the responsibility for preparing these materials for the voice referendum in the hands of the Australian Human Rights Commission. The AHRC is a very well respected by all and in good position to ensure the referendum implications on human rights are fully considered. Because you know politicians in this place don't really care about people's human rights. So how can you trust them? The AHRC would be responsible for ensuring that information is clear and factual and accessible to culturally diverse communities and First Nations communities. Well, imagine that. Understanding what a referendum actually is about 
is incredibly important so that people can make an informed decision, which is what politicians don't want the people of this country to do. They don't want you to know the information that makes the decisions in this place. And this bill goes into that. Accessibility to information but also to the voting process count in any electoral matters and it is time we ensure that those who cannot easily physically access a voting booth or who live in remote areas can still easily vote. And beyond what you all think, their votes actually matter and you need to make it available for these people instead of ableism that occurs in this place too often. This is why I've proposed for mobile polling booth periods in remote areas be extended to 19 days instead of the turn up and leave when you've had enough of being in that community for half an hour. I appreciate that uh, after conversations with the government on this matter that they actually agreed to my amendment and therefore I won't be putting that forward because they did see the importance of having the polling booths available for people a lot longer than they normally do. Whilst this provision will assist First Nations people in remote communities to vote in referendums, there is more that needs to be done to ensure as many First Nations people as possible can vote, particularly in a referendum which decides over us being put in the colonial constitution or not. Senator Dodson just stated that the constitution is the people's document. Well, since 1901, it has been the white people's document, not ours. Now our people are supposedly going to get acknowledged by this document, but once again, we don't get a real say and we certainly don't get any real power. Something that would make a real difference to the First Nations vote is allowing provisional voting and enrolment on that day, which is why I will move amendments to extend this today. If this government is going to claim that this referendum supports self-determination of First Nations people, then it needs to be doing everything it can to ensure as many blackfellas vote. We might only be 3 per cent of the population due to the genocidal acts of previous governments that wiped out 97 per cent of my people. We don't get a say. It's up to everyone else. Where's the self-determination in that? The government has expressed reservations around allowing provisional voting, even though we have heard of the benefits of it in the inquiry process from the Australian Electoral Commission themselves. I quote the Electoral Commissioner, Mr Rogers, I would really like to see it in the referendum referring to enrolment on the day. I think it's important, he says. I know it may not, may not make it into the legislation, but we think it is a fail-safe mechanism. I guarantee that when we get close to the event, it will become significant. And I think it will be a problem if we don't have it. So when First Nations leaders, which you love referring to all the time, and now the Electoral Commission himself is calling for the inclusion of provisional voting, what will it say if the government does not support this provision? How much faith does this give us that the government listens to advice such as provided by the proposed First Nations voice to parliament. We know it's a tokenistic gesture from the Labor government. You know, it's the black cladding that you need. But you won't even listen to the advice on ensuring that blackfellas actually get to have a say in matters that affect them. You're showing your colours now. They talk about voter fraud, despite there being no evidence that this actually occurs. That's what you came back with me with during the negotiations that you're worried about voter fraud if our people get to enrol and vote on the day. You know what that is? It's racist. 
with the AAC dismissing concerns around this. Fears of voter fraud is simply racist rhetoric that Conservatives have used to suppress First Nations people. Provisional votes still require some form of ID, whether that be a Medicare card or a Centrelink card, and can involve an, el an elder attending the booth to help verify people in the community. It's all right for your Labor elections, you'll allow all that to happen, but when it comes to this business, you're not doing the same thing. It is not hard to do, and it would be a real shame to see this government reject the advice from First Nations people and the Australian Electoral Commission on this measure that would significantly increase First Nations vote. You would think in good faith you'd just do it. But you're going to make it hard for blackfellas to vote. Well, wave the flag. Article 5 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples states that Indigenous people have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political, legal, economic, social and cultural institutions while retaining their right to participate fully if they so choose in the political, economic, social and cultural life of the state. Now, I know you don't care about the UNDRIP. We know that Australia is only a signatory to it and it's just a token other gesture by saying, oh, we, we're signature to the UNDRIP but we really don't care about it and we're really not going to make it part of the law in this country. But it makes us feel good that it's just over there somewhere. This right and the right to citizenship is undermined if First Nations people are not able to exercise their right to vote, especially in a matter which foremost concerns us as a people. Today I'm also proposing televote, telephone voting provisions, similarly, similarly to those that, were using, that we were using during COVID, to be made permanent so that people in remote areas in residential care, in hospitals, not just blackfellas, everybody, or places affected by emergencies, which we know this country is full of, can vote through a secure telephone line. This would also apply to those overseas who have no access to a postal vote or overseas polling place, and would also allow homeless people to vote. I mean, you're not looking after them fellas in the first place. At least let them vote. Or you're scared that they might vote you out when they get the rights. All of these matters are incredibly important to ensure people can engage with and access this next referendum. And in fact, any referendum. In particular, First Nations people and those from diverse backgrounds. You talk about the people, you talk about the voice. In fact, you talk, talk, talk. There's no action. Don't talk self-determination when self-determination means that the government control what we decide. It doesn't make sense. And you're in breach of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and this country is still guilty of genocide, with 22,000 Aboriginal children in out-of-home care today. So give us the rights to participate in the democracy you're so precious about and allow those that aren't as able as you all to pick up the phone, to vote, but also to be able to enrol on the day and vote and allow the people to self-determine their own destinies instead of bullying your way through and shutting voices down. I would like to ask you all to consider this properly and I would ask you all to think seriously about supporting my amendments to this bill. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy President. 
Uh, I too rise to speak on the Referendum Machinery Amendment Bill 2022. And I think the first point I wish to make is that it is extraordinarily hard to change the Australian Constitution. The Australian Constitution is the founding document of our parliamentary democracy, the founding document of our nation. It does represent uh, what we aspire to be, and it, the drafters of our constitution made it particularly difficult to change the constitution. They set a very high bar, and they did so for a very good reason, that you do not want, particularly in a federation where you have the coming together of the states into a nation, to create a founding document, a constitutional arrangement that is very easy to change. To do so would, of course, invite chaos where state and federal governments are never clear as to their responsibilities and roles in the nation and would find it extraordinarily difficult to actually navigate uh, a changing environment in that way. And I think if you look back on the history of Australian referenda, you'll see that, that only eight of 44 have passed. That's a well-known statistic. Uh, eight of those, the eight that did pass, three of them were actually held together. So you actually have only five occasions when people voted, or six occasions when people voted, where they actually agreed with the proposals in front of them. Uh, so the Australian people have shown a reluctance to change our foundational document uh, throughout our history. Uh, referendums need to be very, very, very necessary and very well understood and discussed prior to being presented to the Australian people. And we look back now with the benefit of hindsight, with the benefit of history, at those proposals that the Australian people rejected. And I think in the vast majority of cases, the Australian people got it right. The Australian people got it right. Uh, you, you look at the raft of early referendums uh, that were put up, perhaps unsurprisingly by this place, by the federal parliament, uh, to extend and expand its powers after a number of initial High Court judgments that, quite rightly at that time, saw the state governments as having a very significant roles in certain areas of public policy. Uh, and so you have, in fact, quite the reverse probably of the situation today and of the last 50 years, where in those first 20 or 30 years of democracy, where the referendum proposals were about expanding the powers of this place, uh, you have the outlying states actually supporting them. So the vast majority of referendum proposals in that 1901 to 1930 period were actually supported by states like my home state of WA, uh, South Australia, Tasmania, um, and Queensland, because at that time they had a very unique dynamic in that they were much smaller, much less economically developed, much more reliant on assistance from a small uh, and albeit relatively uh, less powerful Commonwealth government. And so when presented with the opportunity to expand the powers of the Commonwealth government to perhaps gain a bit more support, um, those states, those smaller states, actually voted yes, but the referendums failed because of the requirement that it is a majority of people in a majority of states. And that was a very important check that the drafters of our constitution put in place. Because, as I say, in hindsight, when you look back at those proposals, I suspect that every single one of them now would be opposed by the voters of Western Australia, South Australia, Queensland, and I won't comment on Tasmania, but I suspect they'd all vote against them, and quite rightly so. Um, the, the, they were probably um, uh, overreach at that time. And so we see regular failures of referendums throughout our histories. Now, the ones, the ones that... And another one that failed I just want to highlight, uh, which again, I think today, we look at it and we say, goodness gracious, was it even ever proposed the power to give this place, to give the, the Commonwealth Parliament, 
power to, um, to, to basically nationalise monopolies, uh, uh, to nationalise uh, corporations or people in positions of significant uh, uh, commercial power within our nation. Now, again, that, that would, was soundly defeated. It was soundly defeated in a referendum where there was no yes and no case presented, which uh, again had become the norm even at that point in our political democracy. So uh, you can see that the Australian people have, uh, over the course of our history, our constitutional history, been very reluctant to change our foundation document. And that is why it is so important. It is so important, even more important, I would argue, this day and age than in previous uh, referenda, that in an age of disinformation, in an age of misinformation, in an age where the sources of information that are available to people are both legion and, in many cases, highly dubious, that we actually look at machinery bills such as this one and actually make sure they are crafted to achieve the outcome, which is giving the voice to the Australian people's decision making. So that is why we uh, have a number of points as a coalition that we have raised. Uh, the, 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 the need to restore the yes and no cases, which were in the first draft of this bill eliminated. The importance of establishing those official yes and no campaign organisations, which have become a part of our usual expectations uh, of referendums proceeding and appropriately funding uh, the official organisations. Um, once again, we don't have to look back that far in history to see that the Labor Party has a very poor track record in these machinery provision bills. Uh, we only have to go back to 2013 uh, to see the Labor Party then putting up a referendum on the recognition of local government. A recognition, I would point out, that had failed twice before, uh, and so the Australian people had had says on that proposal uh, in the course of relatively recent political history, I believe, and, and this is just going from memory, but I believe it was 77 and 88, but um, th that, that matter had been put before the Australian people at least two times before, and the Australian people had said uh, quite resoundingly that that was not something that they supported. Now, there was a very particular set of circumstances around that bill. It was done as part of a deal to form government by uh, well, the then opposition, no, then Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, with uh, Mr Windsor and Mr Oakeshott. It was part of their demands to form a minority government with Labor that a referendum on local government proceed. But then the handling of that referendum, the handling of that referendum was to put it in its kindest light, highly dubious. Uh, rather than equally funding a, a yes and no case as had become the norm, the decision was taken to hand the yes case $10 million and to hand the no case $50,000. Now, I will say those numbers again because it is an important fact to remember that the Labor Party in government at the last referendum they put forward was willing to go to a referendum where they funded the yes case, $10 million, and the no case, $50,000. Now, this was done on the spurious basis that only uh, a couple of members of parliament had voted against the bill completely lacking any justification. The fact that only two members of parliament voted against the, the uh, machinery provisions bill did not reflect their view on the final referendum outcome in any way, shape or form, just as the vote on this bill does not represent a view on a referendum outcome in any way, shape or form. And yet, at that time, Labor was willing to use the very paper-thin justification of the fact that there are only two votes against the uh, referendum mechanism uh, legislation to 
do unbalanced funding to the tune of $10 million for the yes case and $50,000 for the no case. Now, as it turned out, that referendum didn't go ahead, and, and you know the politics of that was very strange as well. Obviously, Prime Minister Gillard lost out to Prime Minister Rudd, and the election date changed by a week, slightly suspiciously, which meant the referendum was knocked off the agenda. I, I, would, I would be willing to, to put 10 quid on the fact that, uh, that it was knocked off the agenda because they knew that referendum was going to go down and go down resoundingly. Uh, regardless of how many people voted in this place voted against the referendum machinery bill, I know that in my home state of Western Australia, and having been uh, working in politics at that time and talking very closely with large numbers of people, even those inside local government uh, at that time, who were extremely, extremely opposed to uh, that referendum uh, being successfully carried. So, so I, I suspect that in, in the knowledge that, that that referendum was not only going to go down, was going to go down resoundingly and was going to go down at a time uh, of a federal election where, um, where the Labor Party had acted so inappropriately in funding the yes case to the tune of $10 million and the no case to the tune of $50,000, uh, that it, the election date just happened to be moved forward by a week so the referendum wouldn't go ahead. So, so Labor, sadly, has form. I mean, this is, this is an area where you cannot afford to be political. As I said earlier, 44 referendums in Australia's history, eight passed. This is an area where you cannot allow politics to enter the fray. Uh, you, it can be a, a discussion. People can have legitimately different perspectives. But when you start politicising these things, when you start treating different sides of an argument in different ways, when you start uh, ruling out or ruling in uh, the traditional way that we have approached these, a, a, a traditional, an Australian commitment to fairness, a fair go, uh, that, that is something that we on this side take, take very seriously indeed. Uh, and that is why, again, yes, uh, the, the, those opposite, the Labor government has acted on the yes and no case, um, though um, I, I haven't looked at the amendment yet myself, but I certainly will do so. Um, but it needs to go beyond that. And the coalition and, and Senator Hume made it very clear, the coalition's position, that it needs to go beyond that. Labor needs to be committed to a referendum arrangement and structure that is fair, open, transparent, deals properly with donation regimes, with foreign interference, and provides a plan for how the scrutiny of the referendum will be conducted. So I say to those opposite, I say to all Australians, this is extremely important. It is hard to change our foundational document, and it should be hard to change our foundational document. It is a matter that all Australians deserve the utmost chance to hear arguments before and against, to hear the case for and against. And without that, I think we leave ourselves in a very difficult and dangerous position as a democracy. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to speak in uh, support of this bill, although I will be moving a number of amendments to try and improve it. Uh, when it comes to setting up the conditions for a referendum, we've heard arguments that tradition is important, and, and I agree. Uh, there is much to be said for, for looking to the past and seeing uh, how things were done, how that served us, uh, but that should not stop us from ensuring that we are learning from the past and that we are putting into place things to deal with the, the challenges we know that we are facing when it comes to referendums and, and elections and the changing uh, landscape when it comes to 
social media, the, the, the expectations of Australians when it comes to truth in political advertising, uh, political donation reform, the advances in technology to allow those, those things to be, uh, uh, to be dealt with by, by the government. Um, while I'm hopeful that these amendments will receive support, uh, I'm realistic that they're unlikely to uh, get enough support to get over the line in the face of opposition by the major parties, which, which is, is really disappointing, to be frank. We hear a lot about transparency, um, and yet when Australians are clearly saying we want uh, more real-time political donation reporting, we want truth in political advertising, we want to be able to trust the, the ads and um, you know, things on, on, online when it comes to elections. We don't hear much from the, from the major parties. They point to reviews. When we actually have an, have an opportunity now with this referendum to put some of those in place. This uh, referendum will be a defining moment in our history. Uh, as a younger Australian, I see it as an incredible opportunity to begin to write over a hundred uh, plus years of wrongs, of not listening, of not consulting, and for the first time as a nation to say we acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, and we believe that they should and they will have a voice on issues that affect them. That's what this referendum is about. The details of how that happens, what that looks like, is up to politicians, is up to elected representatives, as it should be, to vote on the model. And then you'd hope over time to improve it. <laughs> that's, what we're here, that's what we're here to do. This is not a, a set and forget thing. This should be a, a matter of principle at the, at the referendum and then a live ongoing debate about what is the best way for First Nations voices, Australia's first people, to have a voice into issues that, that affect them. Uh, to save the, the Senate uh, time when it comes to Committee of the Whole, I'm, I'm going to run through my amendments here. Uh, the first one is real-time donation disclosures, and I know that a number of crossbenchers have raised this. Uh, as this is something that is raised with us often and will be circulating uh, amendments if, if, if hasn't been done already. Uh, I believe it's so important from a transparency perspective uh, that when we go to the polls to vote on this potential change to our constitution, we know who's funded the yes and no campaigns. Uh, clearly we need that level of transparency at federal elections and I'm very hopeful that um, the government will We'll move on that before the next election. But this is an opportunity with the referendum. It's frankly laughable that a six months plus after an election, we see who funded it. It's, it's not good enough anymore, and it's, it's very uh, easy to fix. With technology now, we could have uh, close to real-time disclosures. I am suggesting uh, 14 days for these uh, disclosures. Uh, to be made public, seven days to submit a donations disclosure declaration and seven days for it to then be made public. Um, this technology is clearly available. This is about political will from, from the government. The uh, next amendment uh, is to do with exclusion zones, uh, referendums, uh, like elections, can be very emotive. Uh, we've seen that play out uh, even in, in, you know, amongst politicians in, in this place and, and the other place. And there are a number of jurisdictions that do have exclusion zones around uh, 
polling stations where you ex exclude uh, certain activities uh, like handing out of how to vote um, and other behaviour designed to influence others. And, and this amendment proposes setting up a similar zone uh, nationally for, uh, for the referendum. I believe it's an opportunity to ensure that uh, polling stations are a safer space where people can go and cast their vote on this, this very important issue and avoid the potential of uh, you know, some, of the, some of the awful scenes that we've seen um, on television over the weekend. The next amend amendment uh, is fact-checking of the pamphlet. Uh, whilst I don't necessarily agree that in, in 2023 we should be mailing a pamphlet to every household, the government has decided that that's something that they want to do. At the very least, it should be it should be fact-checked. We've heard a lot about truth in uh, political advertising. Senator Brockman talked uh, about us living in the age of disinformation and misinformation. And I believe this amendment begins to address some of that because we have seen over a number of elections political parties engage in misinformation and smear campaigns. And while the member for Warringah uh, Zali Stegel has been pushing for much broader truth in political advertising reform, which, which I fully support, and I, from what I'm hearing from people in the ACT, certainly the majority of people support. It makes a lot of sense. Again, we need political leadership, political will from, from the government on this. Whilst there is the broader agenda, we have the opportunity to ensure that, in the very least, the pamphlet goes out and the contents of that pamphlet are grounded in fact. Uh, it doesn't seem like a, a, big, a big ask to me. Um, the pamphlet written by parliamentarians, uh, my understanding it, it can have up to 2,000 words for each side of the debate. Um, I've had a lot of people concerned about this, raise it with me. Um, including people on the referendum working group, saying if we are going to have a pamphlet, let's ensure that this pamphlet is factual. Because we, we saw in the, in, the, in the federal election, there was some pretty average uh, things going out in the, in the names of, of various uh, political parties and activist groups. And this, this place, the Parliament of Australia, needs to set the standard if we're going to send something out, that should be factual. Australians should be able to believe what they see coming from our parliament. As it stands, that, that, that potentially won't be the case. Yes or no can write what they want and mail it out to every Australian household. I, I don't see how that, that's good enough. We talk about... Um, wanting to, to raise the standard of, of debate here, wanting to uh, restore some, some trust in, in politics, in politicians. Here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity for, for the referendum. So I implore the government to consider this, this amendment. Uh, this is common sense. This is sensible. This is simply ensuring that whatever goes out on that pamphlet is grounded in fact and people can have confidence in that. Uh, the last uh, amendment is to simply add social media to the advertising blackout period. Uh, again, uh, things are changing. I, I don't see why we should say there's a blackout period for, um, for TV and print media and not include social media where we know a huge amount of advertising happening, happens, a huge amount of political advertising happens around uh, elections and a uh, referendum in 2023, will, will, I think that will certainly be the case. So again, I, I really ask the government to consider that small update, uh, which again is, is possible. Uh, social media companies have pretty stringent 
uh, rules when it comes to political advertising. So it is the argument that it's too hard simply doesn't, uh, doesn't work in this case uh, because there are ways that they could ensure that all political ads are, are pulled a, a few days before, before the referendum. Those are, those are the amendments. Um, again, setting up this referendum for what, what is a defining moment in our history. And I would urge, urge parla parliamentarians to stop playing cheap politics with this. This has the potential to change our nation for the better to begin to deal with the problems that we, we, in my short time here, we have debated for hours, wanting the federal government to step in and, and intervene in, in Alice Springs. What's happening, happening there is, a, is an absolute tragedy, but we know that these things do not happen overnight. This is a, this is a build up over a long time having a way for Australia's first people to have a voice to Parliament, in my mind, would better equip this Parliament to make laws, to be able to consult, to, and then to make laws in a, in a way that is, I think, more reflective of, of what Australians want of what Australians want Australia to become. Um, this, is, this is a huge opportunity. I, I really implore uh, people in, in, in this place to, to embrace this. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's something that I think is, is, on, is on all of us. The way that we, we talk about it, the way that we set this up, uh, and then leading into the vote, the level of, the level of debate. Um, that is a choice that we make and we will be held accountable uh, for, our, for our actions after that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator uh, Pocock. Just so uh, Senator is aware, because I'm in the chair, I'm due to be the next speaker, but Senator Scar has kindly agreed to do a swap uh, with me. So I thank you, Senator Scar, for that. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I, uh, I did kindly agree um, as you walked up to take the, uh, take the chair. <clears throat> and good to see Senator Farrell here as, as well this week. Um, good to see Senator Farrell back. It's always a pleasure uh, to follow Senator Pocock. And can I just first acknowledge uh, the heartfelt nature of his comments and uh, his, uh, he brings to this debate and, and to all the discussions in this place a, um, a heartfelt um, conviction uh, to do what's best for this country, and I, I acknowledge that, Senator Pocock. Queensland has voted yes in 21 referenda out of the 44 referenda, and as far as I can work out through my research, there has not been a single referendum passed in Australia without Queensland support. So Queensland is a key state in terms of all referenda that are considered in this country, including the forthcoming uh, referendum. So I think that context is very important to note. Australia has a history in terms of referenda where uh, on many occasions the most popular states have approved a referendum have majority of citizens in those states, namely Victoria and New South Wales, have voted in favour of a referendum, but less popular states have voted against referendum. And uh, that should be recognised and noted uh, by all senators engaging the, in this debate. There are really three issues which the opposition has raised in relation to the referendum machinery. And at the outset, I compliment the government for at least addressing the first one, and that is the need for a pamphlet, for a pamphlet to be disseminated 
uh, to all Australian voters in relation to the referendum and for that pamphlet to have a yes case and a no case. I do take on board Senator Pocock's observation with respect to a pamphlet and whether or not it's required in this day and age, but I think the AEC, certainly in its evidence which it gave to the committee, noted that a lot of people do rely upon that sort of information coming from the AEC. So I think there is benefit in terms of having that pamphlet with the yes and no cases. One other collateral point I just want to speak to, which Senator Pocock raised in that context, was this issue of fact-checking. Now, as a matter of principle, one could say, well, what's, what's the concern about fact-checking? The issue is, when does a fact become a matter of opinion? When does a fact become a matter of opinion? So it could well be that a majority, certainly a majority of the ex-High Court judges who have written opinion pieces in relation to the impact of the proposed wording to the Constitution might consider that the risks are low in relation to uh, courts deciding matters flowing from that wording to the constitutional amendment. It could well be that a majority of ex-High Court, ex -high court justices have that opinion, but there are also High Court justices, in particular Ian Callanan from my home state of Queensland, who has a different point of view and believes there are risks associated with introduction of those words. Now, should it be within the province of a so-called fact-checker to make a determination on the basis of whether or not those risks are live risks or, are, or, or aren't live risks, or should it be for the Australian voters to make their own decision based on the credibility of people putting the differing arguments and deciding for themselves? That is my concern with respect to so-called fact-checking, that issues which are really matters of opinion, subjectivity, fall within the province of so-called fact-checkers, and people are just given one uh, predetermined view with respect to matters in which there are legitimate views on both sides of an argument. That is my fundamental concern with, the, with respect to the concept of fact-checking and how fact-checking can morph into opinion vetting. Um, and, and, and go beyond the remit of just checking facts. And that is a real concern that I have with respect to the notion of fact-checking. Let people check their own facts. Let, the, let people assess the credibility of those who are putting forward arguments. Let people access information in the marketplace of ideas and come to their own view. And come to their own view. And I think that's an important point to note. The second point moving on then from the issue of the pamphlet to the issue of formal campaigns, I think there is great merit in terms of the establishment of, of formal campaigns, a formal campaign for and a formal campaign against. In the context of so-called fact-checking and the credibility of arguments which are put forward and the basis for those arguments, having formal campaigns will actually provide a credible source for people to go to to obtain the reasoned arguments, whether or not in favour or against any particular policy. So I think there's great merit in terms of having formal campaigns recognised. The other thing it does, the other thing it does, and Senator Pocock has spoken about uh, finance donations in relation to this referendum campaign, having formal campaigns established also assists in terms of ensuring accountability with respect to the reporting of donations and getting across the maze of our electoral laws with respect to the reporting of donations. So that's the second limb of why it's important to have formal campaigns recognised. The first, that people have got a credible source where they can go to to get the information that they're searching for to answer their questions when they're determining how they're going to cast their vote in relation to the referendum. And the second point is that also it also provides for accountability with respect to the deployment of donations and to ensure that our Australian electoral laws are complied with. Last point I want to make, the third point, is with respect to funding. Now, bear in mind, bear in mind that we're considering and debating a piece of legislation that deals with referendum machinery. So it isn't just a question, from my perspective, with respect to the forthcoming voice referendum. It's a question as to what should be the principles that apply when the Australian people are considering a change to their referendum, uh, a change to their constitution. What should be the principles that apply when the Australian people are considering a change to their constitution? 
And first principle, I think a pamphlet which has a no and a yes case being disseminated to every Australian elector, I think that's an important part of the process. Formal yes campaigns and no campaigns providing for accountability, credibility and responsibility, I think that's an important limb. But the third one is equality of funding. And in this respect, in this respect, again, as a general principle, there should be minimal, a minimum amount of equal funding provided to the yes case and the no case. A minimum level of funding, a minimum level to ensure that the arguments for and against have the ability to cut through to the Australian people and the Australian people know where they can get the information which they're seeking in order to make their decision with respect to the voice referendum or any other referendum or any other referendum. Now, I want to go back in time, and Senator Farrell may remember this, uh, to I'm not going that far back in, in time, Senator Farrell. I'm sure there's many things you'd remember, but we're not going too far back. <laughs> but I do want to go back to the local government, proposed local government, recognition of local government. Uh, referendum. I'm not sure you, Senator Farrell. Do you go back that far? Order. Order. <laughs> Order. Uh, rhetorical. I'm, a, I'm sure you do. Uh, and in that referendum, in that referendum, the choice was made by the then Labor government that they should allocate $10.5 million to the question of whether or not local government should be formally recognised in our constitution. Allocation of $10.5 million. But $10 million was to be given to the Australian Local Government Association for the yes case and $500,000 to the no case. And this allocation of funding was based apparently on the percentage of members of parliament who supported the change. Now, I don't want to go back in history and analyse the reasons for that, but the basic proposition that you would give $10 million, 20 times as much to one case over the other case, did not go down well with the Australian people. It did not go down well with the Australian people. In fact, it actually, in, in fact, it actually um, hardened the opposition to the referendum. It actually hardened the opposition to the referendum. So it was a, a strategic blunder uh, by the then Labor government, and it didn't end well in terms of the prosecution of that case. So I think there is a lesson we should learn from history, and I think this is an example which suggests that in terms of looking at funding, we should look at providing equal funding to both a yes case and a no case, a minimal level of funding to ensure that the arguments can be ventilated in an appropriate way with the Australian people. If other people want to provide additional funding, absolutely, that's their right. We live in a democracy, no issue at all. But there should be at least a minimal level of equal funding for both a yes case and a no case, notwithstanding whatever the question is. Whatever the question is, whether it's the voice or anything else, there should be that minimum equal level of funding. The last uh, comment I want to make in relation to this matter is the way in which the debate is conducted. And I've spoken in this place before and called out what I consider to be egregious personal attacks which have been made on various members um, of this place. Who have, who have stood up and given their perspective, have given their view with respect to this question. That is unacceptable. It is unacceptable that, that senators, members of the lower house, members of the Australian community, it is unacceptable that when they get up and give a good faith, bona fide position, view with respect to this referendum, it is unacceptable that they be personally attacked, personally attacked, their motives impugned and subject to personal slurs. That is unacceptable, and I say, I say to, um, I remind myself in terms of this debate. I mean, we should all reflect on this, including ourselves. But I say, those who are, who engage in conduct at that level, all you will do, whatever your position on the side, whether or not you're yes or no, those who engage in that in that conduct, those who use that uh, that overblown language personal slurs and rhetoric, all you will do is empower the opponents of whatever position you hold, whichever side of the debate you're on. Because Australians typically, certainly in my home state of Queensland, do not 
do not approve of that sort of personal politicking. They really don't. So I hope all of us, I think all of us in this place, should lead by example in terms of the conduct of this debate and call out those who overstep the mark. I understand it's a passionate debate uh, and you've got to give some licence on that regard. But the line has been crossed on a number of occasions during the course of the last 12 months in ways which I consider to be indefensible. And certainly, um, I believe those who've overstepped that mark have, uh, in fact, uh, undermined their own credibility when they actually raise legitimate arguments for the consideration of Australians in the context of this debate. So, uh, with those comments, um, I, uh, I support the, uh, the position of the coalition in relation to this bill. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak to the Referendum Machinery Provisions and Amendment Bill 2022. Um, this bill is an enabling piece of legislation that will pave the way for our first referendum in nearly 25 years. For many, this will be the first referendum that they have ever voted in. The topic of the referendum aside for just one moment, this in itself is an incredible opportunity, and it's an opportunity for a new generation of people to participate in shaping our constitution, ensuring that our constitution is updated and that those updates are voted on and are fundamentally enshrined and as part of our democracy here in this country. And at its core, that this is what this bill is actually about. It's ensuring that people can participate in shaping a fundamental document for this country. And that the way that we can conduct referendums in the future is the importance of what this bill represents. Now, regardless of your position on the voice or on the constitutional recognition, giving the people of this country the chance to have their say on the matter is about supporting a healthy democracy. Your personal opposition doesn't mean that the people of this country should not get to have their say, and I urge members of this place to reflect on this as they vote on this bill. Now, this isn't the first time we've attempted something like this, and many of you may remember that we had a failed attempt made by Prime Minister, former Prime Minister John Howard in 1999, when the proposed change mentioned First Nations people in the preamble. This was a proposal that involved no consultation with the Australian public or with First Nations people, but in fact this time it is different. And this calls for a voice to Parliament. And indeed, the other two elements of the Uluru Statement of the Heart, which are about truth and treaty. And these arose from many forums after much robust discussion. And most importantly, this it came from First Nations people. The constitutional reform process is now entirely appropriate as opposed to the reform that was proposed in 1999. This referendum isn't about what form of recognition Australian people want to give to First Nations people, but whether they will accept the form of recognition that is being sought by First Nations people. So I want to echo the comments by my colleague, Senator Waters, about the great importance of this referendum, but also the importance of actually getting this process right to ensure that many people can vote in this referendum as possible especially First Nations people. Now, the Greens have several amendments before you around this matter, and particularly around provisional voting and voting in prisons. And at its core, the, the voice actually allows First Nations people to have a say on matters that affect them. And yet, many First Nations people will not have to have a chance to have their voice actually heard during this referendum process, particularly if the amendments before you don't get up. The government has a very important role to play to make sure this, in fact, is not the case. Now, there is a long history in this country of First Nations people not being able to vote. And I take this chance to remind you that First Nations people were only granted the right to vote in 1962. Historically, we've not been allowed to vote at all. Now, there are other obstacles that stand in the way of First Nations people voting, such as the location of polling stations and the requirements of enrolment that many in this country still cannot meet. The Australian Electoral Commission has estimated that there are 87,000 First Nations people that are eligible to vote but are, in fact, not enrolled. 
There needs to be a grassroots community movement to get as many people on the electoral roll as possible, which is led by elders and trusted community leaders. It is completely understandable why many First Nations people don't want to vote, and we need to meet them right where they're at, have a yarn with them and help them to get what they actually need in order to enrol to vote. And there are also many who wish to enrol but cannot simply meet those requirements. So this is not about stacking the vote, as we've heard here today and heard in particular from, from the government, but this is about ensuring that people exercise their right to vote. Voting is a right. It's not a privilege. And it's the job of this government to make sure voting uh, is as easy as possible for everyone, regardless of where they are across this vast country. And if they may be in prison, in hospital, in a remote com community or even abroad, they should have that opportunity and that right. Now, there has been uh, $52.6 million allocated to the Australian Electoral Commission the National Indigenous uh, Australians Agency and the Attorney General's Department to prepare this referendum. And this must include efforts that absolutely get the 87,000 First Nations people on the electoral roll able to uh, have access to provisional voting, voting in prisons, mobile voting booths and communications in language that ensure that people understand in their own language what they are in fact voting for. Now, this includes independent and fact-checked pamphlets, but it's also vitally important that the information in any pamphlets is carefully considered and also cross-checked. For this to work, we need as many people to participate as possible. We know that provisional voting is possible, and the wonderful crew at GetUp has done some incredible work in provisional voting it's particularly in the most recent Northern Territory election. We must allow people to enrol to vote, to cast their vote on the day. Now, this is key in ensuring that as many people get the opportunity to have their say as possible. There is no evidence, I want to repeat that, absolutely no evidence that provisional voting is a risk for voter fraud. And indeed, provisional voting is supported by key stakeholders which you've heard earlier, particularly from the Australian Electoral Commission. Now, 32 per cent of, Aboriginal, of people in prison are, in fact, First Nations people. Now, many of these people will not have the opportunity to vote. First Nations people are not just overrepresented in our prisons, but also they are disproportionately impacted by our criminal justice system and receive harsher, harsher penalties. Now, the harsher penalties often impact on their eligibility to vote, their eligibility to have access to identification. Now, this is all part of the continued colonial oppression that First Nations people still experience to this day. Now, I can't understate how important this is, what these amendments will do to ensure that everyone, but especially First Nations people, can vote in this referendum. We have a lot of work ahead of us to ensure that this referendum is in fact successful. And this bill is just the start. And the Greens are supporting this bill, but as Senator Waters already said, we are seeking to improve it. We need to get First Nations people on the electoral roll to communicate information in language, ensuring voting is accessible in remote communities and to make provisions for people to enrol and cast their vote on the actual day of the referendum. I am absolutely disappointed and it's shameful that the government will not be supporting our amendments. And these amendments that can ensure many people, especially First Nations people, can actually vote in this referendum. This is about access and equity. This referendum is to establish a voice to parliament. The voice is supposed to represent them and the government is actively opposing measures that will enable greater First Nations participation. Shame! So if there is any genuine and meaningful action towards self-determination that is in fact informed and framed by our human rights, 
This work is in the present and, in fact, it is right here and now in this place that the government must ensure these reasonable amendments are supported to ensure the success of the voice to parliament. I've said this before and I'll say it again, that this should be a unifying moment in this country, a turning point for us. We need this because for the last 230 years, First Nations people have not had a voice, or if they've had a voice, they haven't had it listened to. We have been subjected to countless government policies, some of them well-meaning and most of them absolutely devastating to our people. So this referendum is just the start of what could be a decade of change for First Nations people, which is why it's absolutely vital that we take the time in this place to get this process right. So I am asking all of you to take this into consideration when you think about voting for this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator Bragg. Thanks very much. Acting Deputy President, um, I won't seek to recite or repeat all the various numbers that have been uh, discussed this morning about the lack of success of referenda in Australia over these past 120 years. Uh, but uh, these changes that have been proposed are modernisation changes lar largely, uh, many of which were canvassed in a significant report. Uh, conducted in the last parliament by the House Committee on Social and Legal Affairs. Um, and this bill, which we are looking at today, uh, does seek to modernise voting and counting, authorisations, uh, financial disclosures for referendum entities, and also to deal with foreign donations. Uh, the coalition has flagged that there are additional changes that we are seeking, and I wanted to uh, put on record uh, my thanks to Senator Hume for the work she has done in working with the government to secure the yes and no booklet, which I believe will be an improvement to the bill as originally introduced. There are some additional changes uh, that have been sought. Uh, in relation to uh, yes and no campaigns and the designation of those and uh, the proposal of administrative funding for those campaigns if they were to be designated. Now, uh, these are laudable objectives to try and ensure that we have a clean referendum uh, because in the age of misinformation and disinformation, uh, we don't want to see the referendum tainted in any way by outside actors, uh, given the deteriorating environment in which we live. Uh, the, the idea of having yes and no cases uh, is not a new one. Uh, there were committees that were drawn upon for the Republic referendum in 1999, uh, so it's not a new idea. Uh, it may be a complicated idea, though. And we need to look very closely at how uh, that would work, uh, given that there, there are a multitude of voices in this space. Uh, there are already multiple no campaigns, uh, and there are different views on the yes side as well. So it would be important to give careful consideration as to how that would, would work, uh, given there are strong views amongst both camps already at this very early stage. Uh, I think the question of administrative funding is a clearer concept uh, if you can deal with the difficulty of designating a committee or designating a particular campaign or group of campaigners. Uh, I would say that this is a issue where there is an enormous amount of misinformation and it may be very difficult to bring all the different views on just one side together. 
but I believe it is worthy of consideration. Um, I wanted to talk about the issue here of the voice. It is a referendum, like the other 44 that have occurred in the past, but it is a referendum which, is, which must be above politics because it is not about a routine or day-to-day -day political issue. Uh, it is about trying to overturn and reverse 120 years of paternalism, uh, which has been a disaster for Indigenous people in the main. And when you stand back and look at Australia, you can say, yes, we have been a very successful country, but we have not been a good country for Indigenous people in the main. And we spend a lot of time in this chamber and the other place discussing the various discrepancies on an almost weekly basis, as we should. So in order to achieve success at this referendum, and I want to acknowledge the, the Prime Minister's leadership in putting this on the agenda, it, it does require a process which enables everyone to get behind in their own way, recognising that for different communities and different Australians there will be different ways that they will respond to the messages in this campaign. And, and as we saw with same-sex marriage in 2017, uh, there, is a, there will be a desire, there will be a need for there to be targeted messaging to motivate people to vote yes, perhaps, but also to vote no, if that is the will of the campaigner. And so to date, I must say that it is regrettable that there has not been more effort put into setting up structures inside this parliament to enable there to be a bipartisan position uh, or tripartisan position in relation to these matters. In terms of the wording of the document itself, or the wording that is proposed to the document itself, uh, we read in the papers today that the government wants to introduce a constitution alteration bill in these sittings. Now that is, that is their prerogative, but the fact that that has not been the product of a parliamentary committee I think is hugely regrettable, because once the government introduces a bill into this parliament, then that is by definition the government's policy. And I think there have been multiple attempts by members of this and the other chamber uh, to work with the government and offer to work with the government and the community on looking at the wording that is going to be put to the Australian people. Now, I recognise that the minister is proposing that there be a, a routine committee. Uh, I assume a select committee or through the legal and con committee of the Senate to look at the wording. But as I say, that will be reviewing the government's policy. It would have been far better if the parliament could have looked at the various models for constitutional alter alteration before a bill was introduced into the parliament. Now, I make these statements because I think that we are addressing a bill which is to do with the ongoing machinery arrangements on referenda. But it is very hard to separate the fact that this particular bill is being introduced and debated as a precursor to the voice referendum. And even glancing at the House committee recommendations from 2021, uh, that, that link is made. So I would say that if we want this particular referendum to be successful, as I do, uh, then a lot more effort needs to go into building up uh, a broader base of support for the change. Uh, I know that many people here and many people around Australia will also vote no. And that is, that is a reasonable position. And it doesn't mean that you are a racist. It doesn't mean that you are anything. Uh, and we want to see a debate where the facts are known, there can be civility, and the, vo the vote will be known to all Australians uh, with a degree of integrity. And my sense of what Senator Hume is trying to pursue here is just that, that the, ch that the changes that are, to, are to, to be made to the Referendum Machinery Act are changes which ensure that Australians have confidence that the referendum to be conducted later this year on The Voice has been conducted with integrity and appropriate governance and oversight. But we, we want to think very carefully about the changes we make here, uh, particularly if we are to be empowering ministers to make judgments uh, about these matters. Uh, 
there are there are very different views about these issues in the yes and the no campaigns, and I think we ought to consider that. Uh, but I want to place again on record uh, my acknowledgement of the work that's been done uh, by the government here in introducing a slew of changes which have been needed to the Machinery Act, but also the suggestions that Senator Hume has made, uh, part of which has been adopted by the government. And in closing, uh, I want to reiterate again for the record uh, my expectation that whether people are yes voters or no voters, that they will engage in this debate with respect and civility. Because uh, if this is a yes vote, I personally believe that if the wording in the in the constitution, if it is right, it will be a very significant uh, step forward. But if it is a no vote, uh, which I think would be a disaster for race relations in this country, um, we will need to live together, and it will, we will need to find a way uh, to move ahead. And uh, anything we can do to maximise opportunities for us to get to a yes vote with a bipartisan accommodation, I think should be uh, urgently addressed by the government in the coming weeks and months. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Little. Well, the referendum working group is still working out the detail as we are being asked to pass this legislation, the Referendum Machinery Amendment Bill. Flip-flopping, backflipping, chopping and changing, making it up as we go along, is the staple of the lead-up to the voice to parliament by this government. We've seen changes to the wording, a suggestion the voice might also speak to National Cabinet, then maybe not, muddling about it making representation to executive and parliament. One week we were told the voice is about closing the gap, next reconciliation, but wait, it's also about giving Indigenous people a say in the laws, or is it now matters that affect them? And it's about international reputation. It's all a little confusing, really. Regardless of whether you have made up your mind long ago or are still waiting for the detail, one thing that should be a given is that the information related to the question is accurate and presents both sides for consideration. The bill makes fundamental changes for how referenda are conducted in Australia that go beyond what has been done in the past. Australians have proven time and time again they don't take changing the constitution lightly. And so we should all be cautious every single time, regardless of the question. Australians think deeply and carefully about changes to the constitution and should expect that their only consideration and concern should be how they vote, not the process that has enabled the vote. Of the 44 referendum that have been put to the people on the Australian constitution, only eight have succeeded. This referendum should be no different to any other in form. There is no genuine reasonable reason for it to be different or out of step with every other referenda. That is why I won't vote for the Referendum Machinery Amendment Bill in its current form. In an age of disinformation and to ensure no matter where you live or how you access information, the Australian public must have access to and know that there is credible, reliable, evidence-based information they can rely on. That will assist a strong, informed referendum process and a process with integrity, transparency and accountability. To support the bill, three points need to happen. Restoring the pamphlet that outlines both the yes and no case, establishing official yes and no campaign organisations and appropriately funding those official organisations. This bill removes the requirement to provide all households with a pamphlet outlining the yes and the no case for changing the constitution. This action sets a dangerous precedent. The requirement for a pamphlet was implemented in 1912. This is the first time there has been no pamphlet provided to voters since before Farlat won the Melbourne Cup. In 1967 and 1977, only yes pamphlets were provided to the electorate. There have been three referenda without an official pamphlet. 1919, when there was insufficient time to produce them. 1926, when there was no agreement on how to produce the yes argument. And 1928, when there was overwhelming agreement between parties and governments. In the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, the Electoral Commissioner said that a significant education effort would be important to ensuring that individuals and entities involved in referendum campaigns are aware of their disclosure obligations. The Act prescribes that the arguments in the official pamphlet can be up to 2,000 words 
in length each. And there's a timeline to ensure it arrives in a timely manner. How could anyone understanding the diversity of Australians think there was something wrong with that? We welcome the government's announcement to restore the pamphlet, but we'll re reserve our position until a final amendment is presented. It's the detail that's needed. The bill does not outline any official funding of these campaigns. We can't support a bill that doesn't have a plan on how to properly regulate donations, foreign interference, or that doesn't provide a plan for how the scrutiny of the referendum will be conducted. Surely it's reasonable to look at simple, practical steps that put structure around this process and helps our regulators and our agencies manage the referendum. Changing the rules to meet the fast tracking of an election promise creates risks, some of which could be resolved by the establishment of appropriately and equally funded official yes and no campaign organisations. We welcome the engagement from the government on this bill, but until we have our concerns addressed, we must and will oppose this bill. In the general community, I still hear from people that say they don't even know what a voice is. There is little confusion about the concept of constitutional recognition, but the concept of voice remains insufficiently explained. It is simply not their priority and not front of mind for people with the cost of living being the predominant issue I hear about. Yes, although the public narrative seeks to ignore them, there are also Aboriginal people who will not vote for it. People who need to be reached with quality information wherever they live and regardless of whether they formed a position. If the process for referenda needs to be changed, then it should not be made up on the run. These changes without proper consultation and interrogation should not become a precedent for future referenda. This bill suggests a number of non-controversial changes to the Act to bring the operation of referenda into line with the Commonwealth Electoral Act. These positions have been advocated to the government by the opposition consistently. We will support a bill that allows for a referendum process that informs voters and a process with integrity based on precedent, whether you live in Pukacha, Port Augusta or Peterborough. We have heard from the Australian Electoral Commission that when they provide mailed material to voters during elections, 40 per cent of recipients will use this documentation as a main source of information in casting their vote. We also know that electoral events are increasingly influenced by misinformation. The ACCC has published data that has reported that 92 per cent of the respondents to the ACCC news survey had some concern about the quality of news and journalism they were consuming, and that analysis has identified concerning consumer and competition harms across a range of digital platform services that are widespread, entrenched and systemic. An official yes and no campaign will increase the trust and integrity in the process. Having an official yes and no campaign will make things simpler for the regulatory environment and for the proper conduct of the referendum. The AEC has given evidence to parliamentary committees that the donation and disclosure regime remains the most complex part of the Electoral Act. We know there will be a significant number of participants and organisations in this referendum who will not be associated with political parties or do not, do not regularly participate in electoral events. Having a single point of coordination for an audit process for donations for reporting suspected interference is the best way to ensure the integrity of the referendum. They have even acknowledged that political parties sometimes struggle to get this right. We are seeking an assurance that once these bodies are established that there is a guarantee of equal funding, if any is provided, to each side to ensure that neither side is advantaged and to ensure that they can comply with the disclosure and regulatory regimes at the referendum. The Act governs how the government must conduct a referendum. It is similar to the Commonwealth's Electoral Act's role in governing the process and procedures in conducting an election. The Act includes how a referendum's donations regula and regulations will operate, how the pre-poll, scrutineering and counting will operate, and how the newly introduced foreign interference regime will operate. Any change must be in an organised way, not made up on the run for a process that has the potential to result in a change to our most important document, our constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Little. Senator McGrath. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Consideration of, constitu of constitutional change should be 
carefully considered. It should be balanced, it should be thoughtful, and that consideration should be without undue or nefarious influence. We live in an age rife with misinformation and attempts at foreign interference in the Australian political landscape. And with the vast uptake of social media across the world, it is my concern that it has become increasingly difficult for people to be able to find fair and honest coverage that does not already affirm their previous convictions. Modern politics is solo-esque. Views are echoed in partisan safe spaces, rarely challenged, barely understood. Social media was to be the great leveller, but instead the use of social media in campaigning has become the great builder of walls. And so for an undertaking as important as the proposed amendments to our constitution, the independence of media, freedom from misinformation and countering foreign interference is the key to a sustainable democratic outcome. However, sadly, the Labor government does not seem to think that the sanctity of our referenda is so important. When it comes to the voice referendum, the Labor government has consistently been dodgy with the detail. On top of providing no information to the Australian people about what the voice department would actually look like in practice, with this bill that they now effectively want to halt any form of independent public discourse entirely by killing off any form of serious, balanced, democratic debate. A constitutional referendum is a rare thing. It has been pointed out by senators in this chamber that it comes along once every 24, 25 years. And it is because it comes so rarely that we should ensure that our consideration of the question is done without recourse to an allegations of gerrymandering the result. And this is what we face today, because Australians rarely change the constitution. We've had 44 since Federation, only eight of which have passed. And for a third of Australian voters, this will be their first referendum. So we need to do this properly. We need to do this thoughtfully. And we've had the time to do this slowly. But unfortunately, we have a Labor government who are playing politics with constitutional change, who are playing politics with the unity of this country. And that is a shameful thing. We need to ensure that every Australian has the right and the obligation to hear the arguments in favour of constitutional change and, as importantly, the arguments against constitutional change. But to hear the arguments free from misinformation and free from foreign interference. So I am concerned, as someone who has spent most of his life campaigning for the centre-right of politics, but campaigning for freedom, not just in this country, but in emerging de democracies around this world, it is my concern that we have a government in this country who are abusing the democratic process and are, going, are attempting to gerrymander a result. And that does concern me. And that is why our position has been clear-cut from the get-go. The position of the coalition has been so clear. 
We must restore the pamphlet to outline the yes and no case. There must be an establishment of yes and no campaign organisations. And those campaign organisations must be appropriately funded. Now, I'm going to refer to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters and their gloriously titled Advisory Report on the Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022, an inquiry which uh, myself and Senator Cadell participated in over the Christmas break. And doesn't that tell you something? That over the Christmas break, this Labor government referred an inquiry into this bill to be conducted when Australia was on holidays. Now, of course, being senators, um, uh, we, we, we don't take holidays, unlike the, you know, the riffraff in the other place. And so we happily participated in this inquiry. And the coalition senators brought forward a dissenting report, disagreeing with many of the government's proposals, but also just so for those who might be listening at home, agreeing with where the government wanted to, to update the bill to bring it into line with how federal elections are run. It is important that on some issues like that there is a, a bipartisan approach. But when it comes to constitutional change, that when the government over the Christmas period I think from memory on that we had inquiries I think on the, the 21st of December and I think maybe the 9th of January. It's almost like the government was trying to hide something, trying to hide that they were going to change this bill and change how referendums are conducted in this country. That meant that members of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters did not have sufficient time to scrutinise witnesses and the proposed bills, but more importantly, it limited the ability of Australians to find out what the government was up to. Now, we're very fortunate that we have wonderful organisations like the Institute of Public, for Public Affairs, um, which I'm a member of, just to clear that conflict of interest. And they did an analysis of the submissions that were put in to this inquiry. And, and what they found out is that there are 78 submissions and that 97 per cent of those submissions where a view was expressed on the need to have or not have a pamphlet, that 97 per cent of those submissions expressed a clear opinion in favour of a yes and no pamphlet. And why I raise that is Labor didn't want to have a pamphlet. They had to be dragged kicking and screaming. And our view is, and we do welcome Labor's backflip, that is to be commended. But I would ask that Labor and Senator Farrell to be versatile when it comes to backflips and to do similar backflips in relation to the designation of official yes and no bodies, but also for there to be equal funding of yes and no bodies. And it is my concern, regardless of your view of the voice, whether you're yes or no, you should have the view that the process should be thoughtful, carefully considered and, and without favour to either side. And I'm a student of politics, a, a student of politics, which is a polite way of saying a nerd, and, and, what, and, and what I've observed and what I would warn the government about is to look at what happened in the United Kingdom less than a decade ago where the political establishment, where the sporting establishment, where the business establishment, where the establishment, were all in favour of Remain, of the UK remaining in the European Union. 
And there was a referendum that, that was promised by, by David Cameron. It was an election commitment. And what that referendum campaign showed is that when the government take people for granted, that when the government effectively attempt to gerrymander the result of a referendum, the mob out there sometimes will have a different opinion. And my observation of the Remain and Brexit referendum was that the, the Remain side won every single opinion poll up until when the votes were counted. And Brexit won. And I would encourage the government to be so careful because you are bringing forward a referendum that you have not explained to the Australian people and you will not explain to the Australian people. My leader, Peter Dutton, the leader of the coalition, the leader of the Liberal Party, has put 15 questions to this Labor government and no answers, no replies. Such arrogance, such sadness that, that people would, would, would call for good manners in the demonstration of the political process, yet fail to demonstrate such manners themselves. Because it is so important that there is a consideration here of what is being proposed substantively in the referendum, but as importantly, as senators who are protectors of the state's rights, who are those who stand up against the, the excessive behaviour of the executive, to ensure that this House of Review holds the government to account and makes appropriate changes and amendments to this bill so when the referendum is put forward later this year that the Australian people, those people of whom we are accountable to, those people who are our bosses, can make the decision on as much information as possible in front of them, that information that is not subject to to people who do not have Australia's best interests at heart. The Director General of ASIO only a few weeks ago told Australians that we are seeing the greatest level of foreign interference in Australia's history. And surely we should look at some simple practical steps that can put a structure around this process and help our regulators and help our agencies manage the referendum. We know that there has been foreign influence in other countries. In Canada, their intelligence agencies have uncovered plots to interfere in their 2021 election in order to create a minority government. And according to secret documents published by the Globe and Mail, Chinese officials in Canada said Beijing wanted a minority government so that parties in parliament are fighting each other. This is one of a list of a long list of foreign influence campaigns that have been revealed publicly, not just in North America, but in Europe and elsewhere. We are not immune. We know that we've had our own parties targeted with reports that the Labor Party and the Liberal Party and the National Party have been victims of state-sponsored hacking. So on those grounds, just those grounds alone, we think it is a good reason it is sensible to have a formal structure around the referendum that allows a pamphlet to go to every household, that allows there to be yes and no campaigns who can help the management of campaign donations and that those campaigns are equally funded so that we do not have the nefarious influence of big money in Australian politics attempting to, to change the constitution against the will of the Australian people. Thank you, Senator McGrath. I call Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I also rise today to speak against the bill before the Australian Senate. Um, as Senator McGrath has so eloquently stated, a referendum to change the founding document of this nation, 
the Australian Constitution is not something that can be taken lightly. It is particularly incumbent on those of us elected to this place to uphold the highest standards of integrity when examining the process by which any such referendum should be conducted. In fact, given the speech by Senator McGrath, it is a little ironic that the Albanese Labor government, who talked so much about transparency and integrity prior to being elected to govern, would actually bring this bill to the parliament, because there is nothing in this bill that lives up to the standards that Mr Albanese had said he would be setting himself in terms of transparency and integrity. It is irrelevant what question is being put to the Australian people. Any question which will change the Australian constitution, in this case to establish a voice to parliament, is a momentous occasion. In many ways, we are the protectors of this nation's founding document, and each and every one of us in this place should take that role very, very seriously. There is no doubt that we live in an age where information is ubiquitous, as is disinformation. Therefore, it is important that the government takes the lead, which it is not doing with the bill that it is presenting before the parliament, by providing clear information to Australians and delivering a strong referendum process. Those of us on this side of the chamber believe that the government is falling short, in fact I would say well short, of what should be done. It took pressure from our side for the government to commit to producing pamphlets to outline the yes and no cases. How do you actually answer questions from the Australian people when they say, when will I be receiving the yes and no case? And you have to say to them, well, guess what? The government did not want you to receive a yes or no case. They are actually lost for words and cannot believe that a government would want to hold a referendum without actually formally providing them with a pamphlet that outlines clearly both the yes and no cases. This should never have been something that was in dispute. A responsible government embarking on this referendum process should always, unless it has something to hide, should always have been willing to outline the two cases in such a way. We also believe that the official yes and no campaign organisations should be properly established and appropriately funded by the government. Again, are you a government that believes in integrity and transparency, or are they just weasel words that fall nicely from your tongues? We cannot support a bill that does not have a plan for how to properly regulate donations, foreign interference, or that does not provide a plan for how the scrutiny of the referendum will be conducted. Again, this is a referendum to change the founding document of this nation, the Australian Constitution, and it is not something that anybody in this country should take lightly. And yet, with the bill that is presented to the Australian Senate, that is exactly what the Albanese government is doing. All of the issues that have been raised could have been resolved by the establishment of appropriately and equally funded official yes and no campaign organisations. This bill will determine the settings for how the referendum on an Indigenous voice to parliament is conducted. However, what the Albanese government, I would say almost deliberately, is failing to tell the Australian people is that they should be very, very aware that the changes included in this bill could also be used for future referenda. 
Whilst the bill makes a number of non-controversial changes to the Act to bring the operation of referenda in line with the Commonwealth Electoral Act, it also makes fundamental changes for how referenda themselves are conducted in Australia. We have made our position clear. We will support a bill that allows for a referendum with informed voters, because why wouldn't you want the Australian voter to be informed about what they are actually voting on, and a process with integrity based on precedent? We advocated for a pamphlet because without one, a dangerous precedent would have been set. This would have been the first time no pamphlet was provided to voters since before Farlap won the Melbourne Cup. When was that? The requirement a long time ago, Senator Scar, that is exactly right. The requirement for a pamphlet was actually implemented in 1912. There have been three referenda without an official pamphlet, 1919, 1926 and 1928. But let's look at the reasons as to why. In 1919, there was insufficient time to produce them. In 1926, there was no agreement on how to produce the yes argument. And in 1928, there was overwhelming agreement between parties and governments. Of these referenda, none of the circumstances apply. We know there's not complete agreement on this issue. We have time to produce a pamphlet, and we can get agreement on how to argue the cases. So the government has relented on this issue, but there is still more to be done to ensure the referendum is conducted with both integrity and transparency. An official yes and no campaign is required to increase the trust and integrity in the process. Having an official yes and no campaign will make things simpler for the regulatory environment and for the proper conduct of the referendum. The AEC has given evidence to parliamentary committees that the donation and disclosure regime remains the most complex part of the Electoral Act. We will be applying that regime in this referendum and to participants who are not regularly involved in elections. An official campaign structure is going to be the best way for our regulators to ensure appropriate education and enforcement of the electoral laws for the referendum. We know that there will also be a significant number of both participants and organisations in this referendum who will not be associated with political parties or who do not regularly participate in electoral events. Having a single point of coordination to provide education and to commence any audit processes for donations or foreign interference is the best way to ensure the integrity of the referendum. We have already heard from officials that there might be people who will fall under donations legislation and other electoral laws who do not even know it. The AEC has said that the education of participants will be significant, given that these events happen so rarely and that they aren't the usual political parties that they will be regulating. They have even acknowledged that political parties struggle to get it right every time. So why are we asking for equal funding? We are seeking an assurance that once these bodies are established, that there is a guarantee of equal funding to each side to ensure that neither side is advantaged and to ensure that they can comply with the disclosure and regulatory regimes at the referendum. Again, if you believed in integrity and transparency of this process, why do you bring a bill before the parliament that fails to address these issues? Why is foreign interference a concern? Well, the Director General of ASIO recently again told Australians that we are seeing the greatest level of foreign interference in Australia's history. This government does not seem to be concerned by the words and the warnings of the Director General of ASIO. Surely, though, we should look at simple practical steps that put structure around this process 
and help our regulators and our agencies manage the referendum. We know that there has been foreign interference in other countries. In Canada, their intelligence agencies have uncovered plots to interfere in their 2021 election in order to create a minority government. <laughs> that was actually foreign interference wanting a particular outcome of the Canadian election, a minority government. According to the CSIS documents published by The Globe and The Mail, Chinese officials in Canada said Beijing wanted a minority government so that the parties in parliament are fighting each other. That is foreign interference, and that is something that this government is not heeding the warnings from their Director General of ASIO with the bill that they have brought before this parliament. This is one of a list of foreign uh, influence campaigns that have been revealed publicly in Europe and elsewhere. And anyone who thinks that Australia is immune doesn't know what they're talking about. We know that we've had our own parties targeted with reports that three major parties have been the victims of state-sponsored hacking. On those grounds alone, we think it's good reason to have some formal structure about the referendum and at least a nominated official yes and no campaign. As I said when I commenced my comments, the conduct of a referendum to change the founding document of our nation, the Australian Constitution, is an important moment for all Australians. The Australians who will be required to vote in this referendum deserve every assistance possible to ensure that they are able to make an informed choice. We know from history that Australians do not vote for changes in the Constitution lightly. They take this duty seriously, and the government should take its duty to all Australians seriously. Providing all Australians with reliable information and protecting the integrity of this process needs to be at the forefront of this bill. We do not believe that this bill reaches the minimum standards that should be in place for such an important process. And on that basis, we are opposing the bill. Thank you, Senator Cash. I call Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak against the Referendum Machinery Amendment Bill 2022. This bill proposes to amend the machinery provisions of the Referendum Act 2021, and in doing so, threatens to undermine the way we do referendums and, by extension, undermines the Australian Constitution, the bedrock of the institution I stand in today. The Referendum Act sets out clear regulations on how donations to referendum campaigns are made, ensuring that the process is transparent and fair. However, Labor's proposed amendments to the, to the Act contained in this bill threaten to undermine these regulations, potentially allowing for foreign interference in our electoral processes. This is a crying shame. It is our duty to ensure that these processes remain free from outside influence and that the voices of all Australians are heard equally. While the bill does make some non-controversial changes to the Act, to bring it in line with the Commonwealth Electoral Act, there are still three key issues that remain. Firstly, the remo removal of the requirement to provide all households with a pamphlet outlining the yes and no case for changing the constitution is a significant concern. While the government has announced its intention to restore the pamphlet, we will reserve our position until a final amendment is presented. The provision of an official yes and no pamphlet has been a long-standing feature of referenda in Australia, with the requirement for a pamphlet being implemented, with the first requirement for a pamphlet being implemented in 1912. This is the first time there has been no official pamphlet provided to voters since before Farlap won the Melbourne Cup. 
I'm reminded by a great quote from the late Roger Scruton, good things are easily destroyed but not easily created. I would remind those opposite that perhaps there's a reason that we have had official pamphlets for more than 100 years, but perhaps because it's a good idea. The foundations of democracy are held strong by having a well-informed public and by attempting to create a lot less informed and possibly misinformed public debate is simply a low and deceiving act by those opposite who proclaim election platform, claimed an election platform of transparency, little of which we have seen since they were elected. Madam Acting Deputy President, when I first read the Attorney General Department's media release on this matter, I couldn't help but laugh. They say, the next referendum will be the first in the digital age. There is no longer any need for taxpayers to pay for a pamphlet to be sent to every household. The goal of a government that spends money like nobody's business and with one of the biggest taxing and spending agendas in our nation's history to all of a sudden become implementing a policy of austerity on our democracy, of all things, is laughable. Well, there have been three referenda without an official pamphlet, 1919, 26 and 28. None of the circumstances that applied in those cases apply to the current situation. In 1919, there was insufficient time to produce a pamphlet. Well, in 1926, there was no agreement on how to produce the yes argument. And in 1928, there was overwhelming agreement between parties and, gov and government. In contrast, there is not complete agreement on the issue of an Indigenous voice to parliament. But there is time to produce a pamphlet, and it is possible to get agreement on how to argue the cases. Furthermore, research has shown that people use official material when deciding how to vote. The Australian Electoral Commission has reported that when people provide, uh, are provided mailed material to voters during elections, 40 per cent of recipients will use this documentation as their main source of information in casting their vote. This suggests that an official pamphlet would be a very valuable resource for voters, particularly given the increasing influence of misinformation in electoral events. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission has reported that 92 per cent of respondents to their news surveys had some concern about the quality of news and journalism they were consuming. And that analysis has identified concern, concerning consumer and competition harms across a range of digital platform services that are widespread, entrenched and systemic. An official pamphlet would provide voters with a reliable and trustworthy source of information about the proposed changes to the Constitution and would help to counteract the influence of misinformation. Senator Van, uh, it being 1.30, I'm going to call on Senator's statements and you will be in continuation as the debate on this uh, bill resumes. Thank you. I call Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, look, I rise to just um, address some Key misinformation that is out and about, uh, as we all know, um, the voters of New South Wales go to the polls uh, at the end of the week. But this is uh, misinformation that was out loud and clear at the last federal election as well. And it is the claim that independents deliver. Well, let me be straight. Independents can promise. Independence can argue, independence can bang the table, but independence cannot deliver. It is governments who deliver. For example, uh, in uh, my electorate, we have an independent, formerly a shooter and fisher, but they are uh, jump ship. Um, they're claiming that they get on average 363, they deliver on average 363 million per year. That's not true. They don't deliver a cent of it. 
The Liberal and Nationals in government delivered, on average, $363 million per year to that electorate of Murray. That includes uh, funding the Griffith Hospital to a value of about $250 million, funding for the beautiful Roxy Theatre in Leeton, which I personally supported and put my uh, support behind, funding for the Deniliquin Town Hall redevelopment that I was very proud to attend the opening of just a few weeks ago uh, as the local senator who, again, threw their support behind it. It is governments that deliver, not independents. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davies. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Respect and acceptance have long been core components of Australian culture, regardless of an individual's sexual orientation, gender identity or intersex status. Recent events in my home state of Victoria have made it evident that shamefully not everyone subscribes to our shared Australian values, and some only seek to disgracefully promote hate, bigotry and division, including some people in this place. I am proud to be part of a Labor government committed to celebrating diversity. Since coming to government, we have made considerable measures to improve protections for trans and gender diverse people in all parts of life, because every Australian deserves dignity and respect. Last year, the Albanese Labor government moved to ensure trans, gender diverse and intersex workers are protected from discrimination under the Fair Work Act and promote equality of access to the same protections as any other worker who, ex who experiences workplace discrimination. And we're sticking to our election commitment to platform the voices of LGBTIQA plus Australians in the next census. We also know LGBTIQA plus Australians have poorer physical and mental health outcomes and face more barriers when accessing the healthcare system. Stigma, discrimination and at times violence exacerbates existing hurdles and make it that much harder for trans and gender diverse people to receive the health care they need and deserve. Earlier this month at World Pride, the Albanese Labor government unveiled a new national action plan and $26 million investment towards health equality, Australia's biggest ever investment in LGBTIQA plus health. As part of this momentous announcement, our government will establish an LGBTIQ plus advisory group and ensure LGBTIQ plus Australians are listened to and included in the development of the National Action Plan. This government is committed to celebrating difference for all members of our community. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to uh, speak on the catastrophe that is unfolding on out in outback Western uh, New South Wales right now the western part of that state, the environmental catastrophe on the Darling Barker, the mass fish kill that unfolded over the last few days has just brought again uh, to the nation's attention the sheer crisis that our Murray-Darling Basin is in. Whether it is in flood or in drought, this river system is being managed badly. Over and over again, we have seen the warning signs from scientists and experts that unless we start managing this river system with the key objective of keeping it alive, nature is going to continue to try and fight back. And that is what is happening. This river is struggling. The fish are dying and the community in Meningi in particular are suffering. And of course, this mass fish kill is only a few years after the last one, where we were told this would not happen again, where we were told that the management of the river system would be improved. Today's fish kill is 10 times worse than that that happened in 2019. 10 times worse. And what has occurred with the, nine, with the $70 million that was promised? Where has that gone? Why hasn't the previous government and the government in New South Wales implemented the recommendations from the last report? Last time, millions of fish died on the Darling Barker. And these, of course, are native fish, some of them endangered, the Murray cod, already struggling to survive. It is time so for the Environment Minister has to expired. pick up. Senator McGrath. 
Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Coalition welcomes the announcement of the next steps in the AUKUS partnership. Put simply, the US is good, the UK is good, AUKUS is good, nuclear submarines are good. And this is building on the work of the Coalition in our last term of government, because the acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines is a step in the right direction at a time when we face an unprecedented threat from foreign actors who do not have our interests at heart. But, Acting Deputy President, that, that does not seem to be enough for some members of, of the Labor Party. Last week, Australians turned on their, on their news and witnessed something truly horrifying. We witnessed a former cranky Labor Prime Minister crawl out of his hole, try to prop himself up on his soapbox and proceed to bite and bore the nation. And I'm not talking about Kevin Rudd. I'm talking about Paul Keating. Now, do we remember Paul Keating? Paul Keating, the Placido Domingo of Australian politics, but he was a bit more Paris Hilton, you know, more lip, less, less relevance. Paul Keating, who sent hundreds of thousands of Australians broke through the recession that we had to have. Paul Keating, who went to an election promising LAW law tax cuts. This guy had the cheek to get up and give gratuitous advice. Shame on Paul Keating. The former Prime Minister tried to tell the Australian people that Communist China does not pose a threat to our nation. It's almost like he was still in 1990, maybe 1986. Acting Deputy President, his comments are so ridiculous and so out of touch, you almost feel sorry for him, but I don't because I remember what he did to this country. I remember the people he sent broke through that recession we had to have. Paul Keating, get back in your box and close the lid. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Ayres. Well, I, um, I rise today just to point out to the chamber the details of a sleazy preference deal that's been reached uh, in New South Wales between the Liberals uh, and the Greens. Uh, and the deal that has been kept secret from voters to date is a complete betrayal uh, of those who claim to be representing the conservative side of politics and those who claim to be representing a progressive component of the Australian electorate. What is the deal? The deal, unprecedented, is that the Greens are preferencing the Nationals last, preferencing the Nationals last in the one Liberal national contest that there is in uh, Port Macquarie. So they are putting uh, all of the other parties, including, including the extremist anti-vax party, ahead of the nationals who they are putting last. And in return, what is the Greens, New South Wales Greens political party getting? They are getting Dom Perrottet, Mr Perrottet and Mr Dutton's party, the Liberals, they are getting their preferences in Balmain and Newtown and Summer Hill. This is a sleazy political arrangement, unprecedented, that has been kept secret from voters in Balmain and Newtown and Summer Hill and in Port Macquarie. It deserves to be exposed and voters ought to repudiate the New South Wales Greens political party and the Liberals doing sleazy deals and who knows what else Besides the New South Wales Nationals, what other concessions have been made by uh, Mr Perrottet and Mr Dutton in order to secure New South Wales Greens' preferences uh, to support their preferred candidate Senator in Port Senator your Macquarie. time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many amazing people who make up our one Queensland community, I note that in the last few weeks we have seen with the failure of Silvergate and Silicon Valley banks what is in aggregate the largest banking collapse in US history. Australia is not America and it is not Europe. If everyone keeps their heads, we will be fine. Our big four banks are bastards, yet they are well capitalised. Nonetheless, it would be wrong to not take this opportunity to revisit the issue of how to save a failing bank. As a reminder, there are two choices bailing out with a large injection of taxpayer money, increasing debt for everyone. Or two, bailing in, which is where the bank takes their depositors' money to save themselves. A bail-in still requires the bank to close for days or weeks, preventing customers accessing any money left in their accounts. 
Business will be left without, pay, without money to pay staff or suppliers. The effect on the economy will be catastrophic. Everyday Australians trying to pay for their shopping will find their account empty or card suspended. Travellers may be stranded. One Nation introduced a bill to prevent bank bail-ins and protect the people. Labor and the Liberal Nationals defeated our bill in 2020. One Nation did lead a successful campaign against the cash ban bill that the Liberal Nationals and Labor proposed in 2021, so Australians can still use cash in an emergency. This is relevant, again, because President Biden initially chose to seize half of Silicon Valley Bank depositors' funds and freeze the rest for up to three years. That's a bail-in. What followed was a run on all banks, forcing the President to backflip and instead initiate a bailout. Australia has a bank guarantee scheme, a bailout, but it's a con trick. There's no funding, no requirement to use it. It only covers $20 billion per bank, $80 billion total, and this is supposed to protect $1 trillion in depositors' funds. 8%. I call on the government to categorically rule out a bail-in and properly fund the bank guarantee scheme. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. At the end of last year, I had the great ple pleasure of visiting the Royal Australian Air Force Association, known as RAFA, in Bull Creek. RAFA are a fantastic organisation that offer retirement living and community to senior Australians. They have seven retirement villages comprising over 1,500 units in Western Australia. On site at Rafa Bull Creek is the Aviation Heritage Museum, comprising of a collection of aircraft, including a World War II Lancaster bomber, a British Tornado fighter jet, which is very impressive, and they've recently, uh, and recently a retired F-8 Hornet uh, will be received later this year. So if you live in Perth or are holidaying, I, I strongly encourage you to take the time to go and visit uh, this first-class museum. Uh, Rafa briefed me on their Veterans Homeless Project in Cannington, the Andrew Russell's Veterans Living Centre. Uh, Rafa have already purchased a parcel of land and drafted designs for a 27-unit facility. This project will provide emergency housing for veterans and ex-Defence Force personnel in desperate need of a roof over their heads and also offer affordable housing for those needing a more stable and long-term living solution. Once completed, this facility will bring veterans and ex-Defence Force personnel to, uh, to offer them a chance for a fresh start and a new opportunity to get their life back on track. So RAFA are looking for financial support from the federal government and I look forward to working with them uh, to support this critical project. I encourage the government to take a look at it and see how they could offer that support that they need. Uh, this is a critical project to help our former servicemen uh, and women who are doing it tough and have unfortunately fallen on hard times. Thank you. Uh, Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last week's AUKUS announcement marked a transformational moment for our nation, our defence force and our economy. The significance of this announcement to my home state of South Australia cannot be underestimated. South Australia holds manufacturing in its heart, but for far too long all those workers at Osborne and at every small and medium-sized enterprise engaging with this work has been in limbo. There was the uncertainty under the previous government around the future of full-cycle docking work promises of jobs that were never realised, Christmas after Christmas of uncertainty. But with this announcement, the future looks much more secure. The announcement of AUKUS is a watershed moment. It represents the single largest investment in Australia's defence capability in our history. And the heart of this program is in South Australia. The decision to build the future Australian fleet of submarines at Osborne presents the biggest economic opportunity for our state since the end of the Second World War. The enormous educational, employment and infrastructure investment required to prepare South Australia for this build will be transformational for my state. It will provide thousands of workers in South Australia with great jobs, with secure jobs. And this investment will flow onto the hundreds of small and medium-sized enterprises involved in the supply chain in each part of the development. AUKUS presents South Australia with an opportunity to restore its great place at the centre of Australian manufacturing where it belongs. It will transform the future of opportunity for the next generation of South Australians, and I welcome it today. Thank you. 
Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. A report released today by the Queensland Council of Social Services confirms what anyone who's been paying attention already knows. Queensland is in a housing and homelessness crisis. The report found that homelessness in Queensland has increased by 22 per cent in the past five years. This is almost triple the increase seen across the rest of the country. In regional Queensland, the housing crisis is even more stark, with homelessness increasing by 29 per cent in four years. These shameful and skyrocketing homelessness rates align with the astronomical rent increases that we're seeing in every city and every state. Over the past 12 months, rents have increased by 21.5 per cent nationally, and it's 24 per cent in Brisbane. With no affordable rentals, people are being forced to couch surf, families are living in their tents or living out of their cars. The crisis is felt even more acutely by women and children experiencing family and domestic violence and by older renters. Women are being forced to choose between abuse or homelessness because there's simply nowhere to go. Within 20 years, QCOS predicts that more than 220,000 households in Queensland will be without social housing. The only way to fix it is to start building. We need in Queensland 11,000 affordable and social homes each year for the next 20 years. But Labor's plan to build 6,000 public homes a year nationally for five years won't even match the current uh, increase in Queensland, let alone tackle the crisis around the country. Direct investment in housing is what responsible governments do to address a housing crisis. But Labor's plan is not a massive investment in social and affordable housing like we do need. It's an investment in the stock market in the hope that the market will deliver funding and housing. Funding for crisis accommodation, short-term and long-term affordable housing will benefit all Australians. We must prioritise giving every single person in this country a roof over their heads instead of tax cuts for the rich and nuclear submarines. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Babette. Thank you. Labor and the Greens coalition and the Teal independents are pushing a clean, green, renewable energy fantasy that is going to bankrupt this nation. They will never be able to achieve their renewable goals of a rechargeable, battery-powered economy, but what they are powering is child slavery. That's because billions of lithium-ion batteries required to store renewable energy cannot function without cobalt. The insatiable demand for cobalt has been a bonanza for China, which owns and controls most of the world's cobalt mines. Many are located in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, unfortunately, in the rush to extract as much cobalt as possible, children are being sent into dark, dangerous mines that make the work conditions of Oliver Twist look like a Swiss finishing school. Now, these kids, they work in subhuman conditions with pickaxes and shovels to scrounge out cobalt for a few bucks per day. The air is laden with toxic soot. The water is contaminated with toxic sludge, and the forests have been destroyed, all to feed the green energy delusions of wealthy Westerners. Now, Australia is one of the few countries that produces cobalt while respecting human rights, but we send it to China to be processed. We must stop doing this. Sure, they may do it cheaper, but that's only because they exploit their workers, they pollute the environment, and they have access to cheap power, which we do not. It is time that the government stops the hypocrisy and puts human rights and environmental protection ahead of cheap batteries. And it is time that we process our cobalt right here in Australia. Thank you, Senator Antic. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. On Saturday, a rally designed to let William, uh, women speak was held in uh, in Melbourne, at which uh, women's rights advocates and MPs like Victorian MP Moira Deeming spoke. The movement is rightfully concerned about biological men undermining the integrity of women's sports and spaces such as bathrooms. They're absolutely correct to be concerned. I am too. The rally was gatecrashed by a group of apparent neo-Nazis, and like most Australians, I unreservedly condemn those views. But one wonders how it's possible that Victoria Police managed to hold back the trans activists but were not able to do the same with the apparent neo-Nazis. It's all very odd. Perhaps that's a question that uh, Premier Daniel Andrews could answer. The invaders were condemned by the rally organisers, who had nothing to do with the arrival of these gatecrashers. Maura Deeming MP also had nothing to do with these people and condemned them herself. 
It is a shameful reflection on the lazy partisan media in our political classes that Ms Deeming would be vilified for something over which she had absolutely no control. How is this different from a member of the Australian Labor Party or the Australian Greens attending a rally for Palestine, which is descended upon by anti-Semitic or union thugs? The answer to that is it is no different at all. The only thing that is different here is that the media and the political class cannot find the requisite spine to stand for a principle. Is this the low watermark of our free speech in our democracy, be now de de defined by those who gatecrash an event? Those who have once again danced to the beat of the drum created by the left of politics and their allies in the censorship industrial complex, that is the mainstream media, should hang their heads in shame. Moira did nothing wrong. Thank you. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Earlier this month, we celebrated International Women's Day. And uh, as part of the Albanese Labor government, I'm so proud that we have the first majority woman female government in this country's history. We've delivered significant improvements in areas such as affordable childcare, paid parental leave, paid domestic violence leave, and these things are all going to improve the well-being of women. However, the Status of Women report card released earlier this month shows us that in many, many areas, women are still experiencing inequality. We are committed to changing this. And I want to take some time today to commend those groups, the grassroots community groups and organisations out there that are promoting gender equality, particularly to young women and girls. The group that I've spoken about previously in this chamber um, Girls with Attitude 100 per cent, which is run out of Para Hills School in Adelaide. It was set up in 2019 and it has taken a group of young girls each year and worked with them around what they can do in the school to actually change the environment that they are growing up in and they are learning in. And I was delighted to be out there last week when we saw the program be expanded to Ingle Farm Primary School, which is one of the neighbouring schools, and the two sets of girls got together for a session last week. And as I say, I was delighted to be there. I want to shout out to both of those schools, Para Hills and Ingle Farm, for the work they've done in promoting these young girls, for the work they've done in promoting gender equality. Well done. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Senator Thorpe. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak about the genocide that this country is guilty of over the last 200 years. Also, the fact that in 2023 this country continues to commit genocide. The Labor government allows genocide to continue in this country. Uh, given that we still have 22,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children that have been stolen out of their homes uh, and put with other communities, which, uh, as defined in the United Nations definition on genocide, uh, the Labor government continues, the Liberal government and the National Party's regime on continuation of genocide against First Nations people in this country. We see the Labor governments around this country uh, perpetrating violence, particularly against our young people, particularly in Queensland, locking young people up against their free will, uh, having young people who are uh, put into adult prisons, having young people who have uh, low-grade offences, or no offences at all, who are still being locked up, um, is an absolute disgusting, shameful act that all of you should be appalled by. But unfortunately, it's just another eye roll because you won't act and you won't stop the continued genocide that the lucky country called Oz continues to commit. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Senator Reynolds. Celebrate not 
In Western Australia, we are at the halfway mark of the McGowan government's second term, and there is no cause for celebration. West Australians have got buyer's remorse after having re-elected Premier McGowan and his Labor team just over two years ago. A few points demonstrate why Labor's Mark McGowan is being marked down by West Australians. Whether it's homelessness, a crisis in the construction industry or escalating law and order, WA families are feeling the pain of WA Labor. With the average rent at record highs and vacancies at all-time lows, many West Australians are now urgently seeking social housing with almost 34,000 people on the social housing waitlist, including 9,000 on the priority waitlist. The latest figures indicate there are now at least 300 fewer public housing properties in WA than there were in 2017, and 1,857 of them were sitting vacant in January. And the Labor government's flagship homelessness project, East Perth Ground, which was to consist of 100 units, is nowhere to be seen. After three years, all that vulnerable people have is the opportunity to look at an empty lot. That's despite there being more than 100 people experiencing homelessness dying last year. And for those lucky enough to be able to buy a home, WA Labor is keeping them waiting. WA's building industry is in crisis under Labor's watch. Over 100 building companies have gone bust in the past year alone, challenges exacerbated by Labor's lack of a plan to deal with labour shortages and supply chain issues. The lengthy construction build times putting increasing pressure on WA families when they can least afford it. It's true. The Premier did act and made the matter worse. It's time for WA Labor to lift its Thank game. You, Senator Smith. Senator Polly. It's been a great morning here at Parliament House. This morning I launched the Parliamentary Friends of Nutrition and we heard from a very passionate advocate and we heard from uh, Dietitians Australia, including the guest speaker, Laureate Professor Claire Collins, AO. The Albanese Labor government and the opposition understand the importance of preventative health and what part nutrition and healthy lifestyles plays in people's lives for this national strategy. As a society, we can do more, from our kids to, to those older people living in aged care residential homes, to our Aboriginal health and within the Indigenous communities. Good nutrition might just save your life. And so I welcome conversations and discourse around this issue as we celebrate Dietitians Week 2023. This new group, the Dietitians Australia and this friendship group will lead a discussion about the importance of nutrition and how we can create a healthier society. It will also play an important role in trying to agitate for reform and the creation of a national nutrition policy. I acknowledge the CEO of Dietitians Australia, Robert Hunt, and the advocacy and policy manager at Dementia Australia, Natalie Stapleton, for helping with the event today. I also thank the Board of Dietitians Australia for coming to the event and making a healthy Australia priority for the national discourse. To think each year that 27,500 Australians die from preventable diet-related disease, we all know the health impact on the major causes of heart attack, obesity, child's obesity, all can be resolved Thank if you, we Senator invest Polly, in better nutrition. Thank you, Senator Polly. has now expired. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, um, Madam President. Uh, I seek leave to make a statement concerning ministerial uh, arrangements. Leave is granted. Yes, Minister Farrell. No, there hasn't, hasn't been a coup. Uh, I advise changes to. <clears throat> I know. I know you missed me all last week. I heard. Uh, I heard the demand. <laughs> Politics is full of surprises, let me tell you. And I've, I've had more than them. Sorry, I better get going. I advise changes, I advise changes to ministerial arrangements. Uh, Senator Wong, unfortunately, will be absent uh, from the Senate this week for personal reasons. In the absence, I am acting leader of the government in the Senate. In, in uh, thank you, Senator Wong. <laughs> 
In, <laughs> in Senator Wong's absence, ministers will represent portfolios at question time in accordance with the letter circulated to the pre president and party leaders and independent senators. Thank you, Senator Farrell. We'll move to question time, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Minister, prior to the election, the Prime Minister Albanese said this. He said, if I ever do make a mistake, I'll put my hand up, I'll own it, I'll take responsibility and I'll set about fixing it. <laughs> Mr Albanese, un <laughs> without Senator question, is. promised that Australian power bills will be coming down. The Labor Party promised, not just once, but 97 times before the election, that Australians were going to see a reduction of $275 in their power bills. Minister, why won't Mr Albanese own up to his mistake, take responsibility for the broken promise and set about fixing it by delivering to Australians the $275 reduction they were promised they would receive? Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Uh, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam President, and thank uh, Senator Reynolds for her, um, her question. Um, <coughs> Look, I, um, I think uh, we've discovered in uh, Prime Minister um, Albanese one of Australia's great prime ministers. Um, uh, I'm, I'm smiling. I'm smiling. I'm, I'm smiling, Senator Henderson. I'm smiling. I'm so, smiling, Senator Henderson, because I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Um, not just for. Um, no, I'm, I'm so happy. I'm so, happy, I'm, so, I'm so happy that Australia has finally got a really decent Prime Minister. Uh, somebody, somebody, somebody who really genuinely understands uh, the issues facing um, Australian consumers. And of course, higher electricity prices is, is one of them. And what, what, what was one of the first things that the new Prime Minister did on taking office. He inherited, he inherited this mess. He inherited this 10 years of neglect. He inherited 10 years of neglect on the part of the former government. And what did he seek to do? Well, he, he sought to put downward pressure on electricity prices. He, he saw, he saw, he saw, he saw as quickly as he could, he, he, he saw as quickly as he could what your 10 years of neglect had done to electricity prices. And so what did he do? He, he introduced a cap. He introduced a cap on gas prices and coal prices to push that pressure down. Now, he can't, he couldn't fix, he can't fix every single problem that you've created. Uh, thank I've... you, Minister. Your time has expired. Oh, Senator Reynolds, first supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, um, President. Um, I'm sure we're all very happy that you're happy, but I don't think the Australians are very happy at the uh, broken promises. So my supplementary question is this. The Prime Minister also promised the Australian people on 2 May 2022 that the Labor Party had no intention to make any changes to superannuation, but we now know that one in ten Australians will be affected by the change they announced. Minister, when will you announce that the government has broken its promise in relation to superannuation? Uh, Minister Farrell. Thank you. Um Thank you, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator um, uh, Reynolds for her supplementary question. It doesn't appear to have been a supplementary question about about electricity. No, I'm, simp I'm simply saying I don't. Let Order me finish. On my left. Uh, I mean, you've missed Order me. You missed left. me all of last week. Here I am, here to answer your questions, and you won't let me answer those questions. Now. Now, now, I'm sorry. Am I Order on okay. my left and my right, Minister Farrell. Please continue. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, protection, uh, President. Um, now, um, we've uh, we've made very clear what our position on superannuation is, 
Um, the figure that you mentioned, uh, Senator Reynolds, is a figure way into the uh, into the future. The reality is no, that no, the no, only no. people, the only Thank people. Thank you, Minister. Your time for answering has expired. Senator Reynolds, second supplementary. We well, two out of two questions not answered on uh, broken promises, and no wonder. My second supplementary question to the minister is that the Prime Minister also promised to lower the cost of PBS medicines. But guess what? Another broken promise. But the government has removed, for example, life-changing drugs from the PBS, one of which is now being relied on by 15,000 Australians who suffer from type 1 diabetes. Now, despite the minister doing an embarrassing backflip, uh, on Friday, now listing it until October. Uh, thank you, what Senator shame. Your time has expired. Minister Farrell. Well done. Great job. Order. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, you, um, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, um, thank you um, uh, Senator uh, Reynolds, um, for, for your question. Um, uh, well, I'm also a diabetic, and uh, I uh, very much appreciate uh, the, um, the way in which the uh, PBS assists uh, me with my, uh, my particular products that, uh, that uh, I am required to, uh, to use. Um, uh, uh, Minister we have Farrell, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Reynolds. Thank you. A question of relevance. This was about what the minister was going to do for yet another broken promise on the uh, PBS, thank you, Senator Reynolds. and it's not about thank his own you, personal Senator medical Reynolds. situation. Senator Reynolds, there was so much preamble to that question, that your supplementary, that there wasn't actually a question, it was a statement. Um, and believe that the, uh, I've, is this a secondary point of order? Respect. Uh, while yes, it is a sad story of a broken uh, promise, Senator it was Reynolds, not about what is Senator the point Farrell's of order? health. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. And uh, the particular drug I think you've mentioned is it uh, fiasp? Fiasp. Yeah. Okay. It's a fast-acting insulin drug for, uh, for diabetes. Um, Minister Butler, as uh, office was made aware, on the 22nd of February in 2023 of uh, Novo Nordisk's intention to... Uh, please, you've asked a question. I'm directly answering the question, and then you're talking the whole way uh, through the you, answer. Thank you, Minister. The time for I don't get a chance to answer the Senator Ciccone. Uh, Senator Ciccone, I've called you. Thank you very much, President. Sorry of all that ruckus. I didn't actually hear you, you calling me, but thank you very much. But given that uh, Senator Farrell is doing a fine job, my question is also to Senator Farrell, uh, as the acting leader of the government here in the Senate and representing the Foreign Affairs Minister. Senator Farrell, how will the AUKUS submarine acquisition make Australia and our region a much safer and stronger part in this part of the world? Senator Farrell, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, thank you, President, and I thank uh, Senator Ciccone for his question. I know he has a, a deep interest in uh, Australian uh, security uh, matters. Um, the AUKUS uh, optimal pathway announced last week is an unprecedented investment in our national power. The acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines will be uh, the single greatest defence capability acquisition in our history. I'll repeat that. It's the single greatest um, uh, defence um, investment in our history. Our nuclear-powered submarines uh, will be an Australian sovereign capable, uh, commanded by uh, the Royal Australian Navy and sustained by Australian shipyards. Uh, senators uh, have heard uh, members of the government speak of how our region is at the centre of a world that is uh, being reshaped, of how we face our most challenging circumstances uh, since uh, the uh, Second World War. AUKUS is one element of uh, Australia's approach to addressing this strategic environment and contributing to strategic balance in our region. I hope senators uh, would agree that uh, Australia has a responsibility to contribute to a regional balance in capability that helps underpin uh, regional stability. We want to ensure that no state will ever conclude the benefits of conflict outweigh the risks. And so nuclear-powered submarines are part of our contribution to this aim by transforming our ability to deter or respond to any future threats. 
As part of our uh, contribution to uh, the regional balance, these submarines add to a collective security in a region where no country dominates and no country is dominated. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Yeah. Uh, Minister, uh, Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you very much, President. And, uh, with my uh, first supplementary, um, I do ask Senator Farrell, how will the AUKUS submarine acquisition contribute to the Australian economy? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And uh, once again, thank uh, Senator Ciccone for his uh, question. Order. The scale, Order. the scale partnership. Order. The scale partnership. Order. The scale partnership and commitment of this deal are unmatched. Governments, businesses, and communities in all three countries are invested in this being a success for generations to come. AUKUS will create around. Uh, 20,000 direct jobs over the next uh, 30 years. My state, in particular South Australia, will be the home of the Australian nuclear-powered submarine construction. Labor has always stood up for South Australian shipbuilders, and now we're delivering with an historic investment. Up to 4,000 workers will design and build the infrastructure for the submarine construction yard at Osborne. A further 4,000 to 5,500 direct jobs are expected to build nuclear-powered submarines in South Australia when the program reaches you, its peak. The time for answering has expired. Senator Giacconi, second supplementary. Thank you very much, President, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Minister, um, how will the Australia maintain its world-class non-proliferation credentials under the AUKUS submarine acquisition? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam President, and once again thank uh, Senator Ciccone for his question. Uh, Labor has a proud history of non-proliferation and disarmament advocacy, and we uh, are resolutely committed to the Treaty of uh, Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. We are working openly and transparently with the International Atomic Energy Agency to, to develop a robust non-proliferation -prol approach to underpin our program. And let me be clear, Australia will never seek to acquire nuclear weapons. Our AUKUS partners recognise Australia's obligations under international law, including the Treaty of uh, Rarotonga. And naval nuclear propulsion is consistent with those obligations. Finally, I note that the uh, United States Defence uh, Secretary Austin has confirmed submarines visiting Australia on rotation will be conventionally armed. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Is Mike Hurst, former CEO of Bendigo Bank, correct when he said recently that taxing unrealised gains is going to provide cash flow problems for people who might not be earning a lot of income but have assets? Can you guarantee that no farmer will have to sell any part of their farm to pay their superannuation tax bill? Minister Farrell. <coughs> Thank you, uh, President, and um, uh, thank you, um, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Colbeck, for his uh, his question. And um, I didn't get the opportunity in the previous uh, question to sort of uh, point out uh, just um, how small the impact of our super changes is going to be. And I think it's worth it's worth um, repeating uh, that. Um, 99.5% uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, superannuation uh, recipients uh, are not going to be the subject of this, uh, of this change. Um, but in terms of the issue that you've just raised, in terms of unrealised gains, uh, the simplest and uh, least uh, cost approach is to apply the tax on the growth of an individual's balance over the year. This approach, recommended by Treasury, included assessing unrealised capital gains. Uh, this approach uh, strikes, we believe, the right balance between uh, simplicity and ensuring uh, that the tax uh, can be applied across the, uh, the systems. Uh, trustees already calculate the value of their fund each year and submit that to the tax office, uh, which will enable the ATO uh, to um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thanks, President. Um, 
on relevance. It would be nice if uh, the minister did at least use the word farmer, because the question was about whether a farmer might have to sell part of their uh, farm. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Um, the minister is being relevant to the question. Minister Farrell, please continue. President, um, well, in terms of um, the question of whether farmers uh, need to liquidate the family farm in, uh, say, a uh, SMS uh, um, <coughs> fund to pay the tax liability, under our superannuation law, funds should have some liquid assets to meet any additional tax liabilities and uh, to meet their running costs. Uh, this is no different. There are a range of uh, well, I do have some. I do have some idea about how to run a small business, uh, <coughs> Senator thank McGrath. You, I Farrell. do have some ex uh, practical you, experience Order. in that matter. Order. Yeah. The time for answering has expired. Senator Colbeck, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Under Labor's new super, super tax, if a farmer with a self-managed super fund sees the paper value, if, if, if a farmer with a self-managed super fund sees the paper value of her farm self-managed super fund fluctuate above and below the three million dollar threshold across a number of years, will those gains be subject to the 30 per cent tax rate each time? Thank you, I said it a feral minister. Farrell. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. Well, um, um, in terms of um, answering uh, that question and the previous question, of course, there are a range of uh, cash flow requirements uh, within uh, an SMF, uh, not uh, just uh, tax liabilities, which uh, trustees uh, are required to consider. This includes uh, examples, accounting and administration costs, investment fees and costs associated with maintaining real assets such as property. Now, I think in terms of putting your question into um, some perspective, uh, Senator um, Colbeck, I think it's, I think it's uh, worth pointing out that only 0.2 per uh, cent of um, SMSFs have 100 per cent um, of their Minister assets. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, President. Question on uh, point of order, I should say, on direct relevance. The question asked by Senator Colbeck in this case went particularly to the impact of thresholds and those funds operating at or close to the threshold, potentially moving up and down uh, above and below that threshold. Uh, Senator Farrell has had 49 seconds. Oh. He's only got 11 seconds left. He hasn't Thank come you. close to the issue of the Senator, threshold. Senator Birmingham, the question was about um, self-managed funds, um, but I will remind uh, Senator Farrell of the entirety of the question. Minister. Thank you, Thank you uh, President. Well, look, um, I'm, I was trying um, to put the issue in some perspective, and particularly so as to not frighten, frighten those farmers Thank who you, do Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Colbeck, second supplementary. Thank you, President. How, how will you ensure that farmers, small business owners and other self-funded retirees are not subject to double taxation under your new super tax? Uh, Minister Farrell. Um, Thank you, uh, Madam President. Well, the point I was trying to make before is that um, obviously the opposition think there's some political advantage in running a scare campaign. Um, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Um, the minister has clearly used the entire time um, not Senator to answer Rustin, the question. Could Senator you direct Rustin, him to answering Senator the question? Senator Rustin, if you're calling a point of order on relevance, it is on the question before the chair, and that is the second supplementary. The minister's got to his feet. Um, I will listen closely, and if he's not relevant, I will remind him uh, of the question. Minister. The, with due res thank you, uh, President. Um, but with due respect to um, Senator uh, Rustin, um, just because you don't like the way in which, just, just, in, just because you don't like the way I answer the question, doesn't mean. Uh, that um, what I'm saying is not relevant for the question. And um, on, this, on, this, on this very point, the point I'm trying to make is a simple one. There is no point trying to scare uh, farmers or other small business people with a scare, with a scare campaign that Order. bears no relevance to the facts. It bears no relevance um, to the Minister facts. Minister Farrell, 
Um, thank you. Senator Birmingham. Direct relevance again, President. Uh, this minister is seeking to speak constantly in generalisations mm -hmm. when a specific question has been asked. If he's worried about putting people's uh, minds at ease, you. perhaps he should be able to answer thank the specific you. questions to put their minds at ease. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Yeah. Uh, minister Farrell, order. Minister Farrell, I will remind you of the question and, and the need to be relevant. Thank you. Just, just on the question of double taxation, of course, um, one of the things to note about this new change is that it doesn't come into effect for Thank a couple you, of Minister, years, the and there's plenty of time to consult. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, President. My question is directed to the Honourable Don Farrell in his capacity representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Minister for Defence. Since becoming Foreign Minister, Senator Wong has repeatedly stated that re-engaging with China on a diplomatic level is the first step to stabilising the two countries' relationship. China last week responded to the announcement about the $368 billion nuclear-powered submarine deal, saying the US, UK and Australia are completely disregarding the concerns of the international community and, quote, walking further and further down the path of error and danger. Isn't it true that whatever efforts your government was making to repair relations with China through diplomatic means, they have now been fundamentally sabotaged by this hawkish push from defence and the US and UK arms industries? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and I uh, thank uh, Senator uh, Shoebridge for his, uh, his question. Um, uh, look, I don't agree with your um, assertion there, uh, Senator, and um, I'll make a couple of points. Um, and I made this point uh, uh, on Sky TV yesterday. Uh, I think, uh, I think, I think, uh, I think uh, Senator uh, Wong is uh, shaping up to be one of the finest foreign ministers that we've had uh, in this country, uh, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, and uh, I think all of the things that she's done, not just in the Pacific, not just uh, maybe provocative, but I think it's true. And uh, most of my colleagues here would uh, Order. see them nodding. Order. Uh, she, Order. Um, she's. Uh, not only what she's been doing in the uh, Pacific, in the, uh, in the Asian region, but what she has been doing uh, in, in terms of China. I mean, I might remind you that two days before Christmas, when most of us would have been spending our time uh, with our, our families preparing for uh, Christmas Day, uh, Senator Wong uh, flew up, to, flew up to, uh, to China to meet again with her equivalent. And that that meeting, that, meeting, that meeting was the precursor to a meeting that I had a couple of weeks ago with my equivalent to try and stabilise and uh, normalise the relationship with, uh, with China. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing that I've bridge. heard, there's nothing of, I've heard uh, that would suggest anything other than this process of stabilisation is well on its way. Uh, well on its way. I mean, you may read everything in uh, the Chinese newspapers, but uh, I hear, I hear, uh, and believe all of those things. Um, well, no, I don't uh, live on a thank rock. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Shoebridge, first supplementary. A, a senior Indona Indonesian official says the country's sea lanes should not be used by Australian nuclear-propelled submarines because, quote, AUKUS was created for fighting. Similar concerns have been expressed by Malaysia. Given the negative response from our regional neighbours to the AUKUS submarine deal, can you now acknowledge that it marks the official demotion of Australian diplomacy and the bypassing of Senator Wong's office for an international posture driven by defence hawks and the US and UK arms industries? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Um, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, well, I, I, again, I completely reject uh, the assertion uh, and the underlying assumptions in your uh, or quest, your question. Um, I, saw, I, saw, I saw Senator uh, Wong uh, just about every day last week um, out there explaining to the Australian people uh, what the AUKUS arrangements means for um, not only her own state, of course, which is a very significant development, but for the country uh, and, the, uh, and the region. And I would have said that um, uh, on balance, the um, response, for instance, of the Indonesians, which you've referred to, was a very uh, balanced response to what was a sensible decision in our national interest. Um, we have to, 
the most, uh, the most important job of any federal government is to ensure the safety and the security of its, peop uh, of its people. Thank you, and Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Shoebridge, sec oh, order. Order. Senator Shoebridge, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Really Thank, you, Pete. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Pete. Today marks 20 years since the invasion of Iraq. Mm. Minister, do you accept that the 368 plus billion dollar orca submarine deal and its handcuffing of our largest military program ever to the United States military and their future war making shows we've learnt nothing from the disaster of Iraq. Nothing. Good Thank point. you, Senator Shebridge. Minister Farrell. Um, look again, I, uh, I reject the uh, I reject completely the, the suggested link between Orcus and uh, and the events in uh, Iraq. I think I'd, 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 point out, I'd point out that had we had, had, we had a Labor Wish government, Wilson. had we had a Labor government in office at the time that the decisions were made in respect to Iraq, Australia, Australia would not have joined. Senator Farrell, uh, that... could you resume your seat, please? Sorry, uh, Senator Shoebridge, I've called you at least three times. You've asked your question. Now allow the minister to respond. Minister, please continue. <coughs> Thank you, um, President. Um, my point is simply this, that there, there is no link between AUKUS and uh, what happened in Iraq. And had a Labor government been in office, had a Labor government, had a late, well, the Labor Party under Simon Crean, the Labor Party Minister under Simon Farrell, Crean. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. And again, Senator Wish Wilson, I've called you on numerous occasions. The question's been asked. Allow the minister to answer. Minister Farrell, please continue. They ask the questions, uh, President, and then they don't like the answers. But um, the truth, the truth of what happened under the Iraq. Thank you, Minister. Award. Your time has expired. Senator Marielle Smith. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, last week the Albanese government announced the details of the optimal pathway for the AUKUS Pact between Australia, the United States and the United Kingdom. Can the minister outline to the Senate how this agreement will create Australian jobs? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Smith for the question. Uh, this was a really historic announcement and a unique opportunity for jobs and skills right here in Australia. It will create an entirely new workforce sector, driving skills, training and employment opportunities, which will benefit the national economy for generations. It's a whole-of-nation effort that will deliver nation-changing op opportunities, including around 20,000 direct high-skilled, high-paid jobs, including technicians, engineers, scientists and project managers. This means jobs right across Australia, but also in the good Senator Smith's uh, home state of South Australia and, indeed, Western Australia. In South Australia, where I had the honour to visit last week with Senator Wong, this project will mean up to 4,000 workers will be employed to design and build the infrastructure at the submarine construction yard in Osborne at its peak, and a further 4,000 to 5,500 direct jobs are expected to be created to build the nuclear-powered submarines in South Australia when the program reaches its peak in 20 to 30 years, almost double the workforce that had been forecast for the attack class program. In Western Australia, the expansion of HMAS Stirling to support the infrastructure required for nuclear-powered submarines is expected to create around 3,000 direct jobs over the decade, and an additional 500 direct jobs are expected to be created to sustain the submarine rotational force west over the period 2027 to 2032. We need to get moving on these investment, investments, not just for our national security, but investing in the future of defence and also the future of our economy and the skills and jobs that come with it. This is a big investment and we've been up front with the Australian people about the substantial pressures on the budget. Defence is one of the big five fastest growing areas of spending, along with NDIS, aged care, health care and the costs of servicing the trillion do dollars Thank of you, Liberal Minister, debt. The time for answering has expired. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Minister, how will this agreement benefit not just Australian workers but also Australian companies? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Smith again for her advocacy, in particular in relation to um, her, the state of South Australia. Last week, when I was visiting um, South Australia 
uh, out at, with A and I at Osborne, uh, we announced the Sovereign Submarine Partnership, which will be the architecture that is used to guide and set uh, how these submarines will be built. This agreement will provide opportunity to select the partners, but also ensure that max to maximise the opportunities for Australian businesses to participate in these new uh, arrangements. This is, a com this is complementary to our plans for a future made in Australia and the Buy Australian plan, which is about leveraging the purchasing power of the Commonwealth to increase opportunities for Australian workers and businesses. We're estimating that $6 billion will be invested in Australian industry and workforce, a transformational investment which will remake Australia and accelerate growth in the same way that large projects like Snowy did uh, all those years ago. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and you're welcome in South Australia any time. Um, can you tell us how the creation of new jobs and opportunities for Australian businesses will benefit the Australian economy? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, yes, it will transform our economy for a new era. A whole generation of workers will be trained in the latest engineering, technology and building skills. There will be significant benefits across the nation through increased economic activity and job creation, which will start immediately and grow over time as we develop a whole new industry and new supports for that industry. It's all part of our economic plan to undertake investments to build the capability of our people and expand the productive ca capacity of our economy for a new era. I've already mentioned the Future Made in Australia plans and the Buy Australian plan policy. We also have the National Reconstruction Fund, obviously, uh, which would be I good believe. to pass the legislation I that uh, supports that. Policies for free, free fee TAFE, Jobs and Skills Australia, and acting on climate change. All of these policies are designed to grow the economy, you know boost productivity, and upskill Australians. And the AUKUS investment is another vital part of our economic plan going to the future. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson. Order. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. The updated strategic direction statement for the National Indigenous Australians Agency that falls under the portfolio of Prime Minister and Cabinet says it provides advice on whole of government priorities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as well as leading and coordinating the implementation of Australia's Closing the Gap targets in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Given we have the NIAA, why does the government contend we need a voice to parliament in the constitution? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank uh, Senator Hanson for her question. <clears throat> um, I think the first um, and primary um, answer to that question is that uh, at the last election, um, the uh, Labor Party uh, listened to um, those people who had uh, ad advocated on behalf of the uh, Uluru uh, Statement from the Heart, people like my very good friend here, uh, Patrick uh, uh, Dodson, um, like uh, Jana uh, Stewart over there, amongst uh, very, very many other um, significant members of the Labor Party, uh, to try and deal with the I issue of uh, Indigenous uh, recognition uh, through a voice to the Australian Parliament. Um, that process wasn't um, developed overnight. It took place over a long period of time, uh, and we took we took we took that we took that we took that proposition to the um, Australian people at the last election, and the Australian people uh, made a decision about who they wanted to govern this country. Uh, and uh, as soon as we got into uh, government, because they elected, they elected us, they elected us uh, as the government, we under, un, under, undertook to implement the promise that we had taken. You talk about um, uh, <coughs> promises. Well, we took, we took a promise, we took a promise, we took a promise um, to the Australian people, and we have implemented. Order. We have sought Order. to implement that, uh, that problem. I have to say I have been disappointed in uh, the opposition um, in their approach so far to um, simple things like the machinery bill, the machinery bill uh, that could start the process of uh, implementing uh, Thank you, Minister the Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hanson, first supplementary. 
The NIAA priorities this year include closing the gaps, implementing the Uluru Statement, developing a new jobs program, delivering First Nations justice, whatever that means, and more. It has also budgeted $31 million to deliver local and regional voice implementation despite the Prime Minister saying he would not fund the yes or no cases in the coming referendum. Will the Minister please inform the Senate about the NIAA's total budget for 2022-23? Thank you. Senator Hanson. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, thank you uh, President, and thank uh, uh, um, Senator Hanson again for her, uh, her, her question. Um, I think you're conflating a couple of issues, um, to be honest uh, with you, um, Senator, uh, Senator Hanson. Um, um, no, well, it's not patronising. It's simply a statement, uh, statement of fact. Um, Senator Hanson has, has asked a question, and I'm, I'm trying to uh, answer that uh, question uh, for, for her. Um, those, those that information that uh, you are um, requesting uh, will, of course, be published in uh, in due course as part of uh, uh, of part of the relevant uh, budget uh, budget papers. But um, the issue of um, the referendum um, to implement the voice. Um, Indigenous recognition. Thank you, voice Minister Farrell. The time for uh, answering has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. It doesn't surprise me. No answer. And you don't even know the budget papers are already out. Actually, the NIAA is almost four and a half billion dollars. It employs more than 1,300 people, and its remit appears to be largely the same as the government's somewhat vague intentions for the voice. That's truth-telling for you. Will the minister please explain why Australians should not believe the government's ulterior motive in implementing the Uluru Statement is to establish an independent, sovereign black nation in Australia? Yeah! Uh, order, Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe, order. Uh, minister Farrell. Um, order. Well, Senator Hanson, I completely reject your proposition. Um, this, this is an issue um, that, um, as I said, the Labor Party took to the last election, uh, and we are seeking to implement um, Indigenous rec recognition through a voice to parliament, and we're seeking to do it um, in an open, honest and transparent way. Just to give you one example, um, originally there wasn't going to be a yes or a no case uh, pamphlet, um, and we we um, were requested to do that by the opposition, and we agreed. And as part of that process, Senator Hanson, because you are a member of Parliament, and because of the way in which that document is going to be prepared, you yourself will have an opportunity to explain to the Australian people. What, 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 what I, whether you're supporting yes or no, I think I can guess. Uh, Minister your, Farrell, you... time for answering has expired. Thank you. Senator Rennick. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Order. Senator Farrell. AEMO explicitly named regulatory approvals, price intervention and a mandatory code of conduct as key uncertainties impacting project timelines and likelihood of completion. Minister, will you admit that the interventions of your government are suppressing and damaging investment in new gas projects? Thank you, Senator Rennick. Minister Farrell. Um, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator uh, Rennick, for this uh, rare, rare question. Um, no, the short answer is no uh, to that. Um, looking, look all around the world, um, Senator, as to what the consequences of this terrible war between uh, Russia and Ukraine has done to gas prices, to gas, pr to gas prices, um, right, Order right, on my right left. around, Order. right around. Order. Minister Farrell, please continue. Um, all around the world, um, governments um, are dealing with this issue of rising uh, electricity uh, prices. Um, all around the world, governments have had to deal with the way of trying to put downward pressure uh, on those prices. Um, what, 
what we have done, what, 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 well, 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 order, all, all, what? Uh, Senator, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Order on my left and right. Order. Minister, please continue. I mean, what? What are the Europeans doing? What are the Europeans doing at the moment? What are the Europeans doing? They're putting, they're putting, they're putting caps. They're putting caps on on gas prices. Is anybody saying? Is anybody in in Europe saying? Oh, this is going to this is going to uh, result to to for um, disinvestment in in gas? No, they're not saying that. In fact, in fact, what they're doing, what they're doing, what they're doing is increasing increasing their investment. Uh, in this area, and of course, my Order. belief my, my belief is that that's 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 where well well I'm happy to talk to you, uh, Senator Canavan, about gas gas prices and uh, uh, the importance the importance of investment in uh, uh, in gas in this Thank uh, you, in Minister. this country. Thank you, Minister. Time for answering has expired. Senator Rennick, first supplementary. Uh, when will the Albanese government? Mandatory code of conduct be finalised. Uh, Minister Farrell. Order. I've called the minister. Minister Farrell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, um, un unlike the former government, who seemed to be unable to come out with any sensible plan in respect of uh, gas prices, coal prices, electricity prices, climate change. This, this government, this government uh, has, has got a plan uh, and we are working through that plan as, uh, as we speak. We're working, through, we're working through that plan as we speak. And uh, um, we've got um, a number of excellent ministers, like Minister uh, um, uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Rennick. Point of order, Chair. I asked when the mandatory code of conduct yep. will be completed, um, not when you are working through it. Thank you, Senator Rennick. I will direct the minister to the question. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, um, Madam President. And uh, um, look, we uh, we've dealt. We've, we're dealing with the issue. We're putting downward pressure. Downward pressure on the electricity system, and we we are consulting as we should. We're Thank consulting you, Minister as Farrell. We the time for answering has expired. Uh, Senator Rennick, second supplementary. Labor has broken its promise to lower power bills by $275. Given the simple economic fact that price controls do not increase supply, what do you have to say to Australians who may also lose power and heating this year? because of Labor's failed energy policies. Is the government lowering bills by simply not having any power or gas to buy? Thank you, Senator Rennick. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank, uh, thank the Senator for his uh, supplementary question. Uh, this government has made it very clear that we continue to support the gas uh, industry in this, uh, in this country. Well, well, um, they may not they may not say that to you, uh, uh, Senator, but they they say that to me, and I have uh, regular discussions uh, with many of the major uh, gas uh, companies in in this uh, in this country. Um, and look, they they understand they understand the pressure. They understand they understand the pressure that Australian consumers and Australian businesses are under as a result of your Order failure on my left. to Senator Cash they understand they understand they understand the pressure uh, Minister that Farrell, they are under Minister Farrell please resume your seat Minister Farrell please resume Order on my left Minister please continue Thank you Is that the question you would have chosen Jerry? Um, <laughs> look Look, look, these issues, Minister, these issues the are, are being has dealt expired. with. Thank you. Uh, Senator McKim. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, you and other members of your government consistently say that it is the financial position you inherited which is the reason you can't provide more support for Australians getting smashed by the cost of living crisis. Yet last week, 
Your government delighted US and British weapons manufacturers by signing up to a $368 billion deal for nuclear-powered submarines. Minister, how are you ever going to look Australians in the eye again and tell them that you can't afford to put dental and mental health into Medicare, that you can't afford to raise the rate of income support and that you can't afford to wipe student debt when you are prepared to splash $368 billion on the AUKUS subs. Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank uh, Senator McKim for the question. Uh, and as um, senators will know, one of the, um, the main job of a federal government is to keep our citizens safe. Uh, and this investment in our national security is important Correct. on its own, uh, but it also has significant economic benefits across the country as well. In terms of, in terms of the impact, the question goes to the impact on the budget. So, um, as, as people will be aware, we have uh, forecast that over the forward estimates the impact will be in the order of $9 billion, of which $6 billion sits in the forward estimates as provision uh, for the attack class, uh, and that the additional um, costs over the forward estimates uh, will be met um, from within uh, Defence's existing uh, funding arrangements. Over the medium term, we are looking at costs in the order of 50 to 58 billion, and beyond that, um, looking at 0.1, around 0.15 uh, of GDP, 0.15% of GDP over uh, into the next uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, I would say that this investment is also um, just under 10 per cent of the investment that we make overall into defence. Uh, it is an important uh, arrangement and an important agreement, but I would also say that that does not mean that those other areas of priority within the budget uh, do not get the attention of the government as well. And as you know, we have made investments into key social uh, policy areas like childcare, like making medicines cheaper, like investing in free, free fee TAFE, uh, and the budget will also have a significant investment in cost of living around energy bills. Um, we have also got the work that is com coming our way from um, the Economic Inclusion Advisory Board that will also uh, inform the government in its decision making. But it is not an either or. We have to do all of these things. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um were you going to make a point of order, Senator Kim, or you Oh no, I wasn't. I was okay. uh, simply rising okay. slightly precipitously. Okay. Right. Uh, so, um, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, Labor's stage three tax cuts will cost even more than Labor's nuclear submarines. Three quarters of the benefit of the stage three tax cuts will go to the top 20 per cent of income earners. Meanwhile, women in their 60s are having to sleep on their friends' couches. Is this what the Prime Minister meant when he said that Labor would leave no one behind? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And I thank Senator McKim for his ongoing interest in stage three tax cuts. Um, as the Senator will know, our policy on these tax cuts has not changed, and our focus on tax reform is in the area of ensuring multinationals play their fair share of tax and um, some of the, the change that we've recently announced around superannuation for high balance accounts. I would say again, we have important policies that go to the point. I'm not dismissing the point that Senator McKim raises about other areas of pressing uh, pressure and need in the budget, including for uh, women and women's housing. It is, um, it is a real priority, and that's why we really like to see this Senate pass the Housing Australia Future Fund in this fortnight so that we could make sure that some of the allocations to that go absolutely and specifically to that demographic group. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Minister, we hear a lot from the Treasurer about relief, repair and restraint, but the stage three tax cuts and the submarines are none of those things. Given your cash splash on weapons and the wealthy and your avoidance of serious tax reform, what excuse will you lose will you use when you hand down your austerity budget in May? Thank you, Senator Kim. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President. I thank Senator McKim for uh, his his question and um, for uh, I, I well Senator McKim can describe a budget that hasn't been handed down or finalised in the 
in the terms with which he chooses. But um, this budget is an important budget in terms of uh, the relief that we need to offer for cost of living. I've gone through the forward estimates impact of um, the defence arrangements of AUKUS to make sure that um, that isn't an additional cost that's being met from within the Ford estimates. Um, in this high inflation environment, there is also a responsibility to not be adding to or fueling inflation. So that means the decisions we take have to be very careful. They have to be about investing in the productive side of our economy, not making the inflation challenge harder, um, but making sure that we are providing sensible and affordable cost of living relief where we can. And we think we will get those. There's still some, a lot of decisions to be made, but the budget will be determined in that light. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator White. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Skills and Training, Senator Watt. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Albanese Labor government's AUKUS submarine program skills, skills and Training Academy will help to upskill and attract the workforce to support and build the capabilities of Australia's world-leading defence industry? Thank you, Senator White. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator White, who I know has had a lifelong interest and dedication to raising skills and training within our community. Last week, the Prime Minister announced Australia's optimal pathway to acquire conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines. In addition to strengthening Australia's national security, this announcement will build a future made in Australia by Australians with record investments in defence, skills, jobs and infrastructure. As Senator Gallagher has stated, the program will create around 20,000 direct jobs over the next 30 years across industry, the Australian Defence Force and the Australian Public Service, including trades workers, operators, technicians, engineers, scientists, submariners and project managers. And at its peak, building and sustaining nuclear-powered submarines in Australia will create up to 8,500 direct jobs in the industrial workforce. It's a decision that means many, many jobs uh, for workers right around the country, in particular in the states of South and West Australia. And on Wednesday, the Commonwealth and South Australian governments signed a cooperation agreement outlining our respective governments' commitment to supporting the construction of Australia's next generation conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines in Adelaide. As part of the agreement, the Albanese government and South Australia will work towards the construction, establishment and operation of a skills and training academy campus in South Australia. The academy will be a dedicated hub to attract, grow, develop and qualify the shipbuilding workforce to meet current and future demands and provide opportunities for continuous development of the existing workforce. The academy will support the entire shipbuilding workforce providing hands-on trades training and classroom-based professional development backed by cutting-edge technology and modern facilities. Uh, this will be a whole-of-nation initiative and it will incorporate multiple locations to deliver training where it's needed, with the central campus being built in South Australia. Thank you, Senator, what, um, Senator White. First supplementary. Uh, can the minister explain how the new academy will work hand-in-glove with education and training providers and state and territory governments to drive Australia's workforce and skills development? Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator White. The new Skills and Training Academy will be delivered working in lockstep with state and territory governments, unions, universities, education and training providers, and the scientific and technical sectors, and will be vital to supporting the capabilities of Australia's world leading defence industry. Importantly, the Academy will be responsive, connected to, and informed by Australian industry. This will be an academy that strengthens Australia's sovereign capabilities by growing our industrial workforce, ensuring that industry has the people and skills it needs to realise emerging opportunities across the shipbuilding economy. The Albanese Labor government has a strong record of working hand in glove with state and territory governments when it comes to skills development. In addition to the announcement of the new academy, the Albanese Labor government has also signed landmark skills agreements with every state and territory government. And that, of course, includes the delivery of 180,000 fee-free TAFE and VET places nationwide in 2023, along with a range of other Thank initiatives. Thank you, Minister. Senator White, second supplementary. What steps has the Albanese Labor government already taken to help upskill Australians to harness these jobs and opportunities of the future? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Well, the Albanese Labor government understands the life-changing benefits of vocational education and training to create good, secure jobs and to address skill shortages, 
Unlike we saw from the, the former government cutting TAFE, cutting training opportunities until it was all too late, the Albanese Labor government is serious about building the skills of our workforce so that the people have the opportunity to take on the jobs of the future. Australia's vocational education and training sector already contributes significantly to our naval shipbuilding and sustainment sector, providing diverse skills requirements ranging from complex engineering and design roles, project management and logistics roles, through to highly advanced technician and trade roles. And our delivery of 180,000 fee-free TAFE and VET places in 2023 is further supporting this. The Albanese Labor government is investing in our greatest resource, our people. Our fee-free TAFE places will provide training opportunities, particularly focusing on priority groups, increase workforce participation and address skills gaps Minister. in the economy. Time for answering has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry and Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Murray Watt. Minister, what assets does the Commonwealth have which could be used to help remove dead fish from the Darling River at Menindee? Has the Commonwealth offered any of these resources to help the New South Wales authorities in the clean-up of these dead fish along the Darling River? Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Davey, for the question. Uh, as Senator Davey is well aware, the Commonwealth is always open to the uh, option of deploying Defence Force personnel to assist uh, in any natural disaster. Uh, if requested by the state government. Now, I am not aware of any request having been made by the New South Wales government for that form of assistance. I am happy to be corrected if, an, if a, such a request has been made. But, of course, the other point to make, out, make is that um, the Menindee Lakes fish deaths, while absolutely tragic, and I think all of us have been very disturbed by the footage there, uh, they do not constitute a natural disaster. Um, so I'm not sure whether there is even the capacity to deploy the defence forces, uh, even if such a request were to occur. Um, if Senator Davey is aware of a request having been made by the defence force, uh, I'm certainly happy to be made aware of that. But I'm certainly not aware of any request having been made. The, um, of course, it's not uncommon for uh, the opposition to call for the deployment of the defence forces, um, despite. Uh, and, and other federal assistance uh, when not Order. requested by state governments. Uh, we saw Senator, Senator Macdonald do that in a radio interview last week in relation to the floods in northwest Queensland, only a matter of hours after I informed her that no such request had been made by the Queensland government, uh, but never let things get in the way of making a political point when that can be made. Um, the, the, as I say, I think we are all concerned by the large-scale fish kills that are being uh, captured on footage at the moment at Menindee Lakes, and this, of course, is the second time in four years that we've seen this occur. Uh, it seems, while this is all being investigated, that it's mostly caused by black water and the low oxygen uh, that results from that. Uh, as the uh, fish kills have been caused by flooding combined with high temperatures, which is what causes that low oxygen that flows from black um, water. Thank you, Minister. What the time for answering has expired. Uh, Senator Davey, wait until you're called. Senator Davey. Thank you. Uh, my question, however, Minister, was not necessarily specific to the Defence Force. Uh, and the minister would well be aware that six years um, and fifteen million dollars. Senator Davey, what is the point of order? I wasn't. It was, I'm standing to ask my supplementary question. Okay, sorry. So, uh, Senator Davey, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, that was entirely unnecessary, and I, I am not. It, uh, Senator McGrath, Senator McGrath, resume your seat. You are out of order. Sen Senator McGrath. You are out of order. Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, McGrath deserves a withdrawal and an apology. Absolutely. Senator McGrath. Senator McGrath, resume your seat. You are being disrespectful and disorderly. Senator Farrell has asked you to uh, apologise and withdraw. I'm going to ask you to reflect on that and consider that. I apologise and I withdraw. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator, Senator Davey, I'm going to ask you to um, 
start the question again. And I will apologise because you stood just before the minister had finished, and I thought you were seeking a point of order. So please uh, start again. Thank you. As the minister is well aware, after six years and $15 million spent researching the ways to deal with and rem remove large volumes of dead carp from our waterways under the National Carp Control Plan, what are some of the ways that the National Carp Control Plan proposes for large volume dead fish cleanup that could be offered to New South Wales to assist in the current crisis? Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, Senator Davey. And as I say, uh, I'm not aware of any such request having been made uh, by the New South Wales government to the federal government, but I am aware that our government is working closely with New South Wales authorities in relation uh, to these fish deaths. I also understand that an emergency operations centre has been activated at Menindi to coordinate multi-agency uh, operations. Uh, the centre will ensure fresh and clean water supply is maintained to the Menindi township, as well as to coordinate the removal and disposal of fish. Of course, uh, the, the tragic events that we do see unfolding at Menindi are yet more proof of the need to fully deliver the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, something that the former government was unable to do uh, in all the years. And I know it sets off the gnats, I know it sets off the gnats and it's setting them off again, but after a decade of delay and sabotage by Liberals and Nationals around the country, there is still a way to go to finish the plan. Um, we haven't yet received the full benefits for the river system uh, and unfortunately Minister, this is more proof. The time for answering has expired. Senator Davey, second supplementary. Uh, incredible that you want to flood a flood. But will the Commonwealth be deploying any of the ideas developed under the National Carp Control Program to remove rotting dead fish from the Darling to assist New South Wales in this crisis? That was a program done across jurisdictions, 3,800 pages of documents as a result with options for fish cleanup. Have you even looked at it, Minister? Uh, thank you, Senator Davey. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Well, Senator Davey, not only have I looked at the National Carp Control Plan, but I've in particular looked at the fact that it was first announced by the then Minister, Mr Joyce, back in May 2016. It was supposed to be delivered in 2018, and four years later, after the coalition off lost office, it still hadn't been delivered. Um, so, again, I don't remember this level of outrage around your own government having failed to deliver the National Carp Control Plan that it said would be delivered Order. in 2018. Order. Uh, the Carp Plan is complete, although the report that has been received by the government uh, more recently provides insight into the feasibility of the carp virus as a biocontrol agent, uh, but there are uncertainties about its efficiency and effectiveness in safely removing carp from our waterways. Uh, and I am surprised that the National Party, uh, being environmental vandals that they are, uh, want to get out there and immediately release a virus uh, into Senator the Murray-Darling River. Senator your seat. But, uh, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator Davey. I can make a point of order, thank you, Senator Ayres. I can make a point uh, of order, order that he Senator has Davey. Just Poorly reflected Davey, on every member of the National seat. Party. Order. 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 Um, I remind senators, when you seek a point of order, you stand and wait for the call. And if there are interjections from the other side, I will deal with them. Senator Davey, please continue. A point of order, thank you, uh, thank Chair. You. Um, point of order is that uh, the minister is um, reflected poorly on every senator in here who is a member of the National Party, calling us environmental vandals. I ask him to withdraw. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Davey. In the spirit of uh, keeping the chamber decent and respectful, I will ask Senator Watt to withdraw that comment and to continue his remarks. I withdraw, um, but I am surprised that the National Party wants to uh, just get out there and release the carp virus into the Murray-Darling uh, plan when there are serious concerns uh, about the effects thank that it you, would Minister, have. Thank you, Minister. Your time for answering is expired. Minister uh, Thank you, uh, President. Uh, Mr. I uh, request that further questions be placed on the notice thank you. paper. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, in question time on the 9th of March, I took elements of a question asked by Senator Shoebridge to me on notice. I've written to Senator Shoebridge to provide a complete answer, and I now table that answer for the information of the Senate. Thank you.
Senator Scar, are you seeking the call? I move to take note of all answers provided by the government in question time today to questions from the opposition. You have the call. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, we've heard here today a number of issues canvassed which go to some of the major issues facing uh, this government at this point in time. I want to speak directly in relation to, firstly, forecast gas shortfalls. Now, the Australian energy market opera operator, AEMO, is responsible for managing the electricity and gas systems across the whole of Australia. They are an absolutely integral part of making sure that all the businesses and retail and, and customers, consumers, both business and personal across Australia, get the electricity and gas they need, they need to operate their businesses or to maintain their households. And what that organisation has said, not, not a politician, not a person in this place, but a, but a key organisation in terms of running the electricity and gas system across Australia, They've, in their most recent report, they have said, and I quote, they have explicitly named regulatory approvals, price intervention and a mandatory code of conduct, the policies of the government, as, I quote, key uncertainties impacting project timelines and likelihood of completion end quote, of gas projects. So the policies that were introduced in haste last year, at the end of last year, in mid-December, they called back the whole of parliament to introduce policies which effectively put price controls on the gas industry and would provide the government with the opportunity to dictate the terms and conditions upon which that commodity can be sold and who it can be sold to. As, as, a, direct result of that, as a direct result of that, we now have our key regulator and oversight authority in terms of Australia's electricity and gas system saying that policy, that policy has created key uncertainties impacting project timelines and likelihood of completion. So when those of us on this side of the chamber got up and warned that it was basic economics, basic economics, that price controls, however well intended, invariably impact supply, those opposite were derisive. Were derisive. Said you don't care about keeping down electricity prices, you don't care about keeping down gas prices. But quite the contrary, Quite the contrary, in terms of the price issue that this country was facing, fundamentally it was a supply issue. This country has enough gas, has enough gas to uh, provide that energy resource to consumers, private consumers and businesses, and plenty more on top of that, and plenty more on top of it. But the policy of the government, the Albanese Labor government to introduce price controls, has had a direct negative impact on those Australians, be they in business or in their homes, relying upon that gas. Now, I can give you an example of a particular project in my home state of Queensland, operated by a Queensland company called Senex, which has been delayed, which has been delayed as a direct result of that price control legislative architecture that was introduced late last year. As a direct result, Senex, a company called Senex, which I should say, is approximately 50 per cent owned by a Korean organisation called POSCO, which has been investing in Australian resources industry for decades and decades, has delayed $1 billion of spending on a gas project in southwest Queensland as a direct result of this policy. Now, those gas reserves, those gas reserves were actually reserved for domestic use. Were reserved for domestic use. And that project, which would produce gas for domestic use, has been delayed as a direct result of the price controls which have been introduced by the Labor government. As a direct result, $1 billion of investment. And why? Why? They actually tell us why. They say because there's too much uncertainty. How can you invest a $1 billion into a new project if you do not know how much you're going to be able to charge for your product? who you can sell it to and the terms and conditions of sale. How can you invest one, I'll say it again, how can you responsibly invest in one billion dollars, invest one billion dollars in a project where the government can dictate to you the price you can sell it at, who you can sell it to and the terms and conditions of sale. And you know what? 
You can go three kilometres north of Australia to Papua New Guinea and invest in their oil and gas industry and not be faced with the same restrictions. So why, why would you invest an extra dollar in this jurisdiction with those price controls when you can invest in one of our nearest neighbours? Senator Ayres. Oh, I'm astonished, really. Um, I'm regularly astonished uh, by the line of argument of those opposite in relation to energy prices. Um, I mean, the first thing the first thing that people opposite should do uh, in, in any discussion about energy prices, the first thing they should do is apologise. Apologise to the Australian people. Apologise to households. Apologise to business for two things. One is a decade of complete sclerosis, complete inactivity, complete failure on energy prices complete failure on energy policy. Who can forget 23 different energy policy frameworks and didn't land a single one of them, which contributed to a decade of complete policy uncertainty, frozen investment, billions of dollars worth of investment in Australian energy capability flooded offshore because the rabble over here, when they were on the government benches, couldn't land an energy policy. Like utter failure. And the upward pressure that there is on household and business energy bills is a complete consequence of their failure over here. And the second thing, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute, we'll come to that in a minute. The second thing that Mr Morrison and Mr Taylor should apologise for is the fact that immediately prior to the election, the then minister, Mr Taylor, with his unknown colleague, the secret minister, the then prime minister, were in possession of some knowledge about what was going to happen to wholesale energy prices, uh, that it was their responsibility to, in the normal course of events, communicate to businesses and households, because that's what ministers do. And what did they choose to do? What did Mr Taylor choose to do? He decided to keep that information about price rises in the order of 18 per cent to keep them secret from the Australian people. Why did they do that? Because it didn't suit their political interest. Because, as always, with Mr Morrison and Mr Taylor and Mr Turnbull and Mr Rabbit, their approach to energy was always about glib catchphrases. It was always about slogans. It was all about trying to find division, and it was never about not at any point about actually trying to encourage investment in, in Australian energy, in distribution. I mean, this, all this piffle about a gas-led recovery from Mr Morrison, nothing got built, nothing got done. It was just a slogan tested in focus groups that led to no actual investment and no actual action. And you have Senator Scar in here claiming that Labor's, Labor's decision last year in government to intervene to put downward pressure on gas prices and coal prices has somehow led, he says, it's economics 101. Well, well, the thing about making that argument is that anybody who's spent time studying economics knows that, yes, there is indeed economics 101, but there's second year too. And there's a third year after that, and nobody credible would make an argument to say that price controls today, with investment horizons that far out, is going to lead to uh, supply constraints tomorrow. It's just a silly argument. It's a dishonest argument. It's an argument that's trying to scare people. Well, what does what do the people who are actually what do the people who are actually have facts say about this. 
Well, the Australian Energy Regulator says that energy prices, because of our intervention, are much lower than they otherwise would have been, by a factor of 10 or 20 per cent, much lower. But that doesn't suit the hyperpartisanship and nonsense that we're seeing from the other side on energy prices. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I too rise to take note, uh, particularly the answer from Senator Farrell uh, about Labor's policy on gas. And we've just heard there from Senator Ayres why this government has not got a clue about handling the gas market. They can't just look at the last 3,000 years of economic history and recognise the fact that what they are doing was not going to have a positive impact on the gas market. In fact, it was highly likely. You could, have, you could have predicted that it would have a negative impact on the gas market. And guess what? Guess what, Senator Cadell? I predicted it. I predicted it. Three weeks before we were recalled to parliament, and you can go back, those opposite who are laughing, go back and look in the West Australian. I wrote an op-ed because this idea of a gas price cap was being floated round by a few low-level Labor ministers, and I thought, no, no, they're not crazy enough to do that. They're not crazy enough to ignore 3,000 years of economic history and impose a price, tap, price cap to try and get gas flowing. They're not that silly. And so I wrote a bit of a what I thought was a tongue-in-cheek op-ed. I wrote what I thought, Senator Cadell, was a tongue-in-cheek op-ed. And it's turned out, three weeks later, we're recalled to parliament to pass gas price caps. And I said in that op-ed, and everybody with a nouse of economic sense said at the time, and have said subsequently, that a gas price cap is not going to do what the government says it supposedly wants to do, which is put downward pressure on gas prices and therefore energy prices. In fact, it's done precisely the opposite, which, which is what I said in my op-ed and what a lot of um, you know, very, very well-trained economists said, because this stuff isn't actually rocket science. There's 3,000 years of economic history going back to ancient Greece that shows that, gas, that price caps of any sort are entirely counterproductive, entirely counterproductive. And what do we have just a few months later when every, anyone with any sense knew that by putting a price cap in place you'd slow down investment, you'd put a lot of uncertainty in the market, you'd actually increase volatility in the market and in the end you'd actually put prices up. And guess what we've got from the Australian Energy Regulator's draft default market offer last week? And, and this, this, is, this is frightening. It's, it's not a matter of joking because this impacts household power bills. It impacts on small businesses. Uh, now, mostly in the East Coast, I'll say a little bit more about that later, but uh, it impacts on small businesses throughout the national energy market. Uh, what, what, is the, what has the, um, the Australian uh, regulator said about the default market offer? Electricity price rises. Electricity price rises in South Australia, New South Wales, and South East Queensland for around 24 per cent. 24 per cent in Victoria. 31 per cent. 31 per cent. That's that's a doubling every three years. 31 per cent increase in one year. And this is at the same time when those same families, those same small businesses, aren't just being hit with massive spikes in their energy, price, energy prices, they're also being hit by massive spikes in the cost of their borrowings. A lot of small businesses need to run an overdraft. They need to, to run debt in order to operate. And we've seen the fastest rise in interest rates pretty much in the history of Australia. Uh, families have seen their mortgage repayments go up by, in many cases, uh, $1,000 a month. And this has a real direct impact on Australian families and Australian businesses. And, and those, those opposite think that it's a joke, thinks it's a joke to recall parliament and pass legislation to impose price caps for a, for a political sugar hit 
to be seen to be doing something when in actual fact they knew it would be entirely counterproductive if they were being at all honest with themselves. Uh, in Western Australia, we're a little lucky. We're a little lucky. We have a large um, domestic gas availability, and obviously we export the vast majority of Australia's gas. And that's thanks to the court government's decision in the 1970s. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Deputy President. I am also astounded at those opposite and their claim to care about some of the most vulnerable people in our community and, and their talk for caring about the cost of living and the impact that has on Australians. Because the Australian people have inherited a trillion dollars of debt. The Australian taxpayer has inherited a trillion dollars of debt. We're now experiencing a cost of living crisis and those opposite have showed their true colours. They don't care about the people who are experiencing the full brunt of the cost of living crisis that we've got in our country. They've spent the last couple of weeks advocating for 0.5 per cent of the population with over $3 million in their superannuation balances. 0.5 per cent with over $3 million in their superannuation balances. They want to advocate for 17 people, I think what it is, with over 300 million. But actually, the people who are doing it tough are the people on the ground. It's something like around 10 nurses that would be needed to pay for somebody's superannuation balance with over $3 million in it. They think it's okay for nurses to pay for the superannuation balances that have over $3 million in them. And then to the point of energy. It is so rich for those opposite to get up and talk about energy prices in this country. I just want to talk about a couple of, a couple of legacy pieces of, of those opposite. They voted against a saving to household power bills. They changed the laws to hide a 20 per cent increase in the default electricity offer. In nine years, nine years, almost a decade, 22 energy policies and not a single one of them worked. Not a single one. 22 policies ignored over 12 warnings from the ACCC and AMO about domestic gas supply. They're talking about gas. How's this for a fact? No new gas basins opened up under them. Under them, we saw a four gigawatt in dispatchable power leave and only one gigawatt came in. That, there's, there's some facts for you, but sure, like we're still continuing to have some denial in this chamber. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We've got a responsible plan to try and tackle some of the challenges that we've inherited as a government. It's about relief, repair and restraint. Responsible cost of living relief, like cheaper childcare, cheaper medicine, direct energy bill relief even. Repairing supply side constraints, like fee-free TAFE, cleaner and cheaper energy, national reconstruction fund and more affordable housing. Responsible budget with spending restraint. Returning almost all revenue upgrades to the bottom line and keeping spending essentially flat over the next four years to not add to inflation. So I want to just repeat that. Spending flat, not wages like the policy of those opposites. Spending flat and we're not keeping wages flat. Australians understand that we didn't create these challenges, but they elected us to take responsibility for them. Our actions on the cost of living are there for people to see. I just want to spell them out. We successfully argued for a Fair Work Commission minimum wage to, incre to increase in line with inflation. We've introduced legislation that will drive investment in cleaner and cheaper energy, putting downward pressure on power prices. The May budget will include direct energy bill relief for households and businesses, which the opposition tried to block. We're delivering cheaper childcare 
We are delivering cheaper medicines. We are delivering fee-free TAFE and more university places. We are expanding paid parental leave. We are building more affordable homes, including through the new National Housing Accord. Pensions, allowances and rent assistance have increased in line with inflation. We have brought in a new pension and work bonus so older Australians can keep more of what they earn without affecting their pension. We are on the side of all Australians. They are on the side of 0.5 per cent of Australians. Senator Van. Thank you, Deputy Chair. And I rise to take note of questions from Senator Ciccone and I think it was Stuart about orcas. Uh, Sorry? That, uh, the, the, motion which, the motion that was moved uh, by Senator Scar did not include the response to that question, so it would be all the other questions. No you problem can speak at to. all. I can happily switch to the other one. <laughs> not the wrong pack. I got two. I'm good at both. Deputy President, on energy policy, it has become very apparent that this government does not and cannot deliver on its promises. Those opposite, after almost a decade in opposition, obviously forgot how to govern and that in government actions must be taken to deliver results. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just about to. The, the AUKUS ones that we announced. Senator Van, Senator Shubri, Senator Stewart, it's not a conversation through me, Senator Van. Thank you. I'm about to tell him. I'm looking forward I tried to before. Because right now the reality, under the Alba, reality under the Albanese Labor government is Australians are far worse off and only going to be worse so later this year when the energy prices go up. Now they were always were on the hustings out there saying yeah, we're going to lower energy prices. Energy prices will be lowered by $275. We've heard how many times Prime Minister Albanese promised that. We know that's not happened, and we heard this week again prices are going up. And not only are they going up, there's going to be shortfalls of gas this winter. Why? Again, because of the policies on the other side. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah, because your Andrews government had a moratorium on them. That's why. And when they knew that they would not be able to fulfil their promise of cutting power bills by $275, they promised an, an assistance package would be finalised in March, with support expected to flow from April. However, again, surprise, surprise, they have broken that promise and not delivered the financial support that they, were, that they promised on a timeline that they set to help people with a rising energy cost crisis that they have caused. And the truth is, we knew higher prices, power prices would come with this government's ill-thought-out, illogical and, frankly, quite ridiculous energy plan. Now, to be clear, I'm very supportive of the transition, transition to a net-zero economy, and I believe it should be more ambitious than what this government has set for their Paris target. And when I attended COP27 in Egypt last year, one thing was abundantly clear that whether you like it or not, transition to renewables is happening, so that anyone not on board will be in front of this tidal wave of investment, regulation and finance will be swept away. However, it is lucky only a few Labor members attended, because if they had been there, if they had had a strong presence, they would have been laughed out of the place if they presented their plan to get to 43 per cent. In the best of conditions, this transition is going to be long and is going to be hard and is going to be expensive. Given that, we don't have a dollar or a day to waste. What we need to, is this government to not make energy more costly and harder on Australians than it has to be. Yet, despite the Albanese government repeatedly blaming the Ukraine invasion, and coalition policy to explain Australia's steadily rising power bills, the impact of the current proposed policy is foundational to the uncertain future of domestic energy prices, decarbonisation and the required investment. 
This reason, the government's reason behind energy crisis due to the global impact of Russia's illegal invasion. However, it is more important to note that the ACCC reported the net back price of LNG was at $41 per gigajoule before the, the, uh, the events in Ukraine. This issue has been prevalent globally in, and in Australia for a decade due to a lack of investment in new supply. In fact, JP Morgan's 2020 annual energy paper explicitly states that countries can reduce production of fossil fuels um, under, the, that, under the assumption that renewables can quickly replace and face substantial and economic geopolitical risk. If the transition is to succeed, we cannot disconnect the generations we have before we have time to replace it. We know under this government that power prices are going to re remain high. That's just a fact, and that will be their failure. I put the question, moved by Senator Scar, those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Deputy President, I rise to take note to the answers given by the Hon. Don Farrell to both Senator McKim and myself, and Senator Gallagher, and the answer given by Senator Gallagher as well to Senator McKim. You have the call. Um, it's now 20 years since Iraq was illegally invaded, an invasion that was predicated on a lie that was sold to the world by the United States and the United Kingdom. And it was a lie that our government accepted at face value, never testing, never bringing to this parliament, never putting to the Australian people. And it's a lie that has produced a brutal war, the effects of which are still being felt 20 years on. And those those effects are being particularly felt, felt by the people of Iraq. There were some 7,000 Iraqi civilians killed in just the first two months of the shock and awe campaign, as it was described. Some 500,000 Iraqis have lost their lives since. Um, and millions of Iraqis remain displaced, many refugees in their own country, all for a war based on a lie where we followed the United States like a little loyal poodle into the war. And has this government learnt those, the lessons of that war? Well, obviously not. First of all, this government joined with the coalition to refuse to release the documents about the decision-making leading us into that war, to continue the secrecy of the coalition under the new Albanese government. But then in this last week, we have seen just how little Labor has learnt from history, because they have committed us to a $368 billion plus nuclear submarine package with the United States and the United Kingdom, the two countries who peddled those wars that dragged us into the, those lies that dragged us into the war with Iraq. They've signed us on to a 30-year, $368 plus billion dollar nuclear submarines program, which will inevitably drag us into the United States' next war. Because that's the purpose. It's to tie the Australian military and the Australian people um, intimately into the United States military, because these are subs we can't build, we can't crew, we can't operate, and we won't be able to deploy without the express consent of the United States. That isn't about defending Australia. It's about projecting force well from our shores into the South China Sea as, as a loyal subunit of the United States military. And the lie that is repeatedly told by the Albanese government peddling the cooked up reheated coalition policy that this is about defending Australia, that lie has been learnt by millions of Australians as we speak. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. While people are getting smashed by a cost of living crisis, crisis Labor is proceeding with a quarter of a trillion dollars worth of stage three tax cuts for the top end and a grotesque $360 billion commitment to nuclear-powered submarines. And I want to issue a challenge to every single Labor Party senator in this place. Go back to your communities and tell the people who are living in those communities how proud you are of your priorities. Go and tell a worker whose real wages are going backwards at the fastest rate on record how much you 
and Gina Reinhart need that $9,000 a year tax cut. Don't tell the woman in her 60s sleeping on her friend's couch how you can't afford a house for her to live in. Go and tell the person starving on JobSeeker how the weapons manufacturers need public money far more than they do. Go and tell the parents who can't afford to fix their kids' teeth how you can't afford to make it any easier for them to go to the dentist. But you won't. You won't, will you? Because you believe in austerity for the poor, in tax cuts for the wealthy and blank checks for the military-industrial complex. The fact that both major parties are now supportive of Labor's stage three tax cuts for the top end and Labor's $360 billion commitment to nuclear submarines means that you will never criticise each other for those decisions. But I can tell you one thing, the Australian Greens will line up to criticise you and we will do it every day because we want to be able to look people in the eye and say, actually, we can afford to put dental and mental into Medicare. We can afford to wipe student debt. We can afford to make childcare free. We can afford to raise income support. And the reason that we can afford to do that is because we should not be proceeding with the AUKUS nuclear sub-deal and we should not be proceeding with the stage three tax cuts. Poverty is a political choice and it's being made by the major parties in this place every day. I'll put the question as moved by Senator Shoebridge. Those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator Farrell for the 22nd of March 2023 on account of ministerial business. Senators Green and McCarthy for today for personal reasons. Senator O'Neill from 23rd to 30 March 2023 for personal reasons. Senator Stirl for today on account of parliamentary business and Senator Wong from 20 to 24 March 2023 for personal reasons. I put the question. Those of the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Does the opposition have any motions? The Greens, no. Thank you. To the whips. Uh, Clark, do we have any postponements? Uh, yes, Deputy President. Postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of the following general business notices. Number 121 postponed to the 14th of June 2023. Number 174 postponed to the 22nd of March. Uh, number 180 postponed to the 21st of March. And number 179 postponed to the 29th of March 2023. No extension notifications have been lodged for committees. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. To put the question, those for the question say aye, against, no, the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? Senator Askew. Um, on behalf of Senator Hughes, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think, I think the ayes have it. Division required. Division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the Senate is that the motion moved by Senator Askew, standing in the name of Senator Hughes, concerning a reference to the Environment and Communications Reference Committee grant funding under a mobile black spot program, be agreed to. Those for the question passed to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator Askew, and teller for the noes, Senator Urquhart. Honourable Senators, there being 30 ayes and 31 noes, it's passed in the negative. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts, you have the call for uh, item 176. Thank you, um, Deputy President. I move. I ask the general business notice of motion number 176 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection. Senator. I move the motion. I put the question that the motion 176, in the standing in the name of Senator Roberts, in order for production of documents be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Is it? Just I called it for the. Yeah. Uh, I'm just uh, seeking to have uh, the government's uh, recorded as opposing this motion. Uh, it will be recorded. We now come to. 177, Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 177 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Roberts. I move the motion. The question before the Senate is that motion number 177, standing name of Senator Roberts, in order for production of documents regarding energy prices and modelling, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, is division required? Division is required. Ring the bells. Uh, can the Whips Committee have got some guidance on one or four minutes? Four, four has been asked for. The bells to ring for four.
lock the doors. The question before the Senate is that, is that the motion number 177, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed to. Those of the question passed to the right of the chair, no to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Honourable Senators, there being 31 ayes and 31 noes, it's passed in the negative. <laughs> Senator Roberts, we have. We've come to 178, standing we, we've, with, we've withdrawn that earlier today because we, the documents have arrived. So did you seek leave to withdraw? Yes, seek leave to withdraw. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Hanson has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? The proposal. I note that at least four senators have stood. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whip. Senator Hanson, I'll give you the call in a moment. I'll just let the chamber settle. Could I ask honourable senators, to, if they're choosing to leave the chamber, to do so quickly? Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. You'd be forgiven for thinking that a rapid tenfold increase in a condition that was causing Australian children to suffer would immediately lead to calls for urgent action and investigations into its causes and treatments. But this isn't the case with the condition known as gender dysphoria. It was revealed last year that more than 2,000 Australian children enrolled in public adolescent gender clinics, almost 10 times the number in 2014. This figure did not capture the number of children being treated for gender dysphoria by GPs and private clinics, so it's likely the number is much higher. The number of children prescribed puberty blocker treatments for gender dysphoria in 2021 was more than 600, up from only five in 2014, while there was also an eight-fold increase in children receiving cross-sex hormone treatments over a similar period. Why isn't this matter of urgency? Why didn't the Senate support my motion last year to refer the alarming increase in Australian children suffering from this condition? Because the issue is completely wrapped up 
with the appalling politics of identity. This progressive form of politics holds that biological reality means absolutely nothing and that people can simply choose their gender at a whim, ever changing the gender on their birth certificates. Rather than address the problem and debate the issue, the so-called progressives insist on deplatforming and silencing those who dare to go against the gender affirmation narrative. This is because they realise there is no difference to encouraging teenagers with the same problems and confusion that teenagers have always had to deal with it by choosing a different gender. It's this affirmation approach which was found to be the major problem in a wide-ranging independent review of gender identity services for children and young people commissioned by the United Kingdom's National Health Service in 2020. The review found a significant and sharp rise in referrals of children with gender dysphoria, similar to what is understood to be happening in Australia. It also found a major change in the case mix of referrals from predominantly birth-registered males to predominantly birth-registered females. And most importantly, it found scarce and inconclusive evidence to support clinical decision-making, specifically the gender affirmation approach, which immediately resorts to the use of puberty blocker and cross-sex hormone treatments. These treatments have been conclusively shown to cause lifelong negative health impacts, and it's destroying lives and families. The story of a UK teenager, Kira Bell, has come to serve as an example of how these confused, suffering children can be led to a life of misery by the gender affirmation approach. At the age of only 15, she was referred to the Gender Identity Development Service at the Tavistock and Portman Clinic in London, where she was diagnosed with gender dysphoria. She was put on puberty blockers at age 16 and was getting testosterone shots at 17. At 20, she had a double mastectomy and had developed a more masculine build, a beard and a man's voice. However, by then, as an adult, she realised her so-called gender dysphoria was only a symptom of her misery, not the cause, as she had been strongly encouraged to believe. But it's too late. The changes were irreversible. Kira joined a judicial review case against a clinic which unanimously decided it had conducted what amounted to uncontrolled experiments on these poor, confused kids who could not understand the implications of gender dysphoria treatments with life-altering consequences. The Tavistock Clinic is now being closed, but what happened there is happening across the world and right here in Australia. At the very least, there must be an Australian inquiry into this issue to find the causes of this rapid increase in gender dysphoria and ensure the same kind of experimentation is not being practised on our children. Either you are genuinely concerned that our kids receive appropriate treatments and will support an inquiry into the issue, or you are more concerned about identity politics and will oppose it. I choose to stand up for our kids and I choose to stand up for the parents who actually came and walked this to the halls of this parliament to talk to each member here in this, in this place and yet you did nothing to, to satisfy their needs and concerns to have a Senate inquiry into this to find out the real causes behind it because you are too gutless to do it and stand up for these people, these poor children who led down this path. Senator, your time has lives. expired. Senator Antic, you have the call. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, for any free-thinking uh, Australian, it can be a challenge to navigate through the left-leaning propaganda uh, when Australia's censorship industrial complex is pushing indoctrination to promote their own ideological agenda. And in the last decade, there has been a significant increase in English-speaking countries of adolescents identifying as transgender and pursuing medical and surgical interventions to transition. Now, many medical professionals and parents have raised concerns about misdiagnosis and the potential harm caused by experimental treatments uh, being offered as the only solution to gender dysphoria. Historically, gender dysphoria was a rare condition that primarily affected prepubescent boys and adult men. However, the current trend shows an inverse pattern with teenage girls making up approximately 70 per cent of the referrals to these gender clinics. Concerned parents of trans-identifying teenage girls often cite various factors such as peer influence, online communities, body and medical health, uh, mental health issues, and isolation as contributing factors to their child's 
decision to identify as trans. Under the guise of gender-affirming health care, treatments such as puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones and even surgery are being used to alter a child's body to match their mental image of themselves. These treatments are irreversible, experimental and have been shown to cause significant harm in the form of infertility, impaired development and decreased bone density. We are now seeing heartbreaking detransitioning stories being told, the sorts of stories which really should make any reasonable person stop and reconsider what is happening. We are seeing the closure of clinics like the Tavistock Clinic in the United Kingdom. Australia needs its media and its political class to wake up urgently. It needs an urgent inquiry, and that's why I support this initiative. Thank you, Senator. Senator Pratt. The Senate dealt with this matter of an inquiry on this topic back in November. We didn't support such an inquiry then, and it should not be supported now. The timing of this debate does not escape me. This motion has been moved in the context of rallies held over the weekend uh, and the week before regarding uh, and often hosting a controversial UK anti-trans activist and her speaking appearances in Australia. They are views which, as we saw on the weekend, are backed by far-right extremists, some of whom were seen using a Nazi salute outside the Victorian parliament. These are not the Australian values that I grew up with, and they're not views that we should be amplifying in our parliament and they don't deserve the treatment of a uh, matter of urgency in this place. The debate before us on this urgency motion is not about ensuring appropriate inquiry, support and care, as the motion might suggest. It is about giving a platform to people with views who would that would harm an incredibly vulnerable patient group, their families and their loved ones. You really only need to look to the way these matters were debated in the context of the marriage equality postal survey to see how, at that time, uh, the identities of trans people were targeted um, back then. It is not in the interests and safety of children to be debated in this way. We should not amplify these issues under the guise of seeking to improve access for trans and gender diverse people to care. We should be supporting better access to care, better health outcomes for all Australians, including children, young people and their families. It's got to be a key priority for our government, as it is for our Australian government. Only a few weeks ago, I walked over the Sydney Harbour Bridge with some 50,000 proud, peaceful, kind families from all, uh, and individuals from all over the world, community members, allies, um, all, all walking with the LGBTIQ plus community over Sydney Harbour Bridge. This is a far cry from uh, the small gatherings of protest that we've seen uh, around Australia uh, in the last week. The community is overwhelmingly against such an inquiry, as are the medical experts in this field. I remind this place that in 2020, the Royal Australian College of Physicians provided advice to the then Minister for Health on the treatment of gender dysphoria in Australia, and that advice, supported by paediatricians, endocrinologists and groups with specialist research and bioethics, recommended against such an inquiry. They noted it would not increase the scientific evidence available regarding gender dysphoria but would further harm vulnerable patients and their families by subjecting them to debate in this place. And every time these kinds of motions come up in this place, you see 
uh, in the response from parents whose uh, children notice such debates, uh, and they are alarmed at the impact that such debates have uh, as their very personal identity is debated in this way in this place. We know, of course, that the tr clinical treatment of children and as adolescents experiencing gender dysphoria is, of course, a complex and evolving area. We do need long-term evidence to inform treatment protocols. This is well understood by researchers and cl clinicians who are working to expand the evidence base based on best practice and care, an evidence base uh, uh, that will be supported by Labor's $26 million medical research Thank future Thank you fund. very much, Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Usually when irrelevant right-wing MPs use the Senate to put forward offensive ideas, I don't engage. I don't like to give them the satisfaction of knowing how much they've provoked me or risk giving more airtime to their bigoted views. But this weekend in Melbourne, we saw what can happen when transphobia goes unchecked. So I am calling this motion what it is. It's a dog whistle to the anti-trans demonstrators who organised the rally in Melbourne on Saturday and who used their platform to vilify trans people and incite hate. Sorry. It's a dog whistle to the neo-Nazis who supported the rally and who stood on the steps of the Victorian Parliament giving Nazi salutes. And it's a dog whistle to the police who used excessive force and assaulted peaceful trans people and allies while al allowing transphobic demonstrators and neo-Nazis to organise. What happened on Saturday shows the ideological similarities between anti-trans campaigners and the far right. Both groups are targeting marginalised members of our community, stoking fear, hatred and violence towards them. It's clear that far-right groups are using transphobic campaigns to recruit people to their own extremism. But we know that they are also racist and anti-Semitic. So to all trans and gender diverse people, as well as Jewish people and people of colour who are still reeling from the weekend, I'm sorry, you don't deserve what happened then and you don't deserve the ongoing attacks on your very identity that are being waged in this parliament. Gender diversity does not need to be remedied. Trans and gender diverse people need to be loved and celebrated. So to all the trans kids and young people out there, I want you to know that I and the Greens have got your back, and I will go into bat for you at any chance I get. You deserve to be celebrated. You deserve to be safe to be yourself. You deserve all the good things in the world because you are magnificent. Yeah. We must do more than call out transphobia. We need to work together to actively dismantle it because trans rights are non-negotiable. Thank you, Senator. Before I call the next speaker, just reminding senators in the chamber that it's disrespectful to interject. In a debate like this, we should show some restraint with the interjections. I had some difficulty hearing Senator Rice's contributions. I remind senators, if you're going to stay in the chamber, show some respect. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President, and I too rise to speak uh, on this motion moved by Senator Hanson today. Uh, and we should all be clear on what this motion is uh, and what it isn't. It's not about protecting children and families. It's not about protecting trans kids. It's not about protecting trans families. It's not about prioritising the lives of vulnerable young people. It's actually about throwing vulnerable children onto the national stage to be judged, to have their lives and identities picked over for political gain. And if we really want to protect our trans young people and trans families, then we really need to stand with them today, to stand with kids who just want to be loved and accepted for exactly who they are. And I want to thank the trans activists who fought for so many years for respect and for a voice, who worked tirelessly in the face of incredible opposition to save lives, and who are the real heroes protecting vulnerable young people. My message to the trans community today 
is that we hear you in this place and we stand with you in this place today and every day, and especially today, because on Saturday in Victoria, a group of anti-trans activists gathered to spread hate. And on the steps of Victoria's parliament, some of them performed a Nazi salute. And it should not have to be said, but there is no place for this hateful and evil ideology in our country. Not anywhere. Not on the steps of the Victorian parliament and not in this parliament either. This is an opportunity for everyone in this place to stand together and condemn these views outright. This is an opportunity for the coalition to stand up against these views, views that deliberately target a vulnerable minority of people. This is an opportunity for the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Dutton, to call this behaviour out, loud and clear. Mr Dutton needs to call out the bigotry. He needs to call out the hate. He needs to call out the horrendous display in Melbourne on the weekend to call out anyone who holds and endorses these views, because we all have a responsibility to condemn this appalling behaviour and stand with the trans community today. We are meant to be leaders in this place, and we know that extremists are emboldened by the words, by the views of politicians. And we all know how dangerous it is to not call out extremist views. We know how dangerous it is to not call out the hateful views that were on display in Victoria over the weekend. We know that almost half of transgender and gender diverse young people have attempted suicide in their lifetime, almost half, because hate hurts and hate kills. We know that access to gender affirming surgery, on the other hand, can be life saving. We know that love and support of trans young people is life saving. There is absolutely no excuse for spouting hate that puts young people's lives at risk. There is no excuse for endorsing or keeping silent when we see scenes like those on Saturday. Silence is just as bad. And that is why it is so important today and every day that in this place we call out these views, this extremist hate. Every member of this parliament should be calling this out. And again, Mr Dutton needs to call it out. Most importantly, what Mr Dutton needs to do is stand publicly with the trans community who are under attack right now. So let me be clear on this. I stand with the trans community today. Trans rights are human rights. These rights should never be negotiable. And I want to give a particular acknowledgement today to members of the Victorian trans community, Austin, Sally, Tiff, Laura and Ricky, who I've met with recently, uh, because it's actually you who are the people who are doing the real work of protecting trans kids. You are the people providing an example to all of embracing who you are. And you are the people who are providing the love and support and acceptance that our trans young people need. So thank you for everything that you do to keep trans kids safe in our community. Thank you, Senator. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. Now, I rise here today to support Senator Hanson's urgency motion calling for an inquiry into the rising number of children suffering from gender dysphoria in Australia and the increasing number of children being treated for gender dysphoria at clinics. Now, we must examine the causes and the possible remedies for this trend to ensure that children and their families and their families receive appropriate support and care. This is not an easy topic to discuss, not at all. In fact, it is difficult and it is uncomfortable. But that is the very reason why we here in this place must discuss it. Our job is to seek the truth and act for the greater good of all. When it comes to gender dysphoria, it is children who suffer most, and there is just so much that we are yet to learn. 
Now, in the last decade, nearly every single English-speaking country has seen a massive rise in adolescents believing that they are transgender and pursuing medical and surgical interventions to transition. Now, many doctors and parents have been expressing grave concern of misdiagnosis and the harms of experimental treatments being offered as the only solutions to gender distress. Now, when you think about it, until very recently, almost nobody was talking about things like gender dysphoria. Hardly a soul would even imagine that one sex at birth was merely a social construct and something to simply be wished away. We now have countless cases of not just adults but children at ever younger ages telling us that they are the wrong sex and wanting to change that sex with puberty blockers, cross-sex hormone therapy and gender reassignment surgery. Now, studies do show that up to 90 per cent of children who are supported but without medical intervention will eventually go on to accept their native gender. It is well documented that there are significant issues that arise from puberty blockers. These include, but are not limited to, sterility, lack of sexual function, bone and brain development issues. Now, puberty blockers, they are being prescribed off-label. They were not designed for gender dysphoria and children simply cannot consent to such radical and irreversible intervention. It is now illegal in parts of Australia for parents, doctors or therapists to stop children from transitioning. State education departments in Australia are advising schools that they can transition your child without your knowledge and without your consent if they suspect that you, as a parent, would be unsupportive. That is true. It is true in my home state of Victoria. There are already multiple cases in Australia where a parent has lost custody of their child for not affirming their child's wishes to medically transition, with judges tending to rule in favour of a supportive parent rather than a cautious parent. Now, in light of new and emerging evidence, many countries around the world are changing their tune on the gender-affirming treatment model. Sweden, Finland and France have banned the use of puberty blockers and hormones for minors, and rightly so. The UK's CAS review into London's Tavistock Gender Clinic led to a 2020 High Court decision stating that children under 16 were not capable of informed consent and the long-term impacts of puberty blockers and other treatments. Now, I urge the Senate to recognise what is happening to these vulnerable children. They are just children after all, and they need guidance from adults. To examine the causes of their gender dysphoria and to consider the most appropriate remedies to treat these children and ensure that they and their families receive appropriate support and care. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This is not about supporting trans kids and their families. It's a dog whistle to the far right, those same people who stood on the steps of the Victorian Parliament on Saturday. When we shadow box the straw men of the far right, for decades the Islamic and the LGBTIQA communities, and today trans kids, we're not talking about an abstract far-off concept. We're talking about real kids and real families in our community. We give air to a far-right movement that seeks to torment a marginalised community in Australia by turning their lives into political fodder. We are talking about the vilification of trans kids oh, and sorry, their families. Senator, Senator Hanson, uh, have you got a uh, new point of order? Under section 193, section 3, that I call on the fact the imputations that have been put upon me and my motives of moving this a motion, um, calling that it's far right and that I want to destroy children's lives is not the case. So I'm asking for a withdrawal of her comments, of the Senator's comments. It's a debating point. It's no, not it's a not. point of order. So please resume your seat. And Senator Orman Payne has the call. 
You don't have the call, Senator Hanson. You do not have the call. Please resume your seat. Or you can leave the chamber. Your choice. Senator Ormond Payne, you have the call. We are talking about the vilification of trans kids and their families, who we push closer and closer to the risk of self-harm and suicide when we grandstand for anti-trans bigots and the neo-Nazis who support them. We must condemn, in the strongest terms, platforming what is at its heart a cynical and hateful exercise in far-right theatre. As a teacher for 30 years, I have taught thousands of young people, and I see what hate and transphobia does to young people who are discovering their identity. And I want those young people to know that we in the Greens have your back yep. and we will continue to stand up for you both inside and outside this place. We must continue to affirm and celebrate trans kids, ensuring that they feel loved, supported and safe in our schools, our workplaces and our community, and to let them know that this love is felt across Australia. In the face of this hatred, trans campaigners and allies still outnumber the bigots. We should give real priority to getting gender-affirming health care into Medicare and strengthening our anti-discrimination laws to better protect trans young people. Trans rights are human rights and they are non-negotiable. Thank you, Senator. Senator Askew, and can I just remind senators, in debates like this, it's important that we show respect and I draw your attention to the fact that there are children upstairs and we are leaders of the community. Senator Askew, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I also rise to support Senator Hanson's urgency motion. We have seen in the past Labor and the Greens work together to shut down an inquiry into this complex yet extremely important issue, and I am proud to be a member of a party which allows a conscience vote on issues such as this. As you have heard in earlier contributions, it is widely known and accepted that subjecting children to puberty blockers and hormone treaters, treatments can have irreversible consequences to the long-term health and mental well-being of children. This, coupled with the drastic increase to the rates of diagnosis of gender dysphoria, are alarming and in itself should be reason enough for a Senate inquiry to investigate the issue. Over recent times, there has been a rise of some people in our community who seem to be obsessed with sexualising young children and encouraging gender dysphoria, all under the guise of some kind of inclusion. Does this not warrant an inquiry to protect our children? We've seen drag queens in our libraries and on our TVs encouraging preschool-aged children to cross-dress and discussing some very complex adult themes and issues. Regardless of each of our individual positions on gender dysphoria, we should all agree that it is vital that our youth are protected and kept safe at all times. I agree that a robust inquiry is needed to investigate this alarming rise of diagnosis and into the treatment of gender dysphoria to allow our youth to access age-appropriate treatment and not being forced into making complex, adult life-changing decisions without appropriate information and support. Thank you. The question before the chair is that the motion moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. The noes have it. Noes have it. Calling for a division. Division. Ring the bells for four minutes, please.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 16 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Birmingham, which is also shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Senators, an opportunity, and then I'll ask is the proposal supported? So the proposal is supported. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. And I call Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Thank the Senate. I move this motion, noting that this is a matter of indeed utmost importance for this Parliament and indeed for the nation in terms of the operation of the AUKUS agreement. Uh, and its impact upon the defence of Australia. One of the most frequent criticisms of politics is so-called short-termism, the view that governments take decisions focused too much on the next election cycle or the near or short term, rather than a perspective of a longer term basis. Well, in this case, President, what we have very clearly is long-term decision-making for Australia in our national interests, guiding the type of defence strategy and defence industry strategy that our country needs to see us in the decades ahead. Those of us on this side are very proud to have been the authors and architects of the AUKUS agreement. We acknowledge and give credit to the other side for having delivered upon the process that we put in place, the 18-month nuclear-powered submarine task force process and ensuring that within that we are taking the steps forward under AUKUS, that it is delivering a long-term strategic plan for Australia's defence capability, that it is contributing to a long-term strategic plan for our defence industrial capability and that it is helping to strengthen <coughs> our alliances and partnerships with key nations with whom we share an interest in the preservation of shared values and support the international rules-based order. The AUKUS agreement and Australia's pursuit of enhanced military capabilities is unquestionably about underpinning the stability, peace and prosperity of our region across the Indo-Pacific. 
It is intended to make a contribution to the defence of Australia and to make a, make a contribution to the defence of Australian interests. Our interests are served by upholding the international rules-based order that has underpinned stability and peace across the world in the main since the Second World War era. Our interests as Australians are based upon preserving respect for those laws and rules that enable open shipping lanes, freedom of navigation and overflight and, of course, for our access throughout our region, along with that of every other partner nation within our region. President AUKUS was possible as an agreement because the coalition made Australia a credible partner and ensured that we made the difficult decisions that had to be made. We made Australia a credible partner by restoring Australia's investment in our defence budgets. When we came to office in 2013, Australia's defence spending had dropped to 1.56 per cent of GDP, the lowest level since pre-World War II era. We restored that back to 2 per cent of GDP, notwithstanding the pressures of balancing the budget pre-COVID, notwithstanding the competing priorities, we took an eye, had an eye firmly focused on the long-term interests of Australia and made the decision to make sure we prioritise that restoration. We made the investment decisions to establish a continuous shipbuilding strategy, also ensuring that Australia was a credible partner for nations like the United States and the United Kingdom to work with on a program such as AUKUS. We also made the difficult decisions to switch to nuclear-powered submarines. That was one of the biggest and most difficult decisions that a government could make, given the program that was already underway in terms of conventionally powered diesel-powered submarines, given the challenge uh, of the technology and ambition associated with nuclear-powered submarines. But we made that decision because of changed strategic circumstances, changes in technology and the te detectability of submarines and in the operation of their powering. What is clear, Acting Deputy President, is that only a coalition government was capable and able to make that decision. Whilst those opposite in government have delivered upon what we did, it is clear from the remarks of Mr Keating, Mr Garrett, former Senator Cameron, that Labor could never have led such a decision. We did lead such a decision. We're proud to have done so. We continue to give bipartisan support because we want to see it succeed. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And last week, the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, along with the US President, uh, Joe Biden, and the UK Prime Minister, Sunak, announced the most significant investment in Australia's national security in our country's history. We will be building eight next-generation nuclear-powered submarines here in Australia, in the state of South Australia, in Adelaide. But it will be a whole-of-nation effort requiring workers in every state and territory. It will create around 20,000 direct jobs, and with construction beginning this decade, we will train more engineers, more scientists, more technicians, more submariners, more administrators and more tradespeople. At its peak, building and sustaining nuclear-powered submarines in Australia will create up to 8,500 direct jobs in the industrial workforce alone. With hundreds of thousands of components, nuclear-powered submarines will present a unique opportunity for Australian companies to contribute not only to the construction and the sustainment of Australia's new fleet, but to the supply chains of partner nations. Australian scientific, education and training institutions will also play a central role. Australians have already commenced training and working on UK and US nuclear powered submarines and in the UK and US facilities. This will mean that Australia has a trained and experienced sovereign workforce for the arrival of Australia's Virginia class submarines from as soon as early as the early 2030s. The cost of this endeavour has estimated to be between $268 and $368 billion, making it the largest investment in defence ever undertaken by Australia. 
and it's something that I think we should be very proud of. Some people may see that, that figure and wonder if this investment is really necessary. But the short answer is yes, it is necessary. It is necessary. We are in a situation where we have the fastest and most significant naval build-up that we have ever seen in our back door, in the Indo-Pacific. As Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Richard Miles said last week, we would be condemned by history if we do not take our changing strategic circumstances seriously and take steps to improve our defence capability. But the Australian Greens seem like that they want to disregard protecting our sovereignty, protecting our very people that we are elected to look after. While I don't think it is improper at all for people to ask questions about how the government is spending money, I think it's important that, to call out the irresponsible commentary that seeks to downplay the changing strategic circumstances that we find ourselves in. The lines that are coming out from some that AUKUS is somehow unnecessary or even provocative is completely nonsense. We should be very, very clear. Australia and our allies are not the provocators here. We are not seeking to change the status quo. We are not seeking to undermine the international rules-based order. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for every international actor. And when these actors commit to unprecedented military spending and naval build-up, it is incumbent upon us, upon Australia, to respond. We are increasing our defence capability by deepening our cooperation with our close allies, by working together so that we can design, build and deploy defence assets greater than the sum of our individual nation's knowledge and capability. It is with complement the Albanese government's wider agenda to revitalise Australia's manufacturing, ensuring that we are a country that makes things here, including identifying defence capability as a priority funding area for the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund. Australia's defence industry and workforce will be vital partners in the AUKUS submarine program over the next four decades and beyond, delivering critical defence capability and supporting an industrial and skills expansion of national economic significance. So while I think almost all Australians would agree it's deeply unfortunate that we live in a world where these steps are necessary, we should also recognise the increased cooperation between ourselves and our closest partners as a good thing. Senator Steele, John. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The AUKUS political deal debated today, dreamt up by Scott Morrison, by, uh, by Boris Johnson, of all people, sanctified by President Joe Biden, is, of course, a tremendous waste of public funds. It sees Australia go all in to the tune of $368 billion on the purchase of eight nuclear-powered submarines that won't be delivered until I'm 60-odd, and for this, the Australian people will get the privilege of becoming a nuclear waste dump for the refuse of these machines and see their public money subsidise British and US defence manufacturers. It is a waste of public funds. It puts us at risk. But this afternoon, what I want to comment upon is this. It is one of the most catastrophic foreign policy decisions an Australian government has ever entered into and fundamentally undermines our ability to be considered as independent actors in our region. This deal forever shackles us to the United States of America, removes the question in the minds of any of our regional neighbours as to whether when the United States says jump, we answer how high and would you like a backflip, sir? And I find it to be outrageous in the extreme, hypocritical, hypocritical in no end, that both parties have spent this week criticising Paul Keating, a man with more right to comment on these things than most people in here, for his observations, and yet you all have remained silent in relation to John Winston Howard, a man who should be before the Hague 
for his involvement in the, in the war in Iraq. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I think it's appropriate, particularly as I look up to the young people who are here in this chamber and understanding about the history of Australia and our relationship with other nations, that when Australia was faced by invasion by a totalitarian regime of the imperialist Japanese government, uh, we called out help to the Americans and they said, we've got your back. And young men and women lost their lives. They spent money, capital, and lives helping defend Australia and the region. And much of the prosperity and peace in the world that has existed for the 60 or 70 years since is because of the sacrifice and the support of the people of the United States. As we look at the Defence Strategic Update, and uh, I recognise Senator Reynolds, uh, who was then Defence Minister, for her work in bringing that about, which took a serious unbiased look at the circumstances facing Australia, it is clear that we face circumstances today that we have not faced since those dark days of World War II, both from grey zone activity, various economic coercive measures, uh, as well as the military build-up in our region. And so the AUKUS agreement, far from being just about nuclear submarines, uh, is about a system of collaboration and support between like-minded nations, nations who are characterised by the rule of law and who wish to work together to increase the resilience collectively of those nations to stand against totalitarian states. So as well as the submarines, it covers a whole range of things such as precision-guided munitions, uh, undersea capabilities that are autonomous systems, quantum technologies, uh, artificial intelligence and autonomy, advanced cyber, hypersonics and counter-hypersonic capabilities, various forms of electronic warfare, innovation and information sharing. And that is partly because of the lessons we learned during COVID where we found that supply chains were incredibly vulnerable, often very narrowly sourced to uh, nations such as China where the Chinese Communist Party are coercive in their behaviour and we need to have supply chains and technology uh, with allies that will enable us to actually maintain peace and stability in the region. I'm attracted to the philosophy of President Roosevelt from the United States, uh, who uh, co-opted an African saying, speak softly and carry a big stick. Uh, and he described his style of foreign policy as, and I quote, the exercise of intelligent forethought, forethought and decisive action sufficiently far in advance of any likely crisis. As practiced by Roosevelt, the so-called big stick diplomacy had five components. First, it was essential to possess serious military capability that would force an adversary to pay close attention and to calculate the risk. The other qualities, and these are not talked about as much, but they are important, were to act justly towards other nations, never to bluff, to strike only when prepared to strike hard, and to be willing to allow the adversary to save face in defeat. Now, history teaches us that there are authoritarian powers who see weakness and a lack of commitment as a reason to act. And the war in Ukraine, we see at the moment with the illegal and brutal invasion by Russia, is a case in point. But we can also look back through history. Uh, the invasion by Argentina at the Falkland Islands on the 2nd of April in 1982 was because General Galtieri saw that the British government were looking for potential ways to actually cede the Falkland Islands back to Argentina if the people agreed, if the people of the Falklands agreed. And the assessment by people uh, in strategic think tanks was that a military response to an invasion was impossible. He saw that weakness for domestic political reasons. He acted. He invaded. Uh, and we know the history, and that history in part was because of the collaboration of the US and the UK because of the industrial base in the UK that was able to co-opt a number of civil assets, particularly ships, to use in that conflict. So AUKUS, far from being a tragedy, is actually about the exercise of intelligent forethought and decisive action sufficiently in advance of any likely crisis. So any adversary will see that we have both the intent and the means to actually 
preserve the global rules-based order that has led to peace and prosperity for tens of millions of people in the world. Senator Babette. Thank you. Now, strengthening our nation's ability to defend itself is something that we in this place should all support. I'd like to thank every Australian who has served or is serving us in our defence forces. We respect and we honour you. I congratulate the PM for continuing the work of the former government to boost our defence capability via the acquisition of nuclear subs. The UAP took a policy of acquiring nuclear subs to the federal election, and we are pleased to see it become a reality. $368 billion is obviously a huge sum, and we will do our best to hold the government to account. We must ensure that this significant investment of taxpayer money delivers the largest increase in defence capability possible. Increased defence capability protects our people and our sovereignty. We hope that the project is delivered on time and on budget. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. It was a significant moment for our nation's history uh, when the Prime Minister Albanese, President Biden and Prime Minister Sunak last week in San Diego when they announced the support for the AUKUS deal with nuclear submarines. This will be the single biggest investment in Australia's defence capability in history. AUKUS represents a transformational moment for our nation, our defence force and our economy as well. It will strengthen Australia's national security and contribute to regional stability in response to unprecedented strategic challenges. Australia actively seeks to contribute to creating a set of conditions that would make it unthinkable for any one country to choose conflict over coexistence. We will always be better off in a world where rules are clear, mutually negotiated and consistently followed. But we must also contend with the implications of a changing region. In the context of the deteriorating strategic circumstances in the Indo-Pacific region, we must act decisively to ensure the security and stability of the region. Australia's nuclear-powered submarine capability will enable AUKUS partners, in collaboration with like-minded countries, to better contribute to a sovereign and resilient Indo-Pacific region and deter aggression more, more effectively. AUKUS is a multi-generational commitment amongst the trilateral partners to broaden our ability to promote stability and contribute to deterrence in the region. Embarking on this vital effort will further strengthen our already deep-seated relationships with the United States and the United Kingdom and provide further opportunities to work with partners in the region. With the AUKUS agreement, the Albanese government is making record investments in defence, skills, jobs and infrastructure. Starting this year, the Australian military and civilian personnel will embed with the Royal Navy and the US Navy, and with the UK and US submarine industrial bases to accelerate their training and development. Training and development will be supported by longer and more frequent visits by nuclear-powered submarines. The first nuclear-powered submarines, built by Australian workers at Osborne in South Australia, are expected to be delivered in early 2040s with the next subs delivered on a regular drumbeat following. The phased approach will result in $6 billion invested in Australia's industrial capability and workforce over the next four years. AUKUS will create around 20,000 highly skilled and highly paid direct jobs over the next 30 years across industry, the Australian Defence Force and the public service. At its peak, up to 4,000 Australian workers will be employed to design and build the infrastructure for the submarine construction yard in Osborne. A further four to 5,000 direct jobs are expected to be created to build nuclear-powered submarines in South Australia when the program reaches its peak. In Western Australia, around 3,000 direct jobs will be created through the expansion, with an additional 500 direct jobs to sustain submarine rotational force west from 2027 to 2032. This whole-of-nation effort also presents a whole-of-nation opportunity for new jobs, new industries and new expertise in science, technology and cyber. Businesses right across the country in every state and territory will have the opportunity to contribute to and benefit from these opportunities over decades to come. I was in Rockhampton last week and I met with the mayor and other leaders there. Uh, and I would also met with a delegation of mayors from the central Queensland region late last year. Uh, they know the opportunity that 
uh, increase in defence spending can provide for their communities. Uh, they are optimistic about the opportunity it can create in central Queensland. Uh, central Queensland is well known, has a well-known, well-established defence industry uh, in places like Rockhampton and further north in Townsville. It's also been a manufacturing hub for decades, and these skills can continue to be utilised to contribute to our defence industries. The AUKUS arrangement agreement will provide even greater opportunities for increased defence spending to benefit communities across the whole of the country. Funding for this commitment will amount to around 0.15 per cent of GDP per year, averaged over the life of the program, which supports the Prime Minister's commitment during the election campaign to, feed, to see defence spending lift to over 2 per cent of GDP. These transformational partnerships with the UK and the US will deliver our Australian Defence Force a superior capability, not just for our generation, but for generations to come. Thank you. Senator Shoebridge. As a Greens MP and Senator, I didn't come into politics to agree with the likes of Bob Carr and Paul Keating. But hard politics can make unlikely allies. And the fact that we agree on the need to end the reckless $368 billion plus AUKUS submarine deal proves just how broad the feeling is in mainstream Australia against this. We should be building a safe, peaceful future for Australia and our region. And instead, the Albanese Labor government is seeking to permanently handcuff us to the United States military's aggressive war fighting plans. The Albanese government has now officially adopted a hand-me-down coalition war plan from Morrison and Dutton and jettisoned any pretense of a foreign policy based on peace and diplomacy. That is a national strategic surrender by Labor to the coalition. So is it any wonder they feel uncomfortable when the hard truths are also coming from their side, from the likes of Keating? Senator Shoebridge, your time has expired. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about the AUKUS submarine deal. This government is in way over its head with this deal. Not only is it spending hundreds of billions on submarines instead of investing in our communities, it also leaves us as a country to deal with high-level radioactive waste, which needs to be safely stored for tens to hundreds of thousands of years. <coughs> Nobody knows how to deal with radioactive waste for that amount of time or how to communicate with future generations in thousands of years to explain the dangerous, dangerous inheritance they received from you. These nuclear submarines are putting our waters, country and communities at risk. First Nations people in this country have passed down knowledge of thousands of years that this is poison. Uranium needs to stay in the ground as it creates sickness and death. We should not go anywhere near these nuclear submarines. Senator Thorpe, your time has expired. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. It is true that today, as it has always been, that there is no democracy for any of us without both peace and prosperity. And the maintenance of both peace and prosperity is not a task for one country alone. Our nation's security and our prosperity and also our peace have always relied on supporting others in our time of need and also with the other, you know, other nations supporting us in our times of need and in times of war. Um, for over 100 years, 122 years in fact, there has been a debate that has raged in this nation about uh, a nation's strategic policy. Uh, first of all, in relation to our reliance on imperial uh, forces through to our reliance and on, on the United States in particular and other allies. But the debate then has shifted between what's called continental defence or you know, defence of Australia, uh, which was a predominant st strategic objective here in Australia under Labor and after the Vietnam War. But we have moved inevitably back to um, internationalist approach and to expeditionary and to um, collaborative defence because we all realise that no one nation has ever done it alone and no one nation can do it alone. Uh, I'm very proud uh, of the AUKUS agreement that was struck 
and also the first project, the uh, nuclear submarine project, because as Defence Minister I uh, initiated that with Scott Morrison um, into the possibility of moving to nuclear-powered submarines in collaboration with the Americans and with the British. And I'm delighted to see that that now has come, in a bipartisan basis, uh, to fruition. But as uh, Senator Fawcett said, AUKUS is so much more than nuclear submarines. AUKUS is all about us working together, combining our industrial, ba uh, industrial military bases um, through the NTIB arrangements, through better ITAR arrangements, so that we can work together with those who are our friends, our allies, and those whom we trust and we can operate with. Uh, it is with, under AUKUS with the United States and the United Kingdom, but there are many other nations. When we were in government uh, and now under the new government that we are talking to in terms of new arrangements. It is a stark fact that the world uh, that we knew post-World War II has gone. Uh, there are nations now who do not adhere in any way to rules-based order under the economic and security uh, constructs that were set up after World War II. And that necessitates a new way of uh, working with our allies. It also requires, I think, for this gov new government, I think, to understand and to really clarify when they put out the Defence Strategic Review that they fully understand the implications of AUKUS and also this new submarine steel. Because the language at the moment has really been about, you know, the ministers talked about porcupine defence, which is continental defence associated now with uh, Taiwan, which is a very different circumstance that we face here in terms of the defence of Australia. The submarines can be used for the defence of Australia in terms of our sea lanes, but they are so much more than that, and AUKUS is so much more than that. And Labor is clearly divided on the way forward with this, with Paul Keating's comments uh, last week. He clearly is still a proponent of the Defence of Australia strategy, and I'm sure that has resonance still in the government benches. But make no mistake, by committing to AUKUS, by committing to the new submarines, this government has, I think very wisely, committed itself to an expeditionary form of defence of Australia, to an internationalist approach and to a collaborative approach, which clearly Paul Keating and others are not yet agreeable to. So in the Defence Strategic Review, it is critically important that this government confirm the strategic underpinnings, because if they are not committed to this and committed to the methods that are now needed domestically to deliver this, then it will spell disaster for our nation. Your time has expired. Uh, I will now put the question. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. The bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those who agree, move to the right of the chair. Those against, move to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Pratt as teller for the yeses and Senator McKim, I believe it is, teller for the noes. There being 40 ayes and 12 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Would honourable senators please resume their seats or leave the chamber? I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Uh, are there any delegation reports? Senator Pratt. Do I seek leave to present a delegation report? Is leave agreed to? Leave I present to. the report of the Parliament, Australian parliamentary delegation to the European Union in France, which took place from the 5th to the 9th of December 2022. Is that it? Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Brown. I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning home loan interest rates and proposed superannuation changes. There are no committee memberships, so we'll move on to messages from the House of Representatives. <coughs> the 
The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023 for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read as the first time. So the question is that bill uh, now proceed without formalities, be read a first time. Those agree say aye. aye. Those against no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to establish the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation and for related purposes. Uh, Senator Brown. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to, li to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. The question is that bill now be read a second time. Those who agree say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I, I prematurely put the question, but the question I will now put is that those agree say aye, aye. those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The president has received a, a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill 2022. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to five laws, details of which will be incorporated in the Hansard. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number one. Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate, and on the amendment moved by Senator Hume. Senator Van. So he was saying earlier before I was in continuation. Just as concerning, this bill also intends to not fund a yes and no campaign. I'm sure if the Labor Party could get away with it, the government would do nothing but fund their party operation and the party, their party apparatchiks. For they follow in that great line from Dale Carnegie, the only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it. Advocating for an official yes and no campaign is a crucial step towards increasing trust and integrity in the referendum process. The implementation of an official campaign will simplify the regulatory environment and ensure the proper conduct of the referendum. The Australian Electoral Commission has provided evidence to parliamentary committees that the donation and disclosure, re disclosure regime remains the most complex part of the Electoral Act. Senators. Applying this regime in the referendum will require proper education and enforcement of the electoral laws for participants who are not regularly involved in elections. Having an official campaign structure is the best way for regulators to ensure appropriate education and enforcement of the electoral laws. Order, Senator Van, to resume the seat. Uh, Senators. I'm noticing the speaker is being distracted by, I acknowledge, quiet conversation, but if um, you could either listen quietly or leave the chamber, please. Senator Van, you have the call. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Having an official campaign structure is the best way for regulators to ensure appropriate education and enforcement of the electoral laws. The official campaign will provide a single point of coordination to provide education and to commence any audit process for the donations or foreign interference, thereby ensuring the integrity of the referendum. This is especially important because there will be a significant number of participants and organisations in this referendum who will not be associated with political parties 
or who do not regularly participate in electoral events. Moreover, the AEC has expressed concerns that some individuals might fall under donations legislation and other electoral laws without even knowing it. The education of participants will be significant given that these events happen so rarely and that they aren't used to the usual political parties that they will be regulating. Even political parties struggle to get it right every time. Therefore, the implementation of an official campaign will provide a framework for education and support and ensuring that all participants have a clear understanding of their obligations and responsibilities. An official yes and no campaign will also enhance the transparency and accountability of the referendum process. It will ensure that all participants have equal access to funding and resources, thereby levelling the playing field for both sides of the debate. This will ensure that whatever the result of the referendum is, that all Australians respect it and accept it. We don't want the Australian people to feel like their side won or lost because of dodgy donations and misinformation. We want our referendum system to be like all of our other election systems. That is the gold standard that the rest of the world follows. Order. It is also a concern that the threat that a foreign power may influence this ref referendum, and by extension our country, is worsened by this piece of legislation. The Director-General of ASIO only two weeks ago told Australians that we are seeing the greatest level of foreign interference in Australia's history. In light of this, it is crucial to consider practical steps that can provide structure around the referendum process and help regulators and agencies manage the situation effectively. The issue of foreign interference is not unique to Australia, as evidenced by similar incidents in other countries. For example, Canadian intelligence agencies uncovered plots to interfere in their 2021 election to create a minority government and state-sponsored hacking has reportedly targeted three major parties in Australia. As such, the need for a structured approach to the referendum becomes all the more important to mitigate the risk of foreign interference. The establishment of an official yes and no campaign, along with a formal structure to regulate the process, can help provide a single point of coordination to ensure appropriate education and enforcement of electoral laws and help mitigate the risk of foreign interference. The arrogance of the Australian Labor Party is on full display here today. They show that they have no respect for democracy, no respect for the Australian people and their decision. They think that a yes vote for the referendum is such a foregone conclusion. Why would they ever need to give any respect to the other sides of the argument? Just like in 2019, when they were practically measuring the curtains, they were so sure of a win, Labor's arrogance and pride will be their downfall. I was reminded of one of Paul Keating's quotes before he entirely lost the plot on fight back. He said of John Houston's policy, if you don't understand it, don't, for, don't vote for it, and if you do understand it, you'd never vote for it. So I say to those opposite, if you don't give the Australian people a chance to understand the voice and the referendum that they're voting on, then you are sorely mistaken if you think they are going to vote for it. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Senator Antic. Thank you. Uh, this government loves nothing more than signalling virtue about the uh, importance of countering so-called disinformation, or is it misinformation? I get confused. The reason for this is that they view anything which contradicts the left-wing talking points, such as the identity politics narrative or the need for the welfare state, as disinformation, or is it misinformation? We're still trying to find that out. Of the 44 referenda that have been put uh, on the Australian Constitution during uh, this country's history, only eight have succeeded. The last successful questions were put in 1977 relating to voters in territories being allowed to vote in referenda, age limits for judges and the question of casual Senate vacancies. Labor has not proposed a successful referendum since 1946. 
It's the only time they succeeded in changing the constitution. Now, it's no wonder that Labor now seeks to use every opportunity to change the rules to suit their style of telling the Australian people what to think and how to vote. Now, this bill seeks at its heart to fundamentally remove safeguards in the Referendum uh, Machinery Provisions Act to ensure that referenda are conducted with informed voters and with integrity. Under this bill, Labor will get to put their finger on the scales and Australians will pay the ill-gotten price. The bill will determine the settings for how the referendum on an Indigenous voice to Parliament is conducted, but the changes included in this bill will, of course, be used in future referenda as well. Now, it's true that this bill does make a number of what we would describe as non-controversial changes to the Act to bring about the operation of referenda into line with the Commonwealth Electoral Act. And as drafted, though, as currently drafted, there are three issues which really ought to ring alarm bells in, in every Australian. Firstly, that the bill removes the requirement to provide all households with the pamphlet, outlining the, the yes and the no case for changing the constitution. Secondly, the bill doesn't make provision for the official yes and the no campaign organisations, and also the bill does not outline any official funding for these campaigns. But all of that aside, let's drill into what this is really about. This is really about the government's obsession with race-based politics. It's really about saving the government's failing voice to parliament by removing your right to be fairly informed about the true motivation for and the practical outcomes of the proposed race-based division that the voice represents. Now, far from being something that would actually help Indigenous Australians or is even designed to do that, the voice is actually nothing more than a Trojan horse for creating yet another left-wing bureaucracy that, once established, will not be able to be disbanded without another referendum. And we know that the point of these amendments is to facilitate uh, that referendum on the voice. The voice, um, the point of the voice, is actually to have it entrenched in the constitution. Uh, it's it really an underhanded tactic from Labor that serves only the welfare state's interests and promotes more division in our culture at a time where we simply do not need it. There's absolutely no reason why the voice, the so-called voice to Parliament, requires a referendum at all. If the intention behind the voice is to help Indigenous people and alleviate the very real sufferings that many of them face. This could be done without uh, an advisory body and it could be done tomorrow with things like the cashless welfare card that was abolished earlier in the year. As I said, the real agenda here is to brick in a left-wing bureaucracy into the constitution. It's just more jobs for their lefty mates. And preparing, pretending to speak on, uh, in, uh, on behalf of Indigenous people uh, is just not the point. Only this time, uh, this particular body would never be able to be disbanded without a referendum. The swamp won't be able to be drained. That's another way of putting it. We will not drain the swamp without another referendum, and the Australian people are being led down that path. Now, does the Albanese government already have the changes that it would make in mind, or are Australians going to get what they're being told they'll be voting for? The, the only way to find out um, will be to see the manoeuvres that this government, the Albanese Labor, Labor government, pulls after the referendum. Now, I prefer not to take that risk, given how impossible it would be to, be to undo if it, or difficult, I should say, it would be to undo if it happens. But simply put, Labor is hoping that Australians just simply don't ask too many questions about the voice. Instead, they're relying on being able to call you names if you start asking questions. Names like borderline racist, if you dare to question it. Uh, even if your concern is for the well-being of Indigenous people, which I would suggest almost everybody on this side of the chamber uh, would hold those concerns. The bill seeks to pay lip service to democracy and transparency in the referendum process while removing and meddling with the safeguard processes that are actually there designed to keep referenda clear and honest so that Australians can know the facts and then make up their own mind. In fact, Labor's own explanatory memorandum describes it as a bill to, a bill to quote, ensure a consistent voter experience across elections and referendums. But we know what this is about. It's about greasing the wheels for a major strike on our democracy by way of this voice of parliament. And if the bill passes in its current form, the operation of section 11 of the Act will be suspended for the purposes of the, of the vote, meaning there will be no requirement for the government to distribute information to electors, setting out both the case for and the case against the, uh, the voice. These pamphlets, as they're known, are vital to ensure Australians understand what they're voting for and to understand the long-term consequences to making such a radical change to our constitution, our, foundational, our found, founding document, which underpins the entire system of government and our way of life. 
Uh, these important safeguards on our constitutional amendment process have only been departed from three times since the requirement was introduced in 1912. Firstly, in 1919, when there was insufficient time to produce them, and then in 1926, when there was no agreement on how to produce the yes argument, and then in 1928, when there was overwhelming agreement between the parties and government. Now, none of those, none of those circumstances um, apply today. So one must ask, why is Labor pushing to avoid these important checks and balances? Because they know they can't defend their own position under proper scrutiny. They don't want you to know the detail, and they don't want you to hear the arguments uh, against the voice. The notion that dividing Australians by race in our bureaucracies and asserting that only people of Indigenous descent have a valid opinion about matters pertaining to Indigenous people is, is absurd. Such a notion is hostile to the reason and the words of civil rights leader Dr Martin Luther King, who, as we all know, famously said that he hoped for a world in which his grandchildren would not be judged by the colour of their skin but by the content of their character. Talk about missing the point. Labor, but actively trying to hide the, Labor actively trying to hide this from the Australian people. They don't want you to know about or question that when it comes to the very real and serious issues that face Indigenous people, such as incarceration rates, low, low, lower life expectancy, alcoholism, drug addiction, unemployment, homelessness, suicide and so on, that the voice of government will not have a positive impact on any of those, any of those uh, issues. They don't want you asking what new departments will be established or what welfare policies enacted or advertising campaigns be undertaken that haven't already been tried. They don't want you to know that the welfare state approach to these issues simply isn't working. They don't want you to query and they don't want to query why the government is, taking swift, is not taking swift and practical action on tackling these problems rather than engaging in more semantic rhetoric. The voice is a Trojan horse for a bureaucracy. We won't be able to curb or we won't be able to disband even though its powers and functions are subject to change. Either way, it's more jobs and more taxpayers' money for the unelected. They just want you to think that you're borderline racist if you oppose them. All that's happening here is the government making an advisory body for itself and claiming that it will serve Indigenous interests. It's a very convenient way of appearing to do something to help end Indigenous suffering while actually not achieving that goal. The voice members are only going to echo the same old left-wing talking points designed to trash Australia's heritage and divide. So, it's my position that this chamber should oppose, uh, oppose the bill. I ask you to do the same. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I too rise today to contribute to the debate on the Referendum Machinery Amendment Bill 2022. Constitutional change, no matter how minuscule, must be carefully considered, must, but must also be based on extensive research and consultation. The Coalition worked hard to promote electoral change and update related legislation in a measured and balanced manner during its term, but we knew any reforms made would pave the way for future changes. Australia's Referendum Act has not been used since 1999 and, as a result, has not kept pace with the successive changes we have made to the Electoral Act. As a member of the JSCIM committee at the time, I was involved in the inquiry into the 2019 federal election and I'm also familiar with the committee's 2013 and 2016 inquiries. Recommendations from these inquiries resulted in numerous changes to the Electoral Act and this bill will extend those changes within a referendum context. Recent electoral reform includes changes to the way elections are conducted during emergencies, which proved necessary for elections conducted at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Changes were also made to the electoral authorisations required on material produced by political parties and entities, as well as foreign interference via donations. These reforms were developed to retain public trust in our electoral process and strengthen electoral legislation. And now it is time to reform the Referendum Act and bring it into the 21st century. Changes proposed in this bill modernise postal voting and vote sorting and counting in re referendums by bringing the Referendum Act in line with the same processes and efficiencies around federal elections introduced by the former coalition government. Bill reforms proposed here also increase transparency by updating authorisation requirements and amending financial disclosure and foreign donation restriction frameworks. Additionally, contingency measures have been incorporated to modify some aspects of referenda if held during a declared emergency. However, when the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters held the inquiry into this bill, it was rushed to completion over Christmas and the New Year, the short time frame of just weeks. 
made it difficult for members and stakeholders to scrutinise witnesses and the proposed legislation. In its submission to the committee inquiry, national representative organisation Blind Citizens Australia said this bill was introduced without consulting those within the blind and vision impaired community. Further, the submission noted only two weeks were allowed for consultation on this legislation, and the organisation said, and I quote, we believe this failure to consult risks risks disenfranchising our community and excludes our voices from the electoral process during a potentially, potentially once in a generation vote of nation shaping consequence. End quote. On top of the concern about the short consultation period, Blind Citizens Australia pointed out the lack of technology assisted voting options outlined within the bill, like human assisted telephone voting, which has been available for voting in federal elections for the past decade. Additionally, there is no provision for voters who are blind or vision impaired to request a postal ballot in a braille or large print format. Legislation like we're discussing here now presents an opportunity for us, as policy makers, to create laws that meet the voting needs of all Australians. We must not rush such important change. We should be conducting a proper consultation process to ensure all vo voices are heard. The Coalition has raised three major points with the Labor government about this bill, which we believe will address our concerns on the proposed referendum process. These points are simple but important. We ask the government to provide an information pamphlet that outlines the cases for yes and no, establish official yes and no campaign organisations and appropriately and equally fund those organisations. These three measures are fundamental to a referendum where the electorate is informed and they will contribute to a process that has integrity. Those of us who have participated in referenda before will remember it was these points that formed the basis on which they operated, and it is this process we understand. Section 11 of the current Referendum Act requires an official pamphlet containing arguments for and against the referendum proposal be prepared and distributed to households by the Electoral Commission at least 14 days before the voting day. This requirement was first introduced in 1912, more than 100 years ago. And as you have heard from earlier speakers, there have only been three occasions since 1912 where a referendum was held with no information pamphlet issued. And they were in 1919, 1926 and 1928. So from this we can conclude, Australians have received information pamphlets at all referenda held since 1928. Such a document is even mentioned in the AEC's fact sheet explaining the referendum process, stating, and I quote, the Australian Electoral Commission prints and distributes an information leaflet to voters outlining the proposed alterations and the yes and no cases, end quote. Referendum pamphlets are consistent with Australians' expectations. So why would we not proceed on the same basis for this and future referendums? I welcome the recent announcement by the Labor government to restore the yes-no information pamphlet. Such a pamphlet will give all Australians an official source of information on the question being asked at the referendum and is an important step in countering misinformation. Indeed, Professor Anne Tuomi Ao, who has worked as a solicitor, a parliamentary researcher and as secretary to the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee, told the committee inquiry that not allowing information pamphlets to be produced would create a vacuum for misinformation and a free-for-all on the internet, encouraging bizarre views out there being given some kind of level of legitimacy. These comments came from someone who has practised law, who has worked within our Senate committee system and is an expert in constitutional law, so arguably understands the legal and so social implications of such decisions well. The Coalition is also concerned about the government's decision not to create official yes and no campaign entities. Again, this has been standard practice during past referenda, so why change something we understand? Official campaign entities reduce the chance of proxy organisations claiming they are official bodies during the campaign, like we've already seen multiple times in public media coverage of this referendum. This situation calls the integrity of the referendum process into question, which detracts from the debate about the actual issue. Additionally, official campaigns provide a starting point for the AEC in its coordination of education for those participating in the referendum campaign. 
The government's decision not to provide public funding for either the yes or no campaign risks creating a situation where there is a dependence on private funding from those with vested interests. Obviously, interested parties could dominate debate for their chosen campaign, colouring public discourse on the topic and compromising the quality and reliability of information shared. Drawing on Professor Twomey's expertise again, she explains, and I quote, if voters are to be fully informed before they vote in either a referendum or an election, they need transparency about who is funding relevant campaigns. Providing that information well after the referendum is held is really shutting the stable door after the horse has already bolted." End quote. We want Australian voters to be able to make informed decisions when they come to cast their vote, and this is not or less possible with multiple disparate campaigns rather than one official campaign for yes and another for no. It has been more than 20 years since Australia's last referendum. Given this circumstance and that this will be the first referendum for a generation of voters, we support the government's plan to run a community education campaign ahead of the vote. However, the coalition is mindful of the Institute of Public Affairs analysis of the bill, which finds it is unbalanced and favours the yes case and that's before campaigning has even begun properly. The Institute warns the bill would mean the federal government will use the notion of misinformation to control the public debate, which must not happen. This is not hallmark of a democratic referendum. In their joint media release from 1 December 2022, four of our government ministers justified changes that would temporarily lift a funding restriction in the Act to enable funding of education initiatives to counter misinformation. But this is ambiguous. What constitutes misinformation on this issue? The government has not provided a definition in this context, which opens up debate around the need for both sides having one official campaign and equal funding. Supporting an amendment to restore the referendum information pamphlet is one thing, but we cannot support a bill that doesn't have a plan for how to properly regulate donations and foreign interference, or most importantly, an outline of how the referendum conduct will be scrutinised. As my colleague Senator McGrath said when speaking to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters report on this bill, it does contain sensible and constructive changes. But it is clear that the government has put forward other changes that are not in the interest of an informed and robust process for conducting a referendum. The coalition has been asking the Prime Minister and his government for basic detail on the voiced, just so we can understand how this proposal works. We all want to see an improved situation for Indigenous Australians, but how do we actually know this proposal will do that when we don't have the detail? But don't take my word for that. Surveys repeatedly show Australians want detail too. Week after week for months now, we've heard reports of confusion around this upcoming referendum on The Voice. People are wondering what The Voice actually means and, more importantly, what The Voice will mean for them. Australians deserve basic detail to help them make an informed decision about such an important constitutional matter. Disinformation is rife right now, with scammers pretending to be a child in trouble and preying on parents and asking for money, while others are taking advantage of the housing crisis to fleece people out of hard-earned money with the promise of a rental property if they stump up a sizeable deposit. At a time when it's hard to know who we can trust, the government must provide the detail we are asking for ahead of a national referendum. We must have clear information on this issue for the referendum process to be a strong one. In relation to the proposed voice, Opposition Leader Peter Dutton MP has directly asked the Prime Minister to advise Australians the answers to 15 questions. And more than 17, and, and the answer to those questions must be, must be forthcoming. More than $75 million was set aside in the 2022-23 budget to prepare for the delivery of a referendum to enshrine a First Nations voice to Parliament in the Constitution over the next two years. But what has been done to give Australians the answers they seek about this referendum? The bill before us today, however, relates to the legislative framework of this and future referenda. There are a number of amendments that have been proposed for this legislation, showing the significant impact it will have in determining the outcome of future referenda and demonstrates the significance placed by all sides of the political divide to getting it right. I acknowledge the government has already decided to restore the pamphlet to outline the yes and no case. 
At a minimum, they should now also agree to establish official yes and no campaign organisations and appropriately fund those official organisations. As the bill currently stands, I will not be supporting the measures contained in, within the Referendum Machinery Amendment Bill 2022. Thank you. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise to make a contribution to the Referendum Machinery Amendment Bill 2022. And there's really two points that I want to make, which I'll flag up front. Firstly, is the importance of conducting changes, uh, proposed changes to our constitution via referendum in an utterly impartial, uh, fair, transparent way that the Australian people can have con confidence in. And secondly, is taking appropriate steps to mitigate the very serious risks of potential foreign interference in the upcoming referendum, which relates particularly to my portfolio responsibilities. On the first point, there are a few more consequential things that we will vote for in this parliament and that the public will be asked to consider than changes to our constitution. Uh, elections in this country are, of course, significant. Uh, the choice of who governs this country and the policies which they implement and the majorities which they may or may not have in, in the parliament are enormously significant. But if the public feels they get that wrong, uh, there's always an opportunity to revisit it in two and a half or three years later. And by and large, our country is uh, well governed uh, and uh, strongly supported democracy. And the changes of power that we had between the parties is done uh, peacefully, uh, without acrimony, and life goes on. Uh, the consequences of getting an election wrong and electing a political party with a bad program can quickly be remedied. Changing the constitution is much more fundamental than that. And this constitution, uh, constitutional change proposed by the government is a very far-reaching potential change to the way in which we govern ourselves. And the changes, if they're agreed to by the public, will have ramifications for years, if not decades, if not centuries to come. Uh, long after we are all gone from this place, long after it is forgotten what we do in terms of legislation we pass or policies we enact, it's likely that this change to the constitution, if agreed to, will remain in place and will have impacts on the way our country is governed that we here today can't yet anticipate. Given the gravity of that change, given the uh, almost zero likelihood that the public would uh, change their mind on that and reverse it, it is more important than any other decision the public is asked to make that they do so within a framework which is utterly impartial and transparent and agreed upon and freed from controversy. Uh, it would be my hope that, regardless of whatever our, each of our positions ultimately are on this substantive question put to the people, that we are able to put to them a system for making that decision, a framework for making that decision which we all agree with, which we all have confidence in, which we all can say with sincerity there are no issues with. Uh, as it currently stands, as proposed by the government, I don't think it passed that test. And certainly for at least uh, a significant proportion of this chamber, we will not be able to go hand in heart to the Australian people and say, as it stands, uh, that the process for making this decision is impartial, is fair, is untainted uh, by any perceptions of bias or aiding one case or the other. It is a good thing that the government has made the concession that they have already to restore the yes or no pamphlet, but it is a bit troubling that government speakers in this debate have framed this as a concession, like it is a magnanimous uh, action which they didn't want to take but they are, they've been forced to take uh, through the negotiation process, when actually it should just be reviewed as uh, putting forward the normal processes of a referenda and the normal uh, policies that are in place to facilitate a referenda. There's nothing exceptional about continuing to provide a pamphlet outlining the yes or no cases. And it was illustrative that so many disparate groups within the uh, joint committee process inquiring into this bill recommended that this be restored after the government tried to remove it. Um, but uh, as you've heard in this debate from other coalition speakers, we're, we're not satisfied with this concession as it stands. And we do believe it is necessary, as it has often been the case in referendum, at the very least to restore official yes and no campaigns and also to fund those campaigns so that they can communicate with the public uh, about their message and deliver a fair uh, uh, contest in this upcoming debate. Um, history is instructive here. Uh, the last time that the Labor Party in government successfully proposed a change to our constitution was 1946. Uh, that was also the last time that the Liberal Party supported a Labor government uh, attempt to change the constitution. 
On every other instance since, when the Labor Party has proposed a change to the constitution, it has failed, and the coalition and opposition has opposed it. Uh, if the Labor Party wants to guarantee that this referendum is like all of those and that it fails, uh, then putting forward a bill for a, a process that is not fair, um, that is not impartial, is one way to guarantee that that also happens. Uh, history is also instructive when you think about the most recent previous attempt of the Labor Party to change the constitution. Uh, it was in 2013 and it related to re the recognition of local government in our constitution. And in that debate, uh, the Labor Party quite openly in government tried to put a thumb on the scales of that referendum to aid one side or the other. Now, it's one thing for government ministers and members and senators to campaign in favour of a change to the constitution. They're perfectly entitled to do so. But it's another thing entirely to set up a lopsided process that favours one side over the other. And in the proposed local government referendum, which was abandoned because of a lack of bipartisan support and was never put to the people, the government proposed public funding uh, in the yes and no cases of $10 million for the yes case and $500,000 for the no case. Uh, they thought that was justified based on what they assessed to be the support in the community uh, and in the parliament for that change. And they didn't want to uh, give the no case uh, significant resources to push back and to contest that campaign. I think Australians saw that for what it was and the parliament saw that for what it was. And it was one of the reasons why support for that referendum was withdrawn by the coalition and why it was never put to the people, because it would have failed. It's instructive to remember who the relevant minister was who made that decision. Uh, because, of course, the, member, the Minister for Local Government at the time was a Mr Albanese. And it was him who devised and publicly defended and articulated the rationale for an unfair, uh, for a bias, for a lopsided public funding model in that referendum. I hope that the government, of which he now leads, of which he is the now the Prime Minister, is not trying to do the same with this referendum uh, by less transparent means. Because, of course, we do know that the government plans to spend public money on a public education campaign. Uh, I hope that it will be rigorously impartial and fair and won't side one case or the other, but forgive me for wanting to see it before I'm assured of that. Uh, and, of course, the government has awarded already tax deductible status to one side of the debate and not the other. Now, I hope it's the case that the people associated with the No campaign are able to give an equal access to that tax deductibility uh, when they are able to apply for it. I hope it is granted. Uh, but even if it is granted, the Yes case has had the advantage of many months of being able to raise tax deductible funds to uh, facilitate their campaign, uh, and the No case has not had that equal opportunity. Uh, so it does look to me like the government is again trying to put the thumb on the scale. And I just urge them to reconsider that if their objective is for this to succeed and if their objective is this to, be, to uh, occur without rancour or conjecture. Because I think there's a very high risk that if they continue to proceed with a lopsided, biased uh, process, that the public will react very strongly to that, as they should. Turning to the second uh, question, and, and that is the question of the risk of foreign interference. Um, this upcoming referendum campaign, uh, as we know, uh, as the Attorney General himself has said, does run the risk of foreign interference. Uh, foreign interference probably won't be generated in this campaign because a foreign government has a particular interest in one side or the other prevailing, but instead because there are foreign governments and potential adversaries of Australia who seek to profit from in division within our society and seek to exacerbate existing tensions within our society as a means of undermining social cohesion, as a means of undermining our national unity, as a means of doing harm to our democratic institutions in the eyes of the public. Uh, we have seen all around the world attempts to do this, uh, both uh, through cyber-enabled means and other means, in recent years. And the most recent case study that we have is from Canada. We leaked documents from the Canadian Intelligence Agency uh, sets out pretty clearly what was the Chinese Communist Party's objectives of intervening in previous Canadian elections. Most interesting, I thought, from those leaked documents is the assessment of the Canadian intelligence community, that the outcome that the Chinese government most preferred was not just the re-election of the Trudeau government, but the re-election of the Trudeau government in minority. And a, comp and a comment was attributed uh, to a Chinese government official as part of that intelligence assessment that, quote, we like it when parties are fighting between each other as if division and discord and disagreement are an objective and an end in of itself for our potential adversaries. Um, it's very important that we don't allow this referendum to become a vehicle for that. And there is a risk that it will become so unless we put in place appropriate measures to mitigate against that threat and guard against that threat. 
And one of the three requests of the coalition to the government, in particular, to, to re-establish and restore the official yes and no cases, is very important uh, to mitigating that threat. Um, I've been in discussions with a number of uh, tech companies, uh, including the, the major global platforms. And uh, while protecting the, the confidence of those conversations and without attributing this to any one company in particular, the, the point was made to me that their task in contemplating this upcoming referendum of dealing with misinformation that will no doubt arise and disinformation that may be deliberately and maliciously placed by foreign states as an attempt to divide us, that one thing that they would rely on to combat that and to help inform the public uh, is to be able to point to official authoritative sources of information that are reliable and do represent uh, the opinions of uh, leaders of the community uh, in conducting these campaigns. And it would assist them greatly if there were an official yes case, an official no case, which they can point to. Because in the absence of that, they're put in the difficult position to have to make those decisions themselves and draw those distinctions themselves and draw themselves into a domestic political debate of which they have no particular interest and do not want to get involved quite appropriately. So if we don't provide an official yes or no case that they can link to uh, when disinformation uh, surfaces in our system, that they can direct uh, Australians to who are searching for information, then they won't have that, one, that authoritative source to rely on and they'll have to uh, do that by other means, which involves them making compromising values-based judgments about the merits of arguments being made in a domestic political context. I think the last thing any Australian should want is to put big tech companies headquartered in Silicon Valley in the position of deciding what are the limits of acceptable public debate in an Australian referendum, what constitutes misinformation or disinformation, because they are inherently values-based judgments. I think Australians will make uh, the right decision considering all the information presented to them, and we should facilitate their ability to do so by providing those official sources of information that they can rely on, and so they can easily weed out those sources of, of disinformation that might be provided to them. So I really do sincerely hope the government reconsiders this, because I think as it is, uh, this is on a path uh, to being very rancorous, uh, to being uh, hotly disputed, to being open to foreign state uh, disinformation and interference. And none of us, regardless of our view on the substantive issue of which we differ and, and good people of sincere uh, values come to different conclusions on that, none of us will be proud at the end of the process if what we have facilitated is a debate which, which descends in this way and which undermines our social cohesion or our national unity. So I really urge the government to reconsider the pathway they are on, to consider the reasonable requests that the coalition has put. Um, it is not an outrageous request to say that there should be a yes and no case um, and that it should be appropriately funded, and I hope they consider doing so. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I stand on talk on this matter. As part of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, we had an inquiry over the January period on the bill, and I think it does a lot right. I think there is some harmonisation with the electoral processes that is uh, well and truly needed. I think that some of the amendments that have been foreshadowed probably go a step too far in trying to lead the electoral process. I think we should harmonise wherever we can. And I think there are some great changes that I support are coming up in amendments, but they are things I would like to see first in the Electoral Act before the machinery referendum. The problem with going this late on the speaking list is all the good things have already been said, so I'll uh, have to make a bit of making up. But I like constitutional change. I like the option of it. I like the idea of a country being able to have referenda to change its document. I quote a uh, couple of uh, previous Prime Ministers. The Constitution is not an unchangeable tablet of stone, but a living document responsive to changing conditions and need by Sir Robert Menzies. And then, quite topical at the moment, the Constitution is a reflection of our values and aspirations as a nation. It should be changed when those values and aspirations change, by Paul Keating, who is in and out of favour, depending upon the day. But this, I would like to see a referendum uh, machinery that is fit for all purpose, not just one that we're changing for this referendum. A referendum uh, position and, and going through constitutional change where we aren't fearful of losing the referendum, we're joyous of being able to put the question to the Australian people and for them to have a say in an informed and considered way. And ultimately, that is where I have a problem where this bill comes down in the end and why the dissenting report from the coalition speakers in the inquiry. It is that there is 
I think Senator Patterson put it interestingly, a thumb on the scale. It's not seen as a fair fight. There is seen as some advantage in starving resources uh, from the constitutional question this time. And to me, that doesn't work in longevity. I think we want people to walk into the light knowing what they're talking about, knowing what the consequences are. This isn't a blind date. You don't go in hoping it goes well and then getting unintended consequences. And in Australia, we've had not a lot of luck with uh, constitutional reform, and we haven't had a lot of unintended consequences before that. But around the world, I noticed in, of all places, Bolivia in 2009, a new constitution came in. And it gave one of the things was there was a lot more rights to Indigenous people that had been suppressed for some time. It ended up in violence. It ended up with uh, significant problems because it wasn't well considered. It wasn't gone through. It was put in as part of a whole new constitution. But the Australians, we as a nation, everyone here, needs to take a more considered, open and considered thing to these changes. And as I said, I wish there was more often. I think I would wish the government had no stigma to putting forward things in this parliament and being considered and getting it wrong. And no, we don't want that. I'd like to see some work on property rights. So not just Marbo, the vibe, the castle thing comes through, but um, not real property, but the real property rights. When we're talking about taking productive lands, the right for that, uh, for transmission lines, for electronically things, when we're talking about e-zones over farmers' lands and not fairly compensating that, I'd like to see constitutional questions there. Maybe on debt levels. I'm not all these sorts of things that are open, that things we can do as a country more, just put them up, have them every now and then, go through the process. And this bill, I don't think, is fit for having a long-term lifespan as the way we hold referenda. I think it is a short-term, beneficial uh, thing seen in light of just one referendum, and that is for the voice. And I don't want to get into the politics of that because that shouldn't influence whether you support the change of the referendum or not, it should be the bill by itself. And when you get you know, a knowledge that a lot of corporate Australia and their ESG plans, a lot of sporting bodies, a lot of this will come out on one side of where this referendum question, to starve the other side of resource seems a little exploitive, seems a little opportunistic, and that is not good because we need to be safe with our changes. We can't have unexpected consequences. A real strange soliloquy. I was with my son going for his L's on the weekend, and he gets 50 questions, and you can only get two wrong. And luckily for him, he sat through the whole thing and got the last question as the second one wrong, so he failed on question 50. And it seemed a little bit unfair, but then you think he's about to be on the road, he's about to have people's, you want him to be safe. You know, if I ever got 48 out of 50 in the test, I'd be pretty stoked because I was never that smart. But he got that and failed. And this is the same with our constitution. We want it to be safe. We want it to be informed. We want to go through. And one of the great uh, sorrows I see in this process is, without a greater clarity on what the question is, what a greater, without greater clarity on how it will be implemented, where we're taking things of taking away the funding of giving people knowledge on what will happen, it isn't a safe process. It is a process set for an outcome, and that is not fair. I think that as we go through and we look at all of the issues one by one on the amendments, I am in personally in love with uh, Senator Pocock's exclusion amendment, having to probably spend this Saturday on a polling booth at Monero for a state election, come back sunburnt, angry and either happy or unhappy on Monday. I love that amendment, but again, it is too soon for that. I think as we went through the Joint Standing Committee process, and it's been mentioned by others, again, I'll repeat the, the turning point for me on the pamphlet. I saw so much real benefit. I was swayed between the use of new technology to disseminate information. I was really interested in, yeah, that's right. Not, but the testimony for me was the Australian Electoral Commission saying that in their report, 40 per cent of their respondents find the electoral booklet as their primary source of information for the electorate. That was, and uh, it is a normal part. It's been included. I thank you for that uh, change to bring, bring that back in because even if it's not the majority, even if their numbers are fudged a bit, a significant number of people will feel better about that. When we come to how we go through a process, how we show up, 
the concerns raised again by the previous speaker about foreign interference. There is a specific purpose, and again, I don't think it's to influence the outcome of this, but to cause division. We are at a time in our country where people are looking at the next year, look two years, looking at their finances, looking at their life, looking at what's going on. We are consistently turning up uh, potential conflict around um, uh, the region that's being spoken of. We've got a war in Ukraine. People are worried about a lot of things, and so it doesn't take a lot to trigger disunity, disharmony, exploitation. Someone's getting what I haven't got. And if we were better funded, if we had better provisions to protect Australians from having a go at one another, that would be a great thing. This will be a, all constitutional changes can be emotional. It's changing this country we've built over 100 years and the, the rules on which we are. Some for the better, some for the potentially for the worse. Obviously, they don't get up if they're for the worse, but we need more clarity. We need better vision. We need a better process so that people don't go, oh, we didn't know. Because as hard as it is to get a, a constitutional change up through a referendum, it is harder to get it undone. And that's what we're there. If we look at a medical view, do no harm. We talk lots of things of that. And my fear is on this, by having this, if this is the referendum model that now works, that we starve one side of resource, it becomes the norm. That would be a horrible thing for our country. What potentially could be worse is if it doesn't get up because it's seen to be weighted. What does that do to the, the, the conversation in our nation about bringing more things forward? What does it do for people that you know, had their heart and soul in this? And I think it's a management process in any election. I manage campaigns, I, I ran them. When you can show that something's not fair, when you can show something's loaded against them, people get their head up. We have spent in this building years having a go at one another, negative advertising. We're talking about that at JSCAN. We're talking about all these things, truth in advertising. We invest so much money and time ourselves making the public doubt us, to think less of us, to be worse about our public processes. And this will feed directly into that narrative. I would love a time uh, where, personally, the conversation about uh, Fact-finding and, and the South Australian model of truth and advertising is there where facts are wrong, but there's so many ways around it. If I want to make an accusation, have you seen Candidate A's got a criminal record? But I'll just get around that. Do you know if Candidate A has a criminal record? I'll ask a question. I won't make it a fact. There are ways around it, and we need to do better. We can't go complaining about the way this parliament and government and politicians are held, why referendums are held, if we keep being non-genuine, if we keep doing things in our own interest. I think a great change would be any political advertisement can only mention you or your candidates or your policies, where you can't have a go at anyone else. It is clearly something that makes it a lot harder to put negative ads. And that is something, when we're talking about some of the amendments, again, the changes to, uh, I think Senator Pocock's got something on a fact tour of the booklet or a fact finder of the booklet. Whose facts, where are they? And, Facts are only when you say 32 per cent of people or numbers or stats are running. It doesn't cover that opinion, that grey area. So we've got to do more work on that. Constitutions are great again. I would encourage we do more of them. It's a time for people to have a greater say in the long-term future of their country on things that can't be done by political will. But I think this bill needs to be constructed in a way that is fit for purpose for the long term, and this doesn't do it. So therefore, we can't support it. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the government's referendum machinery amendment bill uh, 2022. I'm just checking the date because it is now 2023. Um, this bill will determine the settings for how the referendum on an Indigenous voice to parliament is conducted. But it should be noted, and the coalition is of no doubt, that the changes included in this bill could be used for future referenda. So it is absolutely critical that we get this right. It is no small issue when a government calls for the people of this country to vote on a referendum on our constitution, whatever that proposal may be. In due course, 
Australians will get the chance to have their vote and have their say on the proposal that the government puts forward for that referendum. Changing our nation's constitution is always a very serious matter. And that's why it's so important that the ground rules that govern each and every referendum are fair and are balanced and give Australians the best possible chance and opportunity to fully understand the proposition that is being put forward so that they can cast their vote accordingly. We in this place cannot set a precedent in relation to referenda that it is acceptable or normal for the government of the day to set ground rules that favour a preferred side. The principle that both the yes and the no sides are able to operate from a level playing field is vital in ensuring Australians who have the duty to decide on any changes to our constitution, the duty and the privilege, can make an informed decision. If a position put to the Australian people deserves to receive enough support to successfully pass, then it should be able to achieve that support without getting an unfair leg up from the government of the day. That's why it is so important that in setting the machinery of this referendum, it proceeds in a way that we can all agree is fair and we can all agree is reflective of the way that future referenda should be operated. This is not just about the referendum that we will have at the end of this year. It is also about the potential for future referendum later in this parliament. It is an obvious point to make. Uh, that we don't know what those future questions may be that could be put to the Australian people regarding constitutional change. Many people who vote yes in this referendum might find themselves voting no in a future one and vice versa. So it's in nobody's interest for a precedent to be um, established that either a yes case or a no case is advantaged or disadvantaged by the rules. That is why the opposition doesn't support this bill in its current form. And while other speakers from the coalition have spoken to the issues that we have with this bill, I do want to reiterate some of my uh, concerns and some of those concerns more generally with this bill tonight. The opposition has highlighted the following three points with the government, and it is our sincere hope that they will not only take note of our concerns but move to address them. The government must restore the pamphlet to outline the yes and no case. The government must establish official yes and no campaign organisations, and the government must appropriately fund those official organisations. Addressing these three key points are essential if the government hopes to hold a referendum in which voters are empowered to make informed decisions, as well as upholding the integrity of the referendum process. To directly address point one, the opposition welcomes the government announcement that they will restore the pamphlet. It is particularly important that this is the case not just for this referendum but for future referenda, and the same applies to the other points that the opposition has raised in relation to this bill. The establishment of, an official, of official yes and no campaigns, which both start with an equal minimum level of funding so that neither side is denied the opportunity to adequately put their case, is another important standard for all of the referenda we hold in the future. We can't allow a precedent or a habit to be established that suggests from the starting point that there is only one legitimate side to an argument or one legitimate opinion to be expressed, and that uh, goes for referendum as well. Whichever way this referendum goes, it is a fact that there will be millions of Australians who vote yes and there will be millions of Australians who vote no. Advocates and activists and everyday Australians, of course, will debate and discuss and put their views on which way Australians should vote, and, and that is a good thing, Mr Acting Deputy President. That is a vital function of our democracy, that we should be able to have these conversations openly. But the matter for consideration for this parliament, with this bill, is to set fair rules so that each side in the debate can put their case and then each Australian adult can make their own decision and vote. Uh, based on those cases that have been presented and, of course, uh, their own consideration of the views that have been put forward. Of course, as the debate proceeds, we will see a huge number of different opinions and different cases put forward. And like I said, Mr Acting Deputy President, this is a good thing. This is a vital function of our democracy that we are able 
uh, that we live in a society where we are able to put those different views on the record and um, argue the point and, and make our case. But having official campaigns and an official pamphlet means that there is a clear reference point for all Australians to start from informing themselves, doing their own research and forming their own opinion. I think it's um, sometimes easy for us to forget uh, being, being in this place and um, being as engaged in the political process as we all are that not everybody uh, is engaged in that way. And, uh, we have compulsory voting in this country, so um, at some point there is an element of compulsion to make a decision, uh, and so we need to be cognisant of that um, lack of lack of knowledge or lack of engagement and put information into the public sphere so that the people who haven't necessarily been as engaged with um, this particular issue for this referendum or any issue for any referendum uh, are able to get that information and make up for their own minds which way they should vote. You can't have a situation where it's easy to find the official case for one side, but then much harder to find the official case for the other side. And of course, in the um, in age of the internet and of social media, we, there, we know there will be many spurious arguments put out there. And I think this is why having an official pamphlet with an official case put forward by an official campaign for both sides uh, is incredibly important. We need uh, that pamphlet to have the basic resources and that campaign to have the basic resources to put the case um, to ensure that there is always an official source of information for each side that Australians can go back to and review and refresh their memory on exactly what is being proposed before it comes time for them to make their decision about the proposed referendum at the ballot box. It ensures that the centre of the debate is an official document that both campaigns feel put their best argument forward. Uh, because in the absence of having any sort of official campaign documentation, um, I could certainly see a situation where the centre of, um, of, this, uh, of the campaign for this referendum or for any referendum into the future um, is played out on social media, whether that's um, Twitter or TikTok or Facebook or Snapchat or wherever you get your social media from. Um, and yes, that's, that's part of the environment that we're operating in, that's part of our democracy, uh, but we know from elections past that uh, not everything that somebody says on social media is necessarily factual, and we do need to have those single sources of truth for both sides of uh, the referendum debate. Um, and uh, like I said, we, we know that there are um, potential problems with misinformation and there are potential issues with foreign interference. So I certainly encourage the government to consider and adopt the sensible points put forward by the coalition. Um, like I say, conducting a referendum on changing our constitution is no small thing. It is a big decision for Australians to make. It is a decision that uh, Australians my age haven't had to make before. Uh, because we weren't of age when the Republic referendum was conducted. I can just remember that happening when I was uh, nine years old. And so um, I think it's important to recognise that when the uh, Republic referendum occurred, that resources were provided to ensure that Australians could make an educated choice about um, becoming a Republic or not. A yes case was presented, a no case present was presented. Um, and it has been the case in referendum past. And this referendum that we will be approaching towards at the end of the year should be no different. And uh, like I said in my initial remarks, we also have to keep in mind that any decision about the conduct of referenda that we make in this chamber today will impact the conduct of any other potential referenda in the future of this parliament. And so we owe it to ourselves and to the Australian people to provide them with the information that they need to make an educated and informed decision on changing their constitution whenever that might happen, but certainly within the life of this parliament. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak on the Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022. One Nation will support this legislation, which effectively aligns referendum practice with election practice. This is not to be taken as support for the question to be put to the Australian people at the referendum on the voice to parliament proposed by the Labor government. One Nation will be active campaigners for the no vote. We cannot support a race-based voice to parliament. 
We will not support taking the Constitution backward more than 50 years. We will not support giving a minority of Australians more political power based solely on their race. We will not support opening the door to a separate, sovereign, independent black state being established in Australia. We will not support a proposal that, if successful, will expose Australia to a series of constitutional crises that will threaten the supremacy of parliament and make the country ungovernable. We will not support handing over the Government of Australia to the unelected High Court. We will not support allowing activists and the Aboriginal industry to hold parliament and the executive government hostage. The voice of parliament is racism at its very worst. It is effectively a perverse apartheid. And there is not a shred of evidence it will address real Aboriginal disadvantage or close the gaps. In fact, there's every indication that it will only entrench the disadvantaged experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote communities. Yeah. This is because the same leaders of the Aboriginal industry, which have failed to close the gaps over the decades at the cost of hundreds of billions of taxpayer dollars, are the ones eagerly anticipating high-paid, constitutionally protected jobs with the voice. These frauds, who have no experience of the real disadvantage in remote communities, will only keep it going because they have a vested personal interest in doing so. Yeah. They saw what happened with the corrupt money train that was the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. Once the corruption, nepotism and dysfunction of ATSIC became obvious, Parliament wisely abolished it although it took about eight years after I warned the government to get rid of it. They don't want that to happen with the voice, which is why they want to put it into the constitution. Once it's in there, it will be very difficult to remove. <coughs> it is no small thing to change the constitution, and it's critical the Australian people are given all the information they need to make a wise decision. But Labor won't do that because it knows the details of its plan for the voice won't be acceptable to the Australian people. Fortunately, the activists pushing the voice are revealing their true intentions because they are drunk with power and can't help themselves. First, we were told by the Prime Minister that only Parliament would decide the powers of the voice. Since then, members of his own referendum working group have admitted they are looking forward to these powers being decided by the courts. And the same working group can't even decide on the wording of the proposed constitutional amendment or the question to be put to the Australians at the referendum. It's indicative of the wider division within Aboriginal Australia being caused by this proposal to forever separate our nation by race. And while the Prime Minister claims there will be no public funding for the yes or no cases, we know he's stacking the odds in favour of the voice with bucket loads of taxpayer money. Only donations to the yes campaigns have received tax deductible status. More than $30 million has been budgeted to establish local and regional versions of the voice. And we're yet to see exactly how much this referendum will cost taxpayers, let alone the voice itself. This is why I foreshadowed that I will move the second reading amendment circulated on sheet 1857. We will note that referendums held separately from federal elections cost the Australian people more than holding them in conjunction with elections. And we will call on the government to hold the coming referendum at the next election. Yeah. I remind this government it must at all times always look for sensible ways to save money, and this amendment requires the government to do precisely that, let alone the indication that's come today that the Australian taxpayers may have to pull back on what they can claim in their tax so in order to save the government money. So those hard-working Australians, you're going to have to miss out on getting some tax um, deductions back. 
while the government spend very loosely with the money. It's also why we must have a compre comprehensive audit of all the taxpayer funds thrown at Aboriginal land councils and corporations and just why they've failed Aboriginal communities. This is not the first time I have raised this. I have been raising it for years and years and years, and we know for a fact there's about $33 billion of taxpayers' funds that goes into the Aboriginal industry. And it's averaged about $44,000 is paid to every Aboriginal, whereas only $22,000 is allocated for every other Australian or thereabouts. So you see, it's not about money. There has been money. It's about keeping these people in the poverty and the conditions that they are in, in remote communities mainly. Because you see, the majority of the people who claim to be Aboriginal, no real definition. Anyone can jump on the bandwagon from one census to the next and increase at 24 per cent. So it's, it's, they believe there's about 850,000 claimed to be Aboriginal at this stage, an increase of 24 per cent to the last census. Yet the increase in Australian population was only 8 per cent. Does anyone question that? Are you interested? Or is it easy just to jump up and down and say, I'm claiming Aboriginal status with no true definition to it? No wonder a lot of the Aboriginals themselves are fed up with the whole system. And they see people abusing it and claiming Aboriginality when they are not because of the benefits paid out by the governments. And that's quite obvious with $33 billion a year for approximately 850,000 people who claim Aboriginality. And it's based on race, not on means tested, Race. We have aged pensioners, you've got to pass the means test. We have people on NDS, you've got to pass the test. We have disability pensions, you've got to pass the means test. But we don't do this for, for this race-based um, voice that we're wanting to introduce in this parliament. When we talk about this referendum, which I have stated and I'll be moving an amendment to it, in the referendum should be held at election time, a game saving about $100 million. And we are talking about wanting to buy you know, submarines that is going to cost us billions, over hundreds of billions of dollars, and we're talking about how we're going to pay for it. Well, let's, let's get rid of the tax cuts to, to those hard-working Australians, those ones who are truly struggling. So that's the way to pay for this. It's not about reining reining in the government spending and the money that's been wasted through NDIS government programs and also you know, $100 million for Aboriginal communities to do with climate change, of all things. Climate change, $100 million. Let's throw another $100 million out for a referendum when we can have it at the next election. No, because it suits yourselves to have it at a time that you know you've got more chance of getting it up. You don't care about saving the taxpayers' dollars, no, but you, you'll be looking at pulling back on them getting their tax relief. I don't know if you really understand how hard people are doing out there, how many people are going to lose their homes, how many people are suffering. People can't even go to the doctors anymore, they can't afford it. Even their prescriptions, they can't afford it. They cut back on their food, they can't afford it. And if we pass that, and if referendums are held during election, the saving to the Australian taxpayers, that's what we're here for, to ensure that the taxpayers' monies is accounted for. But there's no accountability in this place for bad decisions, for nothing, for ministers who are useless in the positions that they hold, the portfolios that they deal with. They have no idea, no understanding, no one's held accountable. But you pass laws in this place all the time where you are ensuring that directors of companies, everyone else, are held accountable with jail terms, fines, heavy fines, and yet you don't do it for yourselves. You can make decisions in this place, but no one's held accountable. There's another thing I will be moving is the citizens initiated referenda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's been a policy of mine since 1997 of One Nations. And this is about true democracy. It's about really giving the power back to the people to have a say in something that, if it's that important to them, they will make the effort to sign a petition. 
whereas 2 per cent of electors must sign a petition and then that is, that is overseen by the Australian Electoral Commission by 50 per cent has to be investigated that they are eligible to actually be on that petition. So we don't have people from overseas or people in the country who are using false names and uh, just to get on the petition. So it is overseen to make sure that we do have eligible people who are actually signing the petition. And that, that petition then comes to the parliament. And it's up to the parliament then to decide whether they accept that petition and do something about it. If not, then it automatically goes to the next election as a referendum. So you're giving the people the opportunity if they are, want to insert or remove anything in their constitution, they have a right to have a voice and put it to the parliament. Yeah. There is a lot of things that the people want to say and want changes done. It's not all about policy when it comes to elections of what you or we, the members of parliament or political parties want to do. The people should have a right to have a voice. This will give them that opportunity if there is something that is really concerning them. Isn't that what democracy is about? Isn't it what this chamber is about? representing the people of this nation. So when I put up that second reading amendment, I hope that you consider it wisely to give some power back to the people. It's not the first one ever to happen. New Zealand has it and other countries around the world have this referendum. It's called the Citizens Initiated Referenda. If you're really truly interested, go and read up on it. And then if you do vote for it, it will mean, show me, and the people of Australia, you really care about giving them a voice that they don't have. So I note and commend the notice of the motion to this effect proposed by senators who can be assured it will receive enthusiastic support from One Nation. Thank you. Remember Bill of 2022. Uh, before I go to the details of the bill, I think it's important just to reflect for a minute on what it is this bill pertains to, and it pertains to changing Australia's constitution. Uh, and that is not something that we should do lightly, uh, because of the role of the constitution in making Australia one of the most stable, prosperous, and multicultural and united uh, democratic nations in the world. It is a huge achievement and the constitution plays a large part in that. And so any proposal to change it should make sure that we have good governance, uh, processes that do due diligence and inform people uh, appropriately. In fact, the Australian Constitution Centre uh, highlights as part of their campaign to educate people about the Constitution the six principles that the Constitution uh, has underpinning it. And it says that the six foundation principles are democracy, the rule of law, the separation of powers, federalism, nationhood, and rights balanced by responsibilities. They go on to say that the daily processes within the institutions of government should always be in the public interest and the principles which underpin the constitution interact with each other providing checks and balances. They protect the things we value as a community such as a fair go, religious tolerance and the freedom of political communication. So what powers does the minister have? Who keeps him or her within those powers? How are issues resolved within state and federal governments? What are your rights and who's defend them? What are your responsibilities uh, as citizens of Australia? And two last points they make. How do we develop as a nation? And what is a parliamentary representative democracy? So these are the key principles and these are the purposes of them as outlined by the Australian Constitution Centre. And I think it's important that we keep that in mind as we discuss this machinery bill, because what we're talking about is the integrity of a process that will change the document which is at the foundation of Australia's success 
as a modern, multicultural, plural, liberal democracy, where people with different views and backgrounds can come together and have respectful debate and work as a nation to drive prosperity and inclusion for all people. And that's something we have done successfully as a nation to date. So to the machinery uh, bill, uh, like most bills in this place, it was referred to a committee. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to read through some of the recommendations from the coalition members and senators uh, in their dissenting report to the majority report, which was uh, supporting the government position. So recommendation one from the coalition members and senators, this being a joint committee, uh, supported the recommendation one of the government's report, in particular uh, changes which seek to increase enrolment and participation, particularly of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including in remote communities. And many of the other changes proposed in this just align uh, Referendum Act with Electoral Act uh, and are sensible changes which the coalition does propose, uh, support. Recommend to, recommendation two, though, of the dissenting report goes to clause four of the bill, which relates to the suspension of section 11 uh, of the Act. Now, there's three key things that the coalition believe uh, we need to have if indeed we are to have a population in Australia who are well informed and are confident that the information they have received uh, is unbiased and factual, as opposed to many things that you see on social media, which end up being opinions uh, as opposed to a considered case. And so those three things are to restore the pamphlet, which since 1928 uh, Australians have had at every referendum, and that pamphlet being a simple uh, clarification of what the issue is and the case for and against the issue. Now, we welcome the undertaking by government to uh, change their position and bring back the pamphlet, but we will obviously reserve our right until we see what is actually uh, delivered there. But importantly, associated with that is the distribution of that information to people, which will take uh, some funding to distribute that, but also to make sure that the yes and no cases, to have that integrity, to have the trust of people, rather than having a broad spectrum of voices speaking at the Australian public to have a, an official yes case and an official no case where people can go, OK, this is where the various views are coalescing for and against the question which will be in the referendum. That provides people across Australia with a degree of confidence that what they're hearing is the full range of views that are relevant to the case for and against, as opposed to having to pick through many different feeds in print or television or radio or on the internet, whether through socials or web pages or other cases. And certainly in terms of making sure we don't have undue influence, and we have seen that in recent years, uh, both here amongst diaspora communities, but we've also seen it internationally amongst the, the mainstream communities in nations where foreign interference seeks to change and to um, change the outcome of the democratic process uh, or cause dissension. And so the last part that the coalition is looking for is around appropriate funding for those official organisations. And again, going back to precedent, uh, in the um, Words of Attorney General Darrell Williams, I uh, was looking at the referendum around a constitution in Australia. Uh, he made it clear that the government would look to actually match funding uh, between uh, the yes and no cases uh, so that there could be no accusation that there was additional funds put toward one or the other side. Uh, and that is an important uh, outcome. Uh, and the explanatory, sorry, the Bill's Digest prepared by the Parliamentary Library go on to highlight the $15 million that would be provided, half to each of the two campaign committees. Uh, and so they would then use that money to actually run the campaign. 
And so there's an important precedent which has been in place before and that we should do. Now, to the actual committee report, the evidence that was received, it highlights uh, in the evidence that was received on the provisions of the bill under the paragraph 120 that under section 11, the Act currently requires that that official pamphlet containing the arguments in favour of and against the referendum proposal, along with the proposed textual alterations and additions to the constitutions, be prepared and distributed to the households by the Electoral Commissioner via post no more, sorry, no less, or no later than 14 days before the vote. And there was quite a bit of evidence provided to the committee about that and why. Uh, it's actually been in place since 1912 because of concerns about misinf misinformation and partisanship during previous uh, referendums. But by suspending section 11 of the Referendum Act, the bill would remove the requirement for an official pamphlet to be produced and distributed for any referendum held before the next general election. Uh, instead, parliamentarians would choose how and when to engage with their constituencies, along with any other groups who wish to have a voice to influence the Australian public, leading, as I said, to that uh, dissemination or that, that broad range of voices which the Australian public uh, have indicated in the past uh, sometimes leads to confusion. Hence the Electoral Commission did an inquiry highlighting the value that people place upon official information and how many people use the AEC's information in preference to that distributed by political parties or others as to how an election would run. So the other part uh, is that the official pamphlet also helps to set the tone. There's been a lot of concern raised about debates on sensitive topics uh, in this nation where people have raised concerns that the tone is going to become negative and people will be attacked. And to be honest, we even saw that in the chamber today, where there was a debate around a topic and accusations were made that people who had a different view were somehow racist or supported things which were not true. So the official pamphlet, some of the evidence to the committee said, uh, helps to set the tone to the referendum by ensuring an open and fair exchange of idea in which no side is demonised. In fact, the Australian Human Rights Commission uh, submitted that while it may be appropriate to modernise the form and the distribution of the pamphlet, it remains a valuable document which provides electors with the views of their elected officials. Now, the other part that I found interesting in paragraph 132 of the committee's report was that one of the uh, witnesses was actually the Central Land Council. And so here we are having a referendum because the government's keen to introduce a voice uh, for Indigenous people to Parliament. And here is the Central Land Council uh, expressing concern that not providing a physical posted pamphlet in remote areas would leave some people, particularly older people and elders, without reliable access to information about the referendum, especially given the barriers to telecommunications uh, access in some communities. Uh, and so I think it's telling that in actually seeking to implement the machinery provisions, surely we should actually be listening to people from remote communities who are calling for a particular outcome. Uh, and so we would encourage the government to follow through on their commitment to reintroduce the pamphlet, but also the funding uh, to those official yes and no cases. Uh, there was also evidence given to the committee in paragraph 138, uh, which I think is sound, in that the official pamphlet should also be distributed through other means. Uh, yes, we can print it and send it, but that information uh, can then be distributed uh, in audio format into, for example, Aboriginal languages uh, or other languages for uh, groups within Australia for whom English is a second language. Uh, and also, the Central Land Council suggested that the pamphlet could be displayed in public places, as well as clearly there's uh, television, radio and uh, other forms of internet that that could occur. So there are a number of reasons why we should have uh, that pamphlet and the funding for the yes and no case. So in conclusion, if we go back to the six principles that the Australian Constitution Centre puts out, the very basis of Australia's success as a representative democracy, as a place that is building a nation, a country that has become 
the most successful multicultural, plural, liberal democracy in the world. The constitution is a bedrock of that. And so we need to be certain that any changes to that constitution are understood by the Australian people. They understand the arguments for and they understand the arguments against. And then they can, in an informed way, legitimately make the parliament aware of their will, uh, which can then be implemented. But we have precedent in this nation of a form and a way. We've had some recommendations to improve it through interpretation or translation and ways we can disseminate it. But the precedence shows that an important part is having an official yes case, an official no case, both equally funded and the pamphlet which provides that information to the Australian people to express their will. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I mean, in reality, I don't think it's actually that unreasonable that members on this side of the chamber have asked for some more detail with regards to this referendum. And that's all we've asked for is detail. And it's detail about the very thing that we're voting on and what it'll look like so that everyone, all Australians, but that we in this place can make informed decisions on behalf of our constituents and whom this will impact. Already brushing past the weasel words of calling this thing an Indigenous voice to Parliament, when we literally have Indigenous members of Parliament in this very chamber from across the political spectrum and in the lower house fighting for Indigenous Australians. I mean, implying somehow that Indigenous Australians within our electorates and patron seats don't get a voice, as if we represent all Australians, regardless of ethnicity, except if you're Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, is an absurd and honestly a racist way of thinking. But as I've said, we want to be reasonable and consider what the government's proposing. The problem is that there's really nothing to consider. No real detail once again, no plan, no transparency from those opposite. And we keep saying this, doesn't matter if it was today, and refusing to have a look at Mobile Black Spots program, no modelling with regards to the safeguard mechanism, the gas cap rushed through without a proper plan, changes with it to super without considering the broader implications, just more broken promises. So we have raised, though, three points with the government to address our concerns on the referendum process. Restore the pamphlet to outline the yes and no case. Establish official yes and no campaign organisations and appropriately fund those official organisations. And these measures are, are really fundamental to having a referendum with informed voters and a process with integrity. The coalition, we are generally standing here in good faith. We want to reasonably consider the proposal, but we need the government to actually come to the table. We can't support a bill that doesn't have a plan how to properly regulate donations, foreign interference, or that provides a plan for how the scrutiny of the referendum will be conducted. All of this could actually be resolved by the establishment of appropriately and equally funded official yes and no campaign organisations. So until we can have these concerns addressed, we will be opposing the bill. Surveys are repeatedly showing that Australians want detail, and the Prime Minister is repeatedly ducking under the table. The government must set out specific details. But I guess the bigger question is, does that detail even exist? As Mr Dutton has said, it's strange that the Prime Minister now says that the Karma Langton view of having local and regional voices is potentially not part of his plan. We had one senior government minister, indeed the envoy in this area, saying that there would be a seat at the National Cabinet for the voice. That was then backtracked by Minister Linda Burney and then ruled out by the Prime Minister. So which one is it? How can Australians understand what they're voting for when the opposition and ask us to support it when the government doesn't even know what they're asking Australians to vote for. This is just confusing for everybody. So there's 15 questions that Mr Dutton has asked the Prime Minister to address for Australians and those concerns. 
One, who will be eligible to serve on the proposed body? Probably something important that we need to know. What are the prerequisites for nominations? As Senator Hanson pointed out, we saw the failed ATSIC model years ago, and are we moving just back to that same sort of trough feeders that are looking for a permanent, permanent uh, snout in the trough under the voice? Will the government clarify the definition Order. of aboriginality to determine who can serve on the body? So how do we know? Does someone just have to walk in and say, by the way, this is me, or is there some sort of proof required? And how will those members be elected, chosen or appointed? Will it just be another mate's fest for those opposite uh, to continue to appoint those and push their so-called agenda? How many people will be on the body? thought you might have to be able to answer that one. And pretty fundamentally, how much will it cost taxpayers annually? Concerningly to Australians, you can't even answer what are its functions and powers. Is it purely advisory or will it have decision-making capabilities? Who will oversee the body and ensure it is, uh, is accountable? If needed, can the body be dissolved, like we had to do with ATSIC and reconstituted in extraordinary circumstances? How will the government ensure that the body includes those who still need to get a platform in Australian public life? How will it interact with the closing the gap process? Uh, we could come on to that and how it will actually impact closing the gap, because we know ultimately it won't. Will the government rule out using the voice to negotiate any national treaty? Will the government commit to local and regional voices, as recommended in the report and the co-design process led by Tom Carmer and Marsha Langdon? Something we now know they can't answer definitively. If not, how will it effectively address the real issues that impact people's lives on the ground in the community? Again, these are really reasonable questions. And in fact, they're not gotcha questions. There's nothing malicious in their intent. They're just questions that the Australian electorate would like answered. And it's information that really should be provided at a bare minimum when providing when you are proposing a change that could have lasting and far-reaching consequences for all Australians, all Australians, not just Indigenous Australians. The fact that we actually have to keep asking, will there be a local or regional voice, already shows us that this proposal is nowhere near ready to go. It would be totally futile, in fact purely symbolic and empty exercise to implement any kind of system without ensuring it actually worked for all Indigenous Australians, at the very least, not just those that signed up to the Labor Party in their inner city hubs and are going to push their own agendas forward, ignoring the plight of those in regional and rural communities. We know that they don't care about Alice Springs. If they were paying any attention today, they'd have noticed that one of the bakers out there has had his shop broken into now over 40 times. But of course, there's absolutely nothing those opposite can have a plan to do, have any willingness to do anything to help the people of uh, Alice Springs because it doesn't quite fit with their woke virtue signal agenda because that's all, quite frankly, Labor is capable of and is their lifeblood. Virtue signalling to the high heavens, just so that you can make it look like you're doing something good with actually out having to do any work. But we're actually quite happy to do the work on this side of the chamber if you guys just really aren't up to it on the other side. My colleague, Senator Nampajimba Price, has stood in this chamber day in, day out, time and time again, championing the cause of and being the voice for the people of the Northern Territory, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. But of course, she's the wrong type of Indigenous woman. She's the wrong type of Indigenous voice. But she is a genuine regional voice, the forgotten Australians who are struggling right now in the top end, the people that actually need a voice the most. But we, we know that this voice is not going to be their voice. So whose voice is it, the inner city bureaucrats or only the Indigenous groups who vote red? How can the Prime Minister think that this parliament or this Senate or the Australian people will simply send this through to the Keeper now? So he and his government can work the details out on the fly once they've worked out what they're actually trying to do. He either has total contempt for this chamber and the people of Australia, or perhaps he already has a plan he doesn't want to come clean on. It's kind of getting a bit of a ring about it in this place, isn't it? In which case, is he really working for the people of Australia? 
or just the people that check his name at the ballot box. The bill makes fundamental changes to how referenda are conducted in this country, removing a requirement for a pamphlet to be provided without outlining the case for and against change. Why would a government that's so confident that this is something the people want, that it, they're so confident that this is just going to sail through, why are they so eager to hide any of the detail? Why would less information be a good thing? And how can this be the way forward? The coalition will support a bill that allows for a referendum with informed voters and a process with integrity. Let me spell it for you. But we need some integrity that's based on precedent. On principle alone, we cannot support the precedent being set by the government, regardless of the referendum question it's being used to support. This would be the first time there has been no pamphlet provided to voters since before Farlap won the Melbourne Cup. There have only been three referenda in our nation's history without an official pamphlet. The last one in 1928, in 1919 when there was insufficient time, in 1926 there was no agreement on how to produce the yes argument, and in 1928 there was an overwhelming agreement between the parties and governments. And so for those referenda, none of the circumstances apply here. So you've got to ask, why does the government want to unwind this long-standing precedent? We've heard from the AEC, you know, that partisan organisation, that when they provide mail material to voters during elections, up to 40 per cent of recipients will use documentation such as pamphlets as their main source of information and how they cast their vote. The government is just simply playing games. It's trying to find ways to play the edges of this referendum without explicitly saying so. They're trying to skew the argument one way over the other to appease their base and their stakeholders instead of taking a genuine approach to asking the Australian people about whether they think this has any merit or not. This Act governs how the government must conduct a referendum. It is similar to the Commonwealth Electoral Act's role in governing the processes and procedures in conducting an election. The Act also includes how a referendum's donations how those will be regulated and will operate, how the pre-poll scrutineering and counting will operate, and how the newly introduced foreign interference regime will operate. The bill doesn't determine the question being put at the referendum for, on the Indigenous Voice to Parliament. So why are we still playing games with this? Why are we messing with the mechanism behind the question instead of dealing with the actual detail around the question? So I'd say to those opposite, it's time either come clean to the Australian people about your agenda or meaningly, meaningfully engage with us and address our concerns. If this is something that the Prime Minister truly feels strongly about and he believes that the majority of Australians feel the same, then I think he would provide the reasonable detail that's what we're asking for. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Speaker. And I can't believe that in the year of 2023, the month of March, I'm standing up here tonight to have to speak about the integrity of our democracy. It just beggars belief. But then again, that is the type of government that we have in power at the moment that isn't interested in representing the rights of all individuals. No, 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 no. What they want to do is that they want to divide the population by race, by race, right? And they want to be sneaky. They want to be sneaky about how they're going about it, right? They're not going to conduct this referendum by normal rules. No, 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 no. As usual, they've got to hide and basically have no transparency and no accountability. You know, and this is the recurring theme of my time in government and, and, and the Labor's time in government with the bureaucrats. They never want to disclose anything. It's secret after secret after secret. And what, are the, what is this referendum all about? It is designed to give a class of people a voice that they already have. We have a voice in this country. It's called the ballot box. It's called the ballot box. 
It is the fundamental bulwark of Western democracies that has basically turned you know, many countries, made many countries prosperous on the fact that every individual, every individual gets a say. And what have we got over here on the other side of the chamber? Are they interested in wanting to preserve the rights of every individual, the dignity and worth of every individual? Do they want to empower the individual? No, they do not, because the other side of the chamber is interested in one thing and one thing only, and that is command and control. Command and control. And they do that through three means. Number one, of course, is Marxism itself. And that's where they want to divide the world by race, by gender, you know, whatever you can think of, it's always us against them. Instead of just coming out and saying that there is only one race, the human race, and that we should all work together for the betterment of our children, no, 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 no. That is not what the other side of the chamber is interested in. They are only interested in division so that they can distract us with superfluous issues like the race, like the voice, at a time when we've got much more pressing issues like cost of living. We've got Australians who can't find houses, can't get rental, you know, buy a house, rent a house. We've got other Australians who are in mortgage stress because we have an out of control RBA that has no idea about monetary policy. We have got people still locked down, can't get work because of COVID mandates. And here we are wasting time on a Monday about a bill that is designed to under undermine the very essence of democracy itself. The very essence of democracy itself. Now, we've already got a National Indigenous Australian Agency that has over two billion a year uh, put into it, that is spent through it. It employs people that cost up to $300 million a year. So tell me this. What is it that this agency can't do that a change to the constitution will? Why do those opposite us want to actually change the constitution? Because heaven forbid that this ever gets in the hands of an activist High Court judge. I mean, we well remember the, the impacts of the 1983 Franklin Dam decision, where a High Court judge undermined the constitution there by saying that the foreign treaties, I'm not talking about saving the environment, I'm talking about how they ruled that foreign treaties could override state governments. They ruled that foreign treaties could override powers of the state government. That was an attack on democracy itself. And mark my words that if this gets into the constitution, I mean, this is an administration issue. By all means, let's close the gap. Let's provide essential services. Touched on it in my maiden speech. You hear me talk about it ad nauseum, improving essential services, improving essential services, building infrastructure, dams, power stations, roads, rail, ports, airports uh, and telecommunications that provide essential services, especially to those people in the regions. Right? That is what the role of government is, is to build things and to serve people. It is not the role of government to regulate people within an inch of their lives, and it is most certainly not the role of government to be trying to divide people on any identity or every identity you can think of, because that is what this referendum is all about. And that is why Labor is being so sneaky. Very, very, very sneaky. And if you want to look at the Constitution, we've already got a section in the Constitution, section 5126, that says government has powers in respect to making laws to race. So yet again, I ask the Chamber, I ask those on the other side, why are we wasting billions, uh, millions of dollars on a referendum when we need to be focused on those things that matter, and that is providing essential services to all people, regardless of race. 
okay, regardless of race. And let's focus on building hospitals. Let's focus on building schools. Let's focus on providing better water supply or better transport or whatever it takes to lift the standard of living across all regions in Australia. That is what we should be focused on. And instead, you know, all day today, we've been winding ourselves up like the Tasmanian devil in a spin over the rules of this referendum, okay, that is basically dealing with something that shouldn't even come into it. And it's interesting, and I note, you know, I, I note the questioning of my colleague, uh, Senator Antic, in estimates, where he asked what the definition of an Aboriginal was. And of course, he got the usual reply that somehow asking a very simple question, fundamental to this referendum, he was accused of being a racist. And that is what we're up against here. This side of the chamber wants to deal in facts. It wants to deal in the output of deliverables, real services that make a difference to people in their everyday lives. Okay? People don't go around the world looking at people through the lens of race. We're way past that. This is Australia. We're a proud multicultural nation, okay? brought together by, you know, wrongdoings, whatever, in the past. We've all come from, 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 we've all come from, the, so thanks, I'll take that interjection. Thanks, Senator Pratt. It's good to know that, you know, you don't think Australia is a multicultural country, but we have all come from persecutions. I mean, I've got Irish ancestry, okay? Maternal side came from, you know, the potato famine in 1851. My maternal side, my great, great, great grandfather, how many greats I've got to say, he was picked up on the streets of Dublin in 1826, sent out here to build Parramatta Road. Okay, but do I, you know, I mean, apart from in the pub paying out my pommy mates, um, do I go on about it? No. Okay, the point is, is that a rising tide will lift all boats. And the best thing that we should be striving for is prosperity, is prosperity and unity. Okay, not division, not division and poverty which is what identity politics will give us, because poverty will distract us from those things that really matter, which are things like family and respect for the dignity and worth of every individual, regardless of their background or their race or their gender or whatever, because it doesn't matter. It is none of our business as politicians. As politicians, and as bureaucrats, we need to get out of people's lives. People are sick and tired of the government telling them what to do, regulating them, or, on the other hand, they're creating all these fear merchants like COVID, climate change, you know, the race division, fear and loathing. This stuff has to stop. This stuff has to stop, and we need to get on as one country as one race and work together, work together, okay, to provide better services. We have an enormous number of bureaucrats involved in providing services to Aboriginals and their communities. So the question is, why can't they close the gap? That is the question to ask. What is it that we have to do to close the gap in regional Australia, in whatever community that may be, and across the entire nation. Because what we should be striving to do in this chamber, when we make laws, is to actually lift all boats of all the people by providing services, by providing services to the Australian people. And I can tell you what, we won't be doing that this year while we're wasting time debating the intricacies of a referendum that is designed to permanently divide this country along the lines of race. It is abhorrent. It is completely abhorrent that in the 21st century that this Labor government has sought to bring a referendum to undo the work of the great 1966 referendum brought about by the Liberal Party, 
has sought the Labor Party is trying to tear a wedge in this country, and it is completely wrong. It is completely wrong. And you know they're playing games. I read today, for example, that now the Australian Electoral Commission is actually mandatory signing up people to the electoral roll without even informing them. Now, if that report's true in the Australian, it came out this afternoon. That is alarming. That has got red flags for electioneering fraud. I mean, I'm not sure if that's a part of this bill, but you don't just go around signing up people. They have to sign themselves up. Okay, we've now got the bureaucrats, and I mean, let's face it, what government agency hasn't made a stuff up when it comes to managing databases? Do you think signing up people without their consent, without their knowledge, I mean, there's shades of you know, superannuation, compulsory, compulsory superannuation here where Keating ripped out, started off at 2 per cent, but it's going to 12 per cent of people's wages. Never a referendum there. Shades of the COVID mandate, you know, forcing an untested jab into people's arms. And now we're going to sign people up to the electoral roll without them even knowing it. I mean, you know, this just smacks of control and division. And of course, this is what we have come to expect Order. from those on the other side of the chamber that aren't interested in peace and prosperity and unity. No, 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 no. These people, they want to control you by fear and loathing and division. That's the, that's the modus operandi of the Australian Labor Party, backed by their mates in the Greens Party, you know, basically watermelon party, Greens one day, Marxists the next, green, red, green, red. You know, very, very scary. Well, let me tell you that this side of the chamber isn't going to allow our country to be divided by race or fear all loathing, all loathing. I'll take that interjection. Thanks, Senator Shoebridge. I'll take that interjection. Thank you very much. And as you can see, they won't even tolerate a different type of opinion. So for those of you that can't hear him on the camera, Senator Shoebridge is over there shouting at me. And that is typical of the Greens. They always try and shut down a different opinion, a different opinion. And Senator let Reddick, me resume your oh, seat. Here we go. Senator Shoebridge, what is your point of order? Um, surely it's contrary to the standing orders to have seven separate conspiracy theories in the one Not speech which Senator Renwick has Senator done. Shoebridge. Seven resume separate your, conspiracy. Resume your seat, Senator Shoebridge. Senator Rennick. Thank you, uh, Acting Madam Deputy President. And of course, what we saw there, of course, is the same old modus operandi conspiracy theory. That's what these people do. They attack you. They have to attack, make personal attacks all the time. This is the Greens, and this is the element of wokeness. This is what the essence of wokeness is, is that feelings matter more than facts. Well, let me tell you this, is that the world and the Western society originally, and it's, it's been the basis of our prosperity, was built on empirical science. It was not built on feelings. It was built on empirical science underpinned by mathematics. And that is what we should be focusing on as a government in delivering engineering projects that are going to improve the prosperity of this country. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Dunningham. President, well, it's a delight to be able to make a contribution to the uh, referendum machinery amendment bill 2022. And as anyone who's watching, all seven people out there across Australia can see, that it is uh, an issue that invokes a uh, high degree of interest and much passion on the part of many of our colleagues across the spectrum of views that we have seen expressed through this debate. Now, I think it is important, though, for us to uh, remember what we're debating here is um, slightly removed from, though not completely delinked from what the referendum will be about, the question and details of which we are yet to be provided with. But this is about establishing the mechanism to be able to ask the question, and I think it's important that we do try our very best to focus on that as much as we can. Though, as uh, we've heard in our last speaker and many of the other contributions through this debate, and well made they have been, I say to Senator Rennick, uh, it is an issue that brings out 
a passion in the debate in our democracy, which is a wonderful thing. And I'm pleased to see the interactions we've been having here in the chamber, and it's been a source of much entertainment for many of us. But it is a serious matter, because, of course, here in Australia, this country, the lucky country, as we are often referred to, uh, it being free and democratic um, as a country, uh, we have to have the ability to make informed decisions, decisions based on all of the information to be able to make the right decision based on our circumstances, what we believe to be right or wrong, uh, impose over whatever decision it is we are making um, our values framework and reach a conclusion. That's essential for us to be able to uh, get to the right outcome, whoever we are. Every single individual in this country has an equal right to make uh, the case for what they believe in and cast a vote or make a decision in accordance with that will. And of course, having a, a process which enables us to do that, um, which is underpinned by integrity, is also essential. And if you have an absence of either of those characteristics, full information being provided or a process underpinned by integrity, then uh, you're going to undermine everything that is good and wonderful about this democracy that we take for granted in this country. Um, both the processes related to democracy, elections, referenda, plebiscites, uh, and the institutions that are built upon them as well, including our state and federal parliaments. Um, and I think it is important to uh, highlight that these things that we have taken, I think, as a country for granted, because frankly we've known nothing else in the years since our federation. Yes, uh, many of those who've gone before us have fought wars. Um, we've seen terrible things happen overseas in other jurisdictions. But here in Australia, we have not had to face the terrible situations of dictatorship, of loss of liberty in the way that we have seen in other countries, and that is because we do have a strong and functioning democracy. And that's underpinned by one thing, and that is our constitution, Acting Deputy President. And it's something that we need to guard and we need to make sure that when changes are made, they're made properly, for good reason, with full information and underpinned by a process of integrity, as I said before. Um, we want to make sure that this, this foundation document, uh, the thing that so many people um, have lost their lives fighting to protect um, because they believe in it, uh, we need to make sure that we do protect the processes around alteration of it and, of course, the end product that is delivered. And Australians expect us, they expect us uh, in this place, in both the other place here and here in the Australian Senate, to make decisions that are in accordance with protecting this document, our foundation document, our democratic processes and institutions. Now, with regard to this legislation, though, I think it's important to, as I know a number of my colleagues have outlined, uh, highlight a couple of concerns that there are with the legislation. Now, I don't want that to be conflated in any way with a suggestion that there is a desire to deny people the right to have their say on an important issue. Um, uh, where people stand on that ultimate question that will be asked under a referendum, um, that, that is, as I say, not delinked but separate to the debate we are having here. Um, but uh, expressing concern here today and wanting to make sure that uh, the process that underpins the mechanics uh, that will um, enable this referendum to take place has integrity, questioning those things and wanting to make sure that they are at the best standard possible, the standard that Australians are expecting us as a parliament to deliver is something that uh, I don't want anyone to look at and say, well, hey, they're, they're trying to deny us the opportunity to have our say. So uh, that being the case, and I'll come to those particular concerns and itemise those shortly and also refer to some of the points that have been made in the Joint Standing Committee on electoral matters that uh, had a quick look at the proposed legislation. The fact is this is not a, a trivial matter. Um, you know, making changes uh, to this document, the Australian Constitution, and the process that leads to making those changes is incredibly important to make sure it is fair, that it is transparent, that it is uh, even-handed in terms of how it is administered, uh, that the laws relating to uh, communicating information, 
um, the laws around the organisations that communicate information are all there on an even uh, playing field, uh, that there is transparency. I think all of those things need to be absolutely front and centre as we move forward through this debate. And as uh, the previous speaker and others who have participated in this debate have said, uh, or have indicated, I should say, it is something that invokes a high level of passion and interest, and it is something that I'm sure Australians not many tuned in tonight, but uh, will, uh, those Australians will um, take a high degree of interest in over time. To those issues, though, that the Coalition have indicated uh, they would like to see addressed uh, with regard to the progression of this bill, um, there were three key areas. The first one was the restoration of a pamphlet to outline clearly and directly the yes and no campaign as we head toward a referendum, and that is something that has been in place. In every referendum, as far as I'm aware, since 1912, a good 91 years ago, establish uh, official yes and no campaign organisations so that we know who we're dealing with, how to apply the rules, make it easier for the AEC to administer the laws related to campaigning, disclosures, etc., and of course then ensure that appropriate funding is available to uh, each of the organisations that I've just mentioned, the yes and the no campaign official organisations. And of course, uh, having that arrangement, having that establishment in place is essential to having that process, which, as I said before, one of the vital characteristics to ensuring we preserve democracy in the way that we thrive and, and depend upon, is to have a process uh, based on integrity and where voters are fully informed through the process we're setting up today through this legislation. To the first of uh, the issues, though, the restoration of the pamphlet to outline both the yes and the no campaigns, it is welcome that the government have indicated that they will uh, re-establish um, the provision of a pamphlet to uh, Australian households to outline what each campaign is arguing for or against in that case, and it is essential that people are fully informed. The first of the arms of the uh, issues I, I talked about before, and I might just turn to the uh, um, report of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, uh, advisory report on the Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022, and I'll uh, go to um, the remarks of some of my colleagues, the Coalition members and senators, uh, dissenting report, a number of recommendations contained within uh, and a good overview. But in terms of the pamphlet, I think it was important to look at uh, some of the comments of um, entities that were interested and involved in this process, starting with, and I know others have uh, referred to this, but the Central Land Council, um, which noted that the failure to provide a physical and posted pamphlet in remote areas would almost certainly leave people in particular older Australians and elders, without reliable access to information regarding the referendum question, especially given the barriers to telecommunications in regional communities. And that, of course, was a submission from the Central Land Council. Uh, we also had references uh, made to the same problem from Dr Shireen Morris, the Australian Monarchist League, Professor Anne Toomey and, uh, and others in um, providing submissions to that committee. The Australian Electoral Commission themselves said uh, that um, its research quote, shows that 40 per cent of people still rely on and use the guide posted to households as their primary source of information. Um, these are the people who administer these processes, these processes where, one, we seek to have Australians fully informed, a process to do that is by way of a pamphlet, and the ones who also administer the process of counting the votes with integrity. Uh, the IPA, the Institute of Public Affairs, also argued that the official pamphlet plays an integral role in setting the tone of a referendum debate and helps to ensure an open and fair exchange of ideas in which no side is demonised. And I think that is important, this idea of free and frank exchange of views and ideas in this democratic country where pluralism is endorsed, I think is a good thing. It is great that the government have said, well, you know what, the pamphlet's back on, that's going to go ahead. So let's hope that that remains the case and that we do see, uh, at the end of the day, a proper um, setup where we will um, have a proper fully informed debate by way of, at the very least, a pamphlet provided to Australians in the form that uh, those entities, the Central Land Council, the AEC and the IPA and others who made submissions to that inquiry have said. 
Of course, uh, having some established yes and no campaigns, properly recognised and properly organised, is uh, a very important part of any referendum and uh, the history that has been gone through um, quite, at quite some length throughout this debate has outlined uh, how this has formed the basis of any successful ram uh, referendum in the past and indeed um, any uh, government willing to make sure that Australians are taken on the journey of change will ensure that these changes are a part of or these uh, provisions are a part of what they take forward. As the descending report of um, the coalition members and senators said, um, you know, the absence of at paragraph 1.26 of this report, the absence of an official campaign set of entities is of concern when considering the implementation and enforcement of modern electoral regulations on donations and foreign interference, and then, of course, also the regulatory auditing process to administer these regulatory schemes would be assisted by having official campaigns to provide a starting point for enforcement and education by the AEC. So, if we don't have official organisations established, who is responsible for and who does the AEC pursue in the event of uh, breaches of electoral law? If we don't have these entities established, then how do we ensure that the process has integrity? There will be a myriad of entities out there entering into the fray, making their views known, and uh, acting deputy president, they'll be perhaps, sadly, in breach of the law. How is the AEC going to have the resources to pursue all of this? And what do we do if there is the inference that the uh, outcome has been tainted by the fact that there has been a huge increase in breaches of law, electoral law, because of the number of entities, because we don't have uh, recognised official entities, out there breaching well-established electoral laws, particularly as they relate to a referendum. Uh, and of course, then, the third uh, issue um, that was raised in the dissenting report was around public funding of official yes and no campaigns. Um, and uh, again, if we don't have that, if we don't have some clarity around the provision of this funding, then there is this increased and more likely, incredibly uh, more likely, uh, dependence on private funding from vested interests, uh, which will invariably dominate debate. And the descending remarks of this committee report also made that very clear at paragraph 1.33, uh, where those sorts of vested interests and the information they may disseminate would undoubtedly compromise the quality and reliability of referendum information available to Australians, perhaps negatively affecting voters' ability to make informed decisions. One of those key elements to a successful outcome here is having Australians with the ability to make an informed decision with all the facts on the table before them. So, Acting Deputy President, um, there are a range of issues that need to be addressed here to make sure that this very important decisions that we are about to make, uh, or about to ask Australians to make by way of referendum, should this uh, legislation pass, um, if we need to make sure it's done properly, and ensuring those elements that I've outlined here, that other coalition members and senators have outlined, that the dissenting report, uh, dissenting remarks in the uh, report have pointed to, are provided for is just underpinning, one, the capacity to make sure Australians are informed as we make this incredibly important decision, and two, that there is integrity in the process that we have as a vehicle to make this decision. I hope the government heeds these calls and that we have a proper process before us. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. The Referendum Machinery Amendment Bill uh, is probably more critical than most people appreciate because it is the bill that determines whether or not the referendum we have has integrity. I think Australians expect their referendums to happen in a way that is orthodox and predictable and not subject to the particular whims of governments of particular days. I come to this discussion and indeed the next discussion when we have the Constitutional Alteration Bill from two distinctive perspectives. The first is 
someone who was very much at the centre of that last transformative event that this parliament presided over, being the Same-Sex Marriage Act. I'm surprised that more people are not talking about some of the important lessons that were learned from that particular legislative success, and I'll come to that in a moment. Secondly, and less commonly known to senators, is that I was very much at the centre of the last constitutional referendum debate that this Senate had in 2012-2013. Indeed, Senator Raff, I was. Uh, that debate concerned the matter of constitutional recognition of local government. And again, it's interesting how history turns, I was on this side of the parliament and was appointed by Senators Bushby, uh, Bernardi, Senators Madigan, Senators Lionhelm, Senator Day, Senator Mackenzie, as the convener of the parliamentary no committee. And I'll come to that in a moment. And again, when we get to the Constitutional Alteration Amendment Bill, there will be an opportunity for the Senate to debate the substantive issues of changing the Constitution. But I do think it's very, very important to make this point. It's my modest view that the great bulk of Australians are now ready, are now very, very comfortable to have a form of constitutional recognition for Indigenous people. That is my honest and also informed view. What the parliament will be forced to debate this year is what form of constitutional recognition is to be undertaken and perhaps approved by the Australian electorate. So our country has travelled a tremendous distance and I'm pleased to say that the coalition has played an important role in bringing forward different sorts of ideas about what constitutional recognition of Indigenous peoples should look like. And I think that's a very, very important point, that we are debating in the near future a particular type of form of Indigenous recognition. But that, as I said, is a debate for another time. Let me turn back to the experience of the same-sex marriage debate, and I applaud the Prime Minister for being the first Prime Minister to walk uh, in the Sydney Mardi Gras. I'm surprised he did not learn better some of the lessons from the most recent same-sex marriage debate. That debate was greatly aided by the fact that a bill to legislate same-sex marriage was released three months before the first vote in the plebiscite. That gave people great confidence about what the bill would be when we came to debate it in the parliament if the plebiscite was successful. Not my job to advise the government, but my strong advice to government, if I was a member of it, would be this. You create confidence, you build trust when you allow Australians to see the type of bill that they through their representatives will be asked to endorse. It is not true that the parliament will decide the form of a legislated voice. It's not true. That will be decided by the government, the Greens, Senator Pocock, perhaps Senator Lydia Thorpe. I don't know the extent to which Senator Smith will be invited to participate in that. I don't know the extent to which Senator Bragg will be invited to participate in that. A great error of judgment by the government and the referendum working group, not, excuse me, Senator Pratt, I'm making a very serious and sensible contribution. I know you know that. So it's very, very strange. It's a great error of judgment by the government and the referendum working group not to bring forward a draft legislative proposal. The second lesson from the same-sex marriage debate is this. The same-sex marriage bill was not the first marriage bill. It was the last but it was number 22 or number 23. And I make that point because it was a work that allowed everyone to bring particular perspectives. Some people Gray gave important ground in order that the parliament could come to a near unanimous decision. Unfortunately, what we have here is the Labor Party in opposition adopting a form of recognition, making it its policy, and then suggesting that somehow it's got virtues that extend beyond that. This is an election commitment in regards to a form of Indigenous recognition. It has no more virtue than that. 
And as I said, we'll get to the merits of that when we talk about the constitutional alteration bill. Some important lessons, I think, from the same-sex marriage debate. When we last debated constitutional reform in this Senate chamber in 22-23—and I see that Senator Mackenzie has now joined me, and Senator Mackenzie was very much involved in that. It's worth noting that the, the referendum me mechanics bill passed the Senate, passed the Parliament. The constitutional alteration bill passed the Parliament. The yes and no committees were created. Senator Smith—you can see it on Facebook if you wind right back took down the official no case to the Australian Electoral Commission and others, I don't know who it was, might have been Senator, uh, Mrs Prentice, the Queensland member of the House of Representatives, took down the official yes cases. It was orthodox. There were official no and yes committees. There was a yes and no case. And it instilled great confidence in people, and there was never a skerrick of doubt about the integrity of that referendum process until the government decided it would allocate disproportionate funding between the yes and no campaign. Anyway, for those who are keen students of history, you might remember I actually don't remember going to vote in that referendum. No. What happened, Dean? What happened? Leadership, leadership change. Gillard goes to Rudd. Rudd sorry, Prime Minister Gillard, forced out of office, shifted to Prime Minister Rudd. The, refer the referendum was abandoned. Which brings me to my other substantive point. I am genuinely confused why some people have chosen to trust Labor to deliver such an important referendum proposal. Putting the, merits, putting the merits of Labor's particular proposal aside for a moment, people, I think, have been foolish to trust Labor on this referendum. Labor, after, it would say, distinguished period of government since Federation, over a very, very long history of political participation in our country, just one referendum proposal has been successful. Just one in 1946. Not even Gough Whitlam, not even Bob Hawke could bring referendum proposals forward in our country and have them endorsed. The great legends, Bob Hawke, Gough Whitlam, Ben Shifley, could not even deliver constitutional reform, except on one occasion in 1946. And what is the other salient fact about that referendum proposal, which supporters out there in the community should think very, very carefully about? It enjoyed just 54 per cent of support. Wow. If this referendum proposal is successful, I hope it's successful with a thumping majority. I do because I worry what it will be if the referendum proposal is endorsed with a significantly less majority. Which brings me to the next issue. As a keen student of constitutional reform, as I said, as someone who has participated in it, we start with those opinion polls, the government starts with those opinion polls perilously low, perilously low. The record shows with great clarity that support for constitutional referendum proposals in our country diminish over time. They do not start with low support and get lots of support. They diminish over time. Why are those opinion polls—and opinion polls should be treated with a touch of scepticism—but why should those opinion polls be trusted? Because again, not my job to provide advice to the government, but there has been much already in the government's actions around this referendum that have caused Australians to be suspicious, that have caused Australians to be <coughs> concerned. The government was slow to endorse a yes and no pamphlet. How can that possibly be? The yes and no pamphlet is the single means that allows everyone to have the debate framed in a way that is respectful, that sticks to the issues, 
because it is framed by parliamentarians. And no matter the intensity of our contest in chambers like this in the House of Representatives, more often than not, we each conduct ourselves in a way that is generous and gracious and thinks of the country's interests. And I'm very confident that the No Committee and the Yes Committee, when they come to write, write those pamphlets, will do so in an informed and concise and conscientious way. The government was slow to think that that was a suitable way to proceed. The government is confused. The working group is confused. What is it that is actually going to be in that constitutional alteration bill? What is the question that Australians are going to be asked to support? And there's the government out there saying that somehow everyone else is slow to understand. No, no, no. People have been quick to be suspicious because Australians, whatever their political views, are cautious and conservative on constitutional change. That's not, that's not me making it up. The history proves that. And so we have two outstanding issues, a yes and no committee and the issue of equal funding. The yes and no committee is very, very important. And again, I'm not speaking to the government, I'm speaking to the referendum working group. Take more care pay more attention because in your opposition to a yes and no pamphlet, in your opposition to yes and no committees, you might just be aiding and abetting the tarnishing of our proud democratic tradition by giving the government the wrong advice. I don't doubt that the advice is sincere. I do not. But it is wrong. There must be a yes and no committee. It formalises the debate. It makes parliamentarians, and I hope that it would be chaired by parliamentarians, it makes it accountable. Because when we go to general elections every three years in this country, we don't hold our neighbours accountable, we hold our parliamentarians accountable. And so yes and no committees that are comprised of parliamentarians, a pamphlet that is authored by parliamentarians, allows Australians to hold parliamentarians accountable. It is unfair, it is wrong that other people might find themselves made accountable for a referendum that is unsuccessful or a referendum that is successful but doesn't enjoy a high enough level of confidence amongst Australians. Orthodoxy is the way to approach referendums in our country and even then they cannot be guaranteed of success. Getting the mechanics right is very, very important. Paying attention to these things is very, very important. The referendum machinery issue is what voters will see first. And they will quickly come to a judgment about whether or not the referendum me mechanism has integrity or does not have integrity. And I've got to say, the government has started shabbily. The Prime Minister goes to great pains to say, this is not his referendum proposal. And when he says that, bells should ring. Because if it's not his proposal, then who is accountable? If it's not his proposal, whose proposal is it? If it's not his proposal, who is going to have to deal with the disappointment if it's unsuccessful? The Prime Minister must take more ownership, and thus far this is off to a very, very bad start that is bad for our democracy and is bad for supporters of this re Indigenous recognition proposal. Thank you, Senator. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And it's just such a pleasure to follow my good friend and colleague, Senator Dean Smith. Um, we have stood in this chamber and sat in this chamber and crossed the floor in this chamber against our own side uh, on constitutional matters, and I know he uh, is very principled when he comes and makes his contribution on this issue, and very uh, uh, pr principled, but it's an, always an intelligent, thoughtful, considered position and one of great experience. Uh, and his concerns, and I share them, are that the mechanics bill is not just some, you know, 
ticker box venture to get us to the referendum and Albo's legacy project quicker, it actually goes to the very heart of our democracy. Australians are a conservative people. Prime Minister Albanese. Just one moment, Senator. Oh, sorry. I've got a point of order. Yep. I think uh, he anticipated my point of order, and it was that uh, the Prime Minister should be referred to in the proper way, and she's just done that. So thank you. All right. Senator McKenzie. Thank you. So no matter where you stand on the substantive issue that will be put to Australians uh, at some time later this year, getting this bill right will actually affirm this chamber's beliefs in some principles that underpin our democracy. We're all Democrats, I hope, little small d, Senator Patterson, small d, um, but hopefully everybody that participates in our parliamentary and political process in our country believes in the sovereign will of the Australian people, because it is only by the exercise of that sovereign will of the Australian people that the diversity of the Senate chamber actually exists as it is, with all of the different political philosophies and ideologies that form this chamber as a result of the reflection of the sovereign will of the Australian people. Changing our founding document, the Constitution of Australia, is a very serious business. It's not something to be taken lightly. It's not some you know, um, frippery. It's not something to get all emotional and warm and fuzzy about and just tick the box. It is a serious venture. And it is why Australian people have been very reticent to change that very simple document that underpins how we run this place and uh, the great institutions that have meant we've stayed free and open um, for the last 123 years. So when we come to changing that document and this bill before us, things like the yes and no committee, things like making sure Australians are coming to that question, not with a social media, their Instagram account informing them, but with some serious understanding of the substantive question before them, both sides. Because the reality is uh, most Australians aren't deeply engaged in this issue and the question in and of itself. And so the only decent thing, the only responsible thing for us as legislators to do is make sure, if we really respect their sovereign will, if we really, truly respect their sovereign will and are not rushing down uh, a road to corral and coerce uh, the Australian people into a certain view, then we will want them to come to that ballot box um, with a full understanding and to exercise that sovereign will. And so the fact that the government has agreed, after much pressure, to uh, have a pamphlet outlining both the yes and the no case to every Australian so that they can, whether they live in Orbost, whether they live in capital cities like Brisbane, or whether they live in Indigenous communities like St Theresa, they will have the yes and the no um, proposition before them, and they can confidently walk into that ballot box and exercise their sovereign will. And what comes out of that will be as it should be, and we all need to respect that decision. But for the Labor Party, for the government, to put a bill before us that doesn't have a yes and no pamphlet in it. They had to be dragged kicking and screaming to make this fair. That doesn't have equal funding for both sides of the campaign, so only the rich and powerful, only big sport, big business, multinationals, people that you know, see that there is some political or economic advantage for them to support the, whatever the substantive question is later on down the track will actually be able to pour millions of dollars into an economic outcome and, instead of it being a reflection of the will of the Australian people, it will actually be a perverse outcome. 
because it's been garnered uh, from those who seek to profit from promoting a certain view over the other. That's why in this country we happen to be like a very egalitarian society. It's why governments in the past have funded both the yes and the no equally of whatever question it is, so that um, Australians can have confidence that it's not a partisan issue, and we really want, we really believe uh, that you are sovereign under our constitution. So that's been concerning, and the fact that the government uh, hasn't set up the official campaigns. They're happy for this to all be a bit loose, all be a bit, you know, uh, opaque, because it suits them. Because once Australians are starting to understand this question, they're starting to see that serious Indigenous academics themselves have competing views about what this body sh should look like, what the substantive question should be. It gets a bit rubbery. It gets a bit concerning. And the big legacy project for the Prime Minister actually looks a little shaky, looks a little uh, like an albatross around his neck. And that's concerning because those of us who've been around this space for a little while are very, very committed to reconciliation, are very, very committed to closing the gap for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in this country. But those of us, this is a separate question before us. The bill itself is about making it a fair and democratic process. And that's not what you've done here. You've tried to rig the result. And you've been exposed for it. You've been exposed for trying to rig the result for the Australian people. So I am looking forward to the government's amendment that will actually put the pamphlet outlining a yes and no case clearly before the Australian people, uh, making sure they recommit to that. I'd call on them in the name of fairness, democracy and egalitarianism to actually commit to an official yes and no campaign and commit to equal funding. It's not too late. It's not too late to draft amendments to your own legislation. Lord knows this is changing at a rate of Fort Knox, and I'm sure it won't be the last thing to change in this debate. I saw some Labor senators mocking my, uh, my stated commitment to reconciliation and closing the gap. Well, I was actually the minister that negotiated the Barclay Regional Deal after the rape of a two-year-old in Ten Tennant Creek, that actually sat down with the Gunner government and the Tennant Creek Regional Council to actually put forward a whole body of work, $78 million, infrastructure projects agreed between three levels of government to deal with what is systemic issues in that community. And no one can go up there and sit there and talk to people in these communities and not be impacted by our roles and responsibility in this place, whether you sit on this side of the chamber, down the back stalls, or you have the privilege of government. This has to change. And the saddest thing for me, as the minister that negotiated that, when I sat down and actually talked to people that were dealing with this, these issues day in, day out, yeah, you can build a new skate park, you can put some lighting up, some boarding facilities. But what we really need to do is map the service provision of the local government, private providers, the territory government and the Commonwealth, map what, is, what each service provider is actually doing, find the gaps and fill them, because there's a lot of duplication and there's a lot of gaps. I said, OK, that sounds like a smart thing to do. Out of the $78 million, it was about $800,000 they said that was going to take a couple of years. You know, when you go through the list of projects under the Barclay Regional Deal, the one thing that isn't done is the one thing that the people on the ground said would make the difference. So that is an indictment on that is indictment on all of us that sat there and said we would change this. So when we talk about symbolism over substance, and I'll, I'll have much more to say about that when we debate the substantive issue. But as I said, changing the referendum, changing the constitution, our founding document in this country is incredibly hard. Um, we don't do it lightly, and to be so divided 
now would show that the Labor Party needs to appreciate that Australians want to have confidence in the process and the journey that they've taken us on, uh, which they don't, and it's decreasing every day because they've rushed this. And they haven't gone to the heart of core principles around uh, the mechanics on referenda. Be fair. People expect the Australian government to be fair, to give them the information they need, to fund both sides, to make sure there's an official case so foreign interference doesn't play a role in this referenda, that donations can be tracked, that we actually know who is getting funded for what and by how much, because we won't know without an official campaign. Who's paying who? Who's actually rigging the results here? And that leads to a lack of confidence, not just in the government's ability um, and trust and faith in the sovereign will of the Australian people, but it leads to a level of mistrust in the institutions of government itself, the Senate, House of Representatives, Cabinet, the Ministry. And all of us, I think, are better served if Australians trust us more to have their best interest at heart and know that we trust them to make the right decision, whatever that may be. They're sovereign entities. They, you know, give them the information and they'll make their decision, whatever it is. And we have a responsibility to actually um, back that. At a time when fake news is rampant around global society, the government removing those provisions for an impartial and trusted source of information for the consideration of Australian people, I think, goes to the heart of it. So we welcome the pamphlet, and I look forward to voting for that amendment. Um, but it must be without caveat. A deal's a deal, unless this is going to be another backflip by the Prime Minister Albanese and uh, his government. You were publicly stated that you would do a pamphlet. That's without caveat. If you want, you know, I know there's a whole range of amendments to these bills, and we'll work our way through this as a chamber over the coming days. But you've got to walk the walk, Labor. It's tough to be in government. You can't say one thing one day and backflip the neck. And unfortunately, over the last 10 months, we've seen a few backflips. We've uh, you know, seen a few broken promises, but on something as important as changing our uh, founding document, you've got to square up, give Australians the information they need, fund both cases equally and have the official um, committees so that we know where, where the funding is going, where the donations are going, and we can actually have more confidence out in the broader community. Um, so they can make their own mind up. Uh, I will reserve my right on, on the, the bill to see how, what the final bill looks like after this chamber has its deliberations around uh, amendments. We support Australians' right to vote. I support their sovereign uh, will and I'll respect whatever that is come the time, but I absolutely am committed to them being able to have information so they can make an informed choice, so that we don't rig the results to make sure one side has more money flowing into it than another. I support fairness and egalitarianism because I am a small d Democrat, and this is an important uh, conversation that our community is going to have over the coming months, and I want it to be fair. Uh, noting that we will hit a hard marker and you'll be able to continue your remarks, I call on Senator Davey. Thank you very much, and I also note the time. Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As my colleague said, we all support the right of Australians to have a say on this very, very important issue. We absolutely believe in democracy and the right of our people to have a say on the most important document in our society, which is our constitution. Which is why it is so disappointing that the government are not supporting free, open, transparent, balanced democracy. 
we on this side have raised three very important points with the government, three points that are fundamental to having a referendum with informed voters and open and transparent process and integrity. Those three points were to ensure we have a pamphlet to outline the yes and no case, as we have done in all but very few referenda, referenda in the past. Also to establish an official yes and no campaign organisation. And this is even more important in this day and age where we have social media, where everyone can set up a tile, where we know you, know, you get a blue tick on certain platforms or verified on other platforms and so forth. If you don't have an official campaign, how do those platforms know who to tick or not to tick? We've seen in the past some of our social media platforms selectively pick and choose who is right and who is wrong. And quite frankly, all due respect, Facebook, I am on Facebook and I use it on a daily basis. But do I want Mark Zuckerberg determining who is the right person to distribute information on this campaign? No. I would like an organisation, yes or no, to be identified by this place, recognised by this place, so it takes the Googles and the Amazons and the Facebook Metas out of the picture. It is a recognised organisation by this place, recognised to put forward their case. But apparently it's a free-for-all. This government is happy for a free-for-all, is happy to let Meta decide whose voice we hear on this very important debate on the voice. Incredible. And then we also asked for appropriate funding, equal funding for those organisations. Now I've heard arguments why should taxpayers fund either or campaign? Absolutely. Thank you, Senator Davey. I'm going to Yes. Uh, I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And uh, I rise uh, this evening uh, mindful that the Gifford family are actually uh, watching this uh, tribute to their beautiful mum, uh, Judy. And I'm very pleased to be joined in the chamber by Senator Tim Ayres, who uh, through family is related to the Gifford family and, uh, like me, was privileged to be at the funeral on the Central Coast in the last weeks. Uh, and I seek to take this opportunity in the Federal Parliament of Australia, in the House of the Senate, to pay tribute to the wonderful life and legacy of the beautiful Judy Gifford OAM uh, of Greenpoint in my old electorate of Robertson on the beautiful Central Coast. Judy was a dear friend, a remarkable and an incredible achiever as a volunteer, a brilliant and engaging leader and organiser and very happily a Labor true believer. Judith Ann Gifford was born to Bill and Lorraine Rogers at Gosford Hospital in 1942 and grew up in Point Frederick during a very different time on the Central Coast. She grew up in a fibro house on the shores of beautiful Caroline Bay, which, from which her father would often take her out fishing for crabs and other treats from the water. Judy was a brilliant student as a child and developed a lifelong love of education which manifested in her great achievement. As a graduate from Gosford High School, she achieved the status of ducks of the college. And she did what all brilliant students at that time did, study to become a teacher, eventually becoming a French and Latin teacher in rural New South Wales. And it was there in rural New South Wales 
uh, down in the Riverina where she met and married John, universally known as Giffo, a fellow teacher in Cricket Tragic, a good friend of Judy's cherished brother, Derek. John and Judy went on to have three daughters, Alison, Bronwyn and Helen, during their life together in Wagga Wagga. And it was following the birth of her first daughter that Judy came upon what was to become a lifelong passion, and that was the role of a, a breastfeeding advocate. After seeing an advertisement for nursing mothers, what was to become the Australian Breastfeeding Association, she joined and soon made herself indispensable, organising another nine branches in the Riverina and making a name for herself throughout, through her constant letter writing and agitation. People learned very quickly not to get between Judy and a goal that she was out, set out to achieve. She soon came to national notice and served in many different capacities, including as the national president, honorary secretary, a board director and editor of the, maxi, of the magazine Essence for the Australian Breastfeeding Association. After moving to the Central Coast following a long-awaited de departmental transfer for GIFO, Judy became uh, a vibrant part of the Central Coast social fabric, continuing her leadership roles with the ABA right up until her illness uh, in recent years as the treasurer of the Erina branch. Judy was also a Labor Party stalwart, a constant presence at branch meetings and a tremendous sort of support, source of support to myself and to other Labor candidates on the Central Coast for many, many years. She was awarded the OAM in 2013 for her services to breastfeeding. She probably deserved a few more OAMs for her services to the community in so many ways. At her funeral, uh, a beautiful woman was sitting beside me and just spoke about how she was in despair and wondering how she was going to actually manage getting through the breastfeeding challenges with her young child. Uh, she, as soon as she met Judy, a lifelong friendship was formed and people spoke on the day of her funeral of how remarkably supportive, encouraging and enabling she was. What a wonderful woman. A remarkable woman an unforgettable presence in the lives of all she touched. Uh, Judy Gifford has, honoured, uh, has been honoured by the ABA by inaugurating the Judy Gifford Impact Award, which Judy had for a strong hand uh, in writing the criteria for, so we know it'll go to a really good person. I was actually very privileged to see Judy the night before she passed. To hold her hand, chat a while, she remained remarkable to the end. Judy survived by her husband John, her daughters Alison, Bronwyn and Helen, her nine and her nine grandchildren. I pray that her memory is a blessing, that her life and legacy remain an inspiration to all those you, who knew this truly remarkable woman. Senator Eskew. I just want to associate myself with Senator Eskew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President. It does not matter who you are, making the choice to speak about your mental health challenges takes courage, as does seeking support. Since early 2020, we have endured multiple lockdowns and huge disruption in our daily lives due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Some even locked inside their homes or hotels, cut off from families, friends and co-workers for months. Much has been said about the negative effects of lockdowns and the impact of the pandemic on mental health, but today I'm going to highlight one of the silver linings of the situation. The very disruption I mentioned has increased awareness of the importance of good mental health at home, in the community or in the workplace. A national discussion around improving mental health, particularly in the workplace, has positioned Tasmania at the forefront due to several exciting mental health initiatives within my home state. Last year, in October 2022, the Tasmanian Liberal Government launched a multimedia campaign to promote awareness of mental health support in collaboration with Lifeline Tasmania and the Mental Health Council of Tasmania. The campaign will direct people who need help to the right support and is informed by people with lived experience of mental ill health. And that is only the beginning. Earlier last year, the Tasmanian Government also signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the University of Tasmania to deliver a plan for a Centre for Mental Health Service Innovation. The centre will facilitate engagement and collaboration between the Health Department's statewide mental health services and UTAS across workforce development, training and education, research and development and policy and advocacy 
It builds on the work of the Head to Health facility in Launceston, which provides walk-in mental health services without a referral. Head to Health was an initiative of the Coalition and was delivered by the Morrison Liberal Government to help expand the access of mental health services to all states and territories. The Launceston Head to Health facility opened in January last year, offering free walk-in mental health support to adults who need immediate help. It also provides wraparound services to access allied organisations and offers information and advice for family and friends of people experiencing mental ill health. And I'm pleased to note that 12 months later, just weeks ago in January 2023, Head to Health's new permanent home in Canning Street was opened. Mental illness can affect anyone at any time, often without warning and without reason. And while such illness is often the result of complex trauma, that is not always the case. Much work has already been done to reduce the stigma associated with mental health, but this work is not yet done. Like many other industries, the mental health sector is facing a workforce and skill shortage, with the ability to attract enough people proving difficult. It's becoming a familiar story and one that needs rectifying. Modelling from the Mental Health Council of Tasmania estimates that the workforce is about 900 full-time equivalent roles short of what it needs to be across professional and peer roles, and that shortage continues to grow. And with many of those roles likely to be filled by part-time workers, the number of people actually required is likely to be double that number. But rather than sit on its laurels, the Mental Health Council of Tasmania is working on some groundbreaking collaborations with education providers like UTAS and TASTAFE to fill that gap, along with targeting other initiatives such as skilled migration. They're also working on education campaigns to shift the common perception among the public that you need a referral to access mental health support. This campaign commences shortly and has no equal anywhere in Australia, another way Tasmania is leading in the areas of mental health. Educating the public will take pressure off the state's stretched GP services and emergency departments and will provide another outlet for people to seek help. Collaborative partnerships such as the one cultivated at UTAS is already delivering dividends, with the news that UTAS has expanded its successful psychology clinic model from Hobart into Launceston. This clinic offers another option for mental health services for the community, but also provides real-world training for students. Those in training who work at the clinic are partnered with a qualified psychologist to help them complete the practical components of their education. It's an innovative solution that meets clients' demands, but also prepares and strengthens the workforce. Ingenuity and collaboration such as this is setting Tasmania up to address the growing need for mental health professionals and services. And if successful, I'm certain these initiatives will flow from our small island state to the rest of the country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. Senator Fruki. Um, thank you, President. March 21st every year marks the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, or IDERD. At least it is in every other country in the world. Here in Australia, it's celebrated as Harmony Day, which now falls within Harmony Week. Harmony Day is a John Howard era invention. It represents a superficial, self-congratulatory celebration of diversity, which completely ignores the entire point of the urgent, pressing need to recognize racism and eliminate it in all its forms. It imagines Australia as being some kind of post-racist future that has never, and at this rate, will never exist. Harmony Day whitewashes this historic and ongoing racism in Australia. It denies Australia's colonial bloody history that is tainted with dispossession and violence, and the depth and breadth of discrimination against First Nations people still rooted in our institutions. Systemic racism manifests itself every day against people of color in workplaces, in schools, sport, media, public places, and in parliaments. That's why I've written to Minister Giles, calling on the Labor government to revert to the UN-designated name and purpose and to redouble efforts to combat racism. As the Australian Human Rights Commission has said, reframing IDERD as a celebration of harmony distracts from the cause of eliminating racism. With the harmony framing, the systemic racial discrimination experienced by so many for so long in Australia is effectively swept under the rug. The day is meant to be one of solidarity with people struggling, struggling with racial discrimination. Let's keep it that way. But the sad reality is that when we speak up about racism, we are ignored or we are gaslighted. 
We are incessantly questioned about the validity of our claims. We are told to go back to where we came from. We are accused of causing division by just mentioning the R word. Last week marked four years since the Christchurch massacre when an Australian man killed 51 Muslims during Friday prayers, driven by an extreme right-wing Islamophobic ideology. I wish I could say that the Christchurch massacre by an Australian white supremacist prompted a reckoning with these dangerous racist ideologies and spurred those in power to action. It hasn't. On the weekend, we literally saw Nazi salutes on the streets outside Melbourne Parliament. Vile and disgusting. Report after report tells us that Muslims in Australia continue to experience horrific racism and hate. And women and children are on the front line of this Islamophobia. Structural and systemic racism is embedded in the very fabric of this country, from the way it was founded on stolen land to the way our systems remain discriminatory to this day. This harms and damages physical, psychological, and social well-being of so many in our community. Yet, we are expected to remain silent on racism and pretend that all is well. Well, some of us have refused to play the grateful migrant card that is demanded of us time and time again. We have refused to apologize for our existence. We have stuck our neck out and we have spoken the truth about racism. We cannot pretend racism doesn't exist or that discrimination is a thing of the past. As a country, we recognize the advantages of multiculturalism in the food and in the cherry-picked cultural practices and festivals. But when it comes to tackling the issues we face, nothing changes. This recognition of diversity is tokenistic, it's shallow, and it's skin deep. There is no doubt that we are very far from an anti-racist Australia. And there's no point in pretending otherwise. We have to reckon with the truth. We have to face it with fearlessness. So let's not pretend that racism doesn't live on in government policy. Australia's inhumane and barbaric policies for those seeking asylum are built on racism. And they were made easier to sell to the public because its victims are from places like Afghanistan and Iraq. First Nations people continue to face the worst kinds of discrimination with deaths in custody and children being imprisoned at alarming rates. The hard work of anti-racism starts with using the R word, racism. So let's use the International Day for Elimination of Racial Discrimination to talk about the pervasive scourge of racism rather than hiding behind the veil of Harmony Day. This is only the start to building an anti-racist country that is fair and equal and truly celebrates and respects human rights of people you, who live Senator here. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Your time has expired. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.